Preface of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Outline Narrative tracing briefly the causes connections and consequences of the great events age of louis the fourteenth charles f horn it is related that in sixteen sixty one on the day following the death of the great cardinal mazarin the various officials of the state approached their young king louis the fourteenth to whom shall we go now for orders your majesty to me answered louis and from that date until his death in 1715, they had no other master. Whether we accept the tale as literal fact, or only as the vivid French way of visualizing a truth, we find here the central point of over 50 years of European history. The two celebrated cardinals, Richelieu and Mazarin, had, by their strength and wisdom, made France by far the most powerful state in Europe. Moreover, they had so reduced the authority of the French nobility, the clergy, and the courts of law as to have become practically absolute and untrammeled in their control of the entire government. Now, all this enormous power, both at home and abroad, over France and over Europe, was assumed by a young man of 23. I am the state, said Louis at a later period of his career. He might also have said, I am Europe looking as he did only to the europe that dominated and took pleasure in itself and made life one continued glittering revel of splendor independent europe that claimed the right of thinking for itself the suffering europe of the peasants who starved and shed their blood in helpless agony these were against louis almost from the beginning and ever increasingly against him at first the young monarch found life very bright around him his courtiers called him the rising sun and his ambition was to justify the title to be what with his enormous wealth and authority was scarcely difficult the grand monarch he rushed into causeless war and snatched provinces from his feeble neighbors exhausted germany and decaying spain he built huge fortresses along his frontiers and military roads from end to end of his domains his court was one continuous round of splendid entertainments. He encouraged literature, or at least pensioned authors, and had them clustered around him in what Frenchmen call the Augustan age of their development. The little German princes of the Rhine, each of them practically independent ruler of a tiny state, could not, of course, compete with Louis or defy him. Nor for a time did they attempt it. His splendor dazzled them. They were content to imitate, and each little prince became a patron of literature, or giver of entertainments, or builder of huge fortresses absurdly disproportioned to his territory and his revenues. Germany, it has been aptly said, became a mere tale to the French kite, its leaders feebly draggling after where Louis soared. Never had the common people of Europe, or even the nobility, had less voice in their own affairs. It was an age of absolute kingly power, an age of despotism. England, which under Cromwell had been fair to take a foremost place in Europe, sank under Charles the Second into unimportance. Its people, wearied with tumult, desired peace more than aught else. Its king, experienced in adversity and long a homeless wanderer in France and Holland, seemed to have but one firm principle in life. Whatever happened, he did not intend, as he himself phrased it, to go on his travels again. He dreaded and hated the English Parliament, as all the Stuarts had, and, like his father, he avoided calling it together. To obtain money without its aid, he accepted a pension from the French king. Thus England also became a servitor of Louis. Its policy, so far as Charles could mold it, was France's policy. If we look for events in the English history of the time, we must find them in internal incidents. The terrible plague that devastated London in 1665, the fire of the following year, that checked the plague 
but almost swept the city out of existence. We must note the founding of the Royal Society in 1660 for the advancement of science, or look to Newton, its most celebrated member, beginning to puzzle out his theory of gravitation in his Woolsthorpe garden. Continental Wars Louis's first real opponent he found in sturdy Holland. Her fleets and those of England had learned to fight each other in Cromwell's time, and they continued to struggle for the mastery of the seas. There were many desperate naval battles. In 1664, an English fleet crossed the ocean to seize the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam, and it became New York. In 1667, a Dutch fleet sailed up the Thames and burned the shipping, almost reaching London itself. Yet full as her hands might seem with strife like this, Holland did not hesitate to stand forth against the aggression of Louis's rising sun. When in his first burst of kingship, he seized the Spanish provinces of the Netherlands and so extended his authority to the border of Holland, its people, frightened at his advance, made peace with England and joined an alliance against him. Louis drew back and the Dutch authorized a medal which depicted Holland checking the rising sun. Louis never forgave them, and in 1672, having secured German neutrality and an English alliance, he suddenly attacked Holland with all his forces. For a moment the little republic seemed helpless. Her navy indeed withstood ably the combined assaults of the French and English ships, but the French armies overran almost her entire territory. It was then that her people talked of entering their ships and sailing away together, transporting their nation bodily to some colony beyond Louis's reach. It was then that Amsterdam set the example which other districts heroically followed, of opening her dikes and letting the ocean flood the land to drive out the French. The leaders of the Republic were murdered in a factional strife, and the young Prince William III of Orange, descended from that William the Silent, who had led the Dutch against Philip II, was made practically dictator of the land. This young Prince William, afterward King William III of England, was the antagonist who sprang up against Louis, and in the end united all Europe against him and annihilated his power. Seeing the wonderful resistance that little Holland made against her apparently overwhelming antagonists, the rest of Germany took heart. Allies came to the Dutch. Brandenburg and Austria and Spain forced Louis to fall back upon his own frontier, though with much resolute battling by his great general, Turenne. Next to young William, Louis found his most persistent opponent in Frederick William, the great elector of Brandenburg and Prussia, undoubtedly the ablest German sovereign of the age, and the founder of Prussia's modern importance. He had succeeded to his hereditary domains in 1640 when they lay utterly waste and exhausted in the Thirty Years' War, and he reigned until 1688, nearly half a century, during which he was ever and vigorously the champion of Germany against all outside enemies. He alone, in the feeble Germany of the day, resisted French influence, French manners, and French aggression. In this first general war of the Germans and their allies against Louis, Frederick William proved the only one of their leaders seriously to be feared. Louis made an alliance with Sweden and persuaded the Swedes to overrun Brandenburg during its ruler's absence with his forces on the Rhine. But so firmly had the great elector established himself at home, so was he loved, that the very peasantry rose to his assistance. We are only peasants, said their banners, but we can die for our lord. Pitiful cry pitiful proof of how unused the commons were to even a little kindness, how eagerly responsive. Frederick William came riding like a whirlwind from the Rhine, his army straggling along behind in a vain effort to keep up. He hurled himself with his foremost troops upon the Swedes and won the celebrated Battle of Fairbellon. He swept his astonished foes back into their northern peninsula. Brandenburg became the chief power of northern Germany. In 1679, the Peace of Ryswick ended the general war and left Holland unconquered, but with the French frontier extended to the Rhine, and Louis at the height of his power, the acknowledged head of European affairs. 
Austria was under the rule of Leopold I, Emperor of Germany from 1657 to 1705, whose pride and incompetence wholly prevented him from being what his position as chief of the Habsburgs would naturally have made him, the leader of the opposition, the center around whom all Europe could rally to withstand Louis's territorial greed. Leopold hated Louis, but he hated also the rising Protestant Brandenburger. He hated the merchant Dutch, hated everybody in short who dared intrude upon the ancient order of his superiority, who refused to recognize his impotent authority. So he would gladly have seen Louis crush every opponent except himself, would have found it a pleasant vengeance indeed to see all these upstart powers destroying one another. Moreover, Austria was again engaged in desperate strife with the Turks. These were in the last burst of their effort at European conquest. No longer content with Hungary, twice in Leopold's reign did they advance to attack Vienna. Twice were they repulsed by Hungarian and Austrian valor. The final siege was in 1683. A vast horde, estimated as high as 200,000 men, marched against the devoted city. Leopold and most of the aristocracy fled in despair of its defense. Only the common people who could not flee remained, and with the resolution of despair beat off the repeated assaults of the Mahometans. They were saved by John Sobieski, a king who had raised Poland to one of her rare, outflashing periods of splendor. With his small but gallant Polish army, he came to the rescue of Christendom, charged furiously upon the huge Turkish horde, and swept it from the field in utter flight. The tide of Turkish power receded forever. That was its last great wave, which broke before the walls of Vienna. All Hungary was regained, mainly through the efforts of Austria's greatest general, Prince Eugene of Savoy. The center of the centuries of strife shifted back where it had been in Hunyadi's time, from Vienna to the mighty frontier fortress of Belgrade which was taken and retaken by opposing forces. Later Efforts of Louis the Fourteenth. The earlier career of Louis the Fourteenth seems to have been mainly influenced by his passion for personal renown, but he had always been a serious Catholic, and in his later life his interest in religion became a most important factor in his world. The Protestants of France had for well nigh a century held their faith unmolested, safeguarded by the Edict of Nantes, which had been granted by Henry the Fourth, a Catholic, at least in name, and confirmed by Cardinal Richelieu, a Catholic by profession. Persuasive measures had indeed been frequently employed to win the deserters back to the ancient church, but now, under Louis's direction, a harsher course was attempted. The celebrated Dragonades quartered a wild and licentious soldiery in Protestant localities, in the homes of Protestant house owners, with special orders to make themselves offensive to their hosts. Under this grim discouragement, Protestantism seemed dying out of France, and at last in 1685, Louis, encouraged by success, took the final step and revoked the Edict of Nantes, commanding all his subjects to accept Catholicism, while at the same time forbidding any to leave the country. Huguenots who attempted flight were seized, many were slain. Externally, at least, the Reformed religion disappeared from France. Of course, despite the edict restraining them, many Huguenots, the most earnest and vigorous of the sect, did escape by flight, and some hundred thousands of France's ablest citizens were thus lost to her forever. Large numbers found a welcome in neighboring Holland. The great elector stood forward and gave homes to a wandering host of the exiles. England received colonies of them, and even distant America was benefited by the numbers who sought her freer shores. No enemy to France in all the world but received a welcome accession to its strength against her. In the same year, that Protestant Europe was thus assailed and terrified by the reviving specter of religious persecution. Charles II of England died, and his brother James II succeeded him. Charles may have been Catholic at heart, but in name, at least, he had retained the English religion. James was openly Catholic. A hasty rebellion raised against him by his nephew Monmouth fell to pieces, and James, 
having executed monmouth and approved a cruel persecution of his followers began to take serious steps toward forcing the whole land back to the ancient faith so here was kingly absolutism coming to the aid of the old religious intolerance the english people however had already killed one king in defense of their liberties and their resolute opposition to james began to suggest that they might kill another many of the leading nobles appealed secretly to william of orange for help william was as we have said the center of opposition to louis and that began to mean to catholicism as well also william had married a daughter of king james and had thus some claim to interfere in the family domains and most important of all as chief ruler of holland william had an army at command with a portion of that army he set sail late in sixteen eighty eight and landed in england englishmen of all ranks flocked to join him king james fled to france and a parliament hastily assembled in sixteen eighty nine declared him no longer king and placed william and his wife mary on the throne as joint rulers thus william had two countries instead of one to aid him in his lifelong effort against louis louis indeed accepted the accession of his enemy as a threat of war and taking up the cause of the fugitive james dispatched him with french troops to ireland where his catholic faith made the mass of the people his devoted adherents there were however protestant irish as well and these defied james and held his troops at bay in the siege of londonderry while king william hurried over to ireland with an army father-in-law and son-in-law met in the battle of the boyne and james was defeated in war as he had been in diplomacy he fled back to france leaving his catholic adherents to withstand william as best they might limerick the catholic stronghold was twice besieged and only yielded when full religious freedom had been guaranteed irishmen to this day call it with bitterness the city of the violated treaty meanwhile the strife between louis and william had spread into another general european war william had difficulties to encounter in his new kingdom its people cared little for his continental aims and gave him little loyalty of service in fact peculation among public officials was so widespread that despite large expenditures of money england had only a most feeble inefficient army in the field and william was in black disgust against his new subjects it was partly to aid the government in its financial straits that the bank of england was formed in sixteen ninety four yet louis's troubles were greater and of deeper root catholic austria and even the pope himself unable to submit to the arrogance of the grand monarch took part against him in this war it can therefore no longer be regarded as a religious struggle it marks the turning point in louis's fortunes his boundless extravagance had exhausted france at last both in wealth and population she began to feel the drain the french generals won repeated victories yet they had to give slowly back before their more numerous foes and in sixteen ninety seven louis purchased peace by making concessions of territory as well as courtesy this peace proved little more than a truce for almost half a century the european sovereigns had been waiting for charles the second of spain to die he was the last of his race last of the spanish habsburgs descended from the emperor charles v and so infirm and feeble was he that it seemed the flickering candle of his life must puff out with each passing wind who should succeed him in mazarin's time that crafty minister had schemed that the prize should go to france and had wedded young louis the fourteenth to a spanish princess the austrian habsburgs of course wanted the place for themselves though to establish a common ancestry with their spanish kin they must turn back over a century and a half to ferdinand and isabella but strong men grew old and died while the invalid charles the second still clung to his tottering throne louis ceased hoping to occupy it himself and claimed it for his son then for his grandson philip not until seventeen hundred after a reign of nearly forty years did charles give up the worthless game and expire he declared philip his heir and the aged louis sent the youth to spain with an eager boast go there are no longer any pyrenees 
that is france and spain were to be one a mighty bourbon empire that was just what europe experienced in louis unscrupulous aggression dared not allow so another general alliance was formed with william of holland and england at its head to drive philip from his new throne in favor of a Habsburg. william died before the war was well under way but the british people understood his purposes now and upheld them once more they felt themselves the champions of protestantism in europe anne the second daughter of the deposed king james was chosen as queen and under her the two realms of england and scotland were finally joined in one by the act of union seventeen o seven with but a single parliament meanwhile marlborough was sent to the rhine with a strong british army prince eugene paused in fighting the turks and joined him with austrian and german troops together they defeated the french in the celebrated battle of blenheim seventeen o four and followed it in later years with oudenard and malplaquet louis was beaten france was exhausted the grand monarch pleaded for peace on almost any terms yet his grandson remained on the spanish throne for one reason the spaniards themselves upheld him and fought for him for another the allies austrian candidate became emperor of germany and to make him ruler of spain as well would only have been to consolidate the habsburg power instead of that of the bourbons made dubious by this balance between evils europe abandoned the war so there were two bourbon kingdoms after all but both too exhausted to be dangerous louis had indeed outlived his fame he had roused the opposition of all his neighbors and ruined france in the effort to extend her greatness the praises and flattery of his earlier years reached him now only from the lips of a few determined courtiers his people hated him and in seventeen fifteen celebrated his death as a release frenchmen high and low had begun the career which ended in their terrific revolution lying on his dreary deathbed the grand monarch apologized that he should take so long in dying perhaps he also felt that he delayed the coming of the new age what his career had done was to spread over all europe a new culture and refinement to rouse a new splendor and recklessness among the upper classes and to widen almost irretrievably the gap between rich and poor between kings and commons in the very years that parliamentary government was becoming supreme in england absolutism established itself upon the continent changes in northern europe toward the close of this age the balance of power in northern europe shifted quite as markedly as it had farther south three of the german electoral princes became kings the elector of saxony was chosen king of poland thereby adding greatly to his power george elector of hanover became king of england on the death of queen anne and the elector of brandenburg son of the great elector when the war of seventeen o one against france and spain broke out only lent his aid to the european coalition on condition that the german emperor should authorize him also to assume the title of king not of brandenburg but of his other and smaller domain of prussia which lay outside the empire most of the european sovereigns smiled at this empty change of title without a change of dominions but brandenburg or prussia was thus made more united more consolidated and it soon rose to be the leader of northern germany a new family the hohenzollerns contested european supremacy with the Habsburgs and the Bourbons. More important still was the strife between Sweden and Russia. Sweden had been raised by Gustavus Adolphus to be the chief power of the North, the chosen ally of Richelieu and Mazarin. Her soldiers were esteemed the best of the time. The prestige of the Swedes had, to be sure, suffered somewhat in the days when the great elector defeated them so completely at Fair Bellin and elsewhere but louis the fourteenth had stood by them as his allies and saved them from any loss of territory so that in seventeen hundred sweden still held not only the scandinavian peninsula but all the lands east of the baltic as far as where st petersburg now stands and much of the german coast to southward the baltic was thus almost a swedish lake when in sixteen ninety seven a new warrior king charles the twelfth 
rose to reassert the warlike supremacy of his race he was but fifteen when he reached the throne and denmark poland and russia all sought to snatch away his territories he fought the danes and defeated them he fought the saxon elector who had become king of poland soon both poland and saxony lay crushed at the feet of the lion of the north as they called him then madman of the north after his great designs had failed only russia remained to oppose him russia as yet almost unknown to europe a semi-barbaric frontier land supposedly helpless against the strength and resources of civilization russia was in the pangs of a most sudden revolution against her will she was being suddenly and sharply modernized by peter the great most famous of her czars he had overthrown the turbulent militia who really ruled the land and had waded through a sea of bloody executions to establish his own absolute power he had traveled abroad in disguise studied shipbuilding in holland the art of government in england and fortification and war wheresoever he could find a teacher removing from the ancient conservative capital of moscow he planted his government in defiance of sweden upon her very frontier causing the city of st petersburg to arise as if by magic from a desolate icy swamp in the far north charles of sweden scorned and defied him at narva in seventeen hundred charles with a small force of his famous troops drove peter with a huge horde of his russians to shameful flight they will teach us to beat them said peter philosophically and so in truth he gathered knowledge from defeat after defeat until at length at poltava in seventeen o nine he completely turned the tables upon charles overthrew him and so crushed his power that russia succeeded sweden as ruler of the extreme north a rank she has ever since retained growth of america the vast political and social changes of europe in this age found their echo in the new world the decay of spain left her american colonies to feebleness and decay the islands of the caribbean sea became the haunt of the buccaneers pirates desperadoes of all nations who preyed upon spanish ships and as their power grew extended their depredations northward along the american coast so important did these buccaneers become that they formed regular governments among themselves the most famed of their leaders was knighted by england as sir henry morgan and the most renowned of his achievements was the storm and capture of the spanish treasure city panama as spain grew weak in america france grew strong from her canadian colony she sent out daring missionaries and traders who explored the great lakes and the mississippi valley they made friends with the indians they founded louisiana all the north and west of the continent fell into their hands next however did their numbers approach those of the english colonists along the atlantic coast both massachusetts and virginia were grown into important commonwealths almost independent of england and well able to support the weaker settlements rising around them after the great puritan exodus to new england to escape the oppression of charles i there had come a royalist exodus to virginia to escape the puritanic tyranny of cromwell's time large numbers of catholics fled to maryland huguenots established themselves in the carolinas and elsewhere then came penn to build a great quaker state among the scattered dutch settlements along the delaware the american seaboard became the refuge of each man who refused to bow his neck to despotism of whatever type under such settlers english america soon ceased to be a mere offshoot of europe it became a world of its own its people developed into a new race they had their own springs of action their own ways of thought different from those of europe more simple and intense as was shown in the salem witchcraft excitement or more resolute and advanced as was revealed in bacon's virginia rebellion the aboriginal inhabitants the indians found themselves pressed ever backward from the coast they resisted and in sixteen seventy five there arose in new england king philip's war which for that section at least settled the indian question forever the red men of new england were practically exterminated those of new york the iroquois 
were more fortunate or more crafty they dwelt deeper in the wilderness and formed a buffer state between the french in canada and the english to the south drawing aid now from one now from the other each war between england and louis the fourteenth was echoed by strife between their rival colonies when king william supplanted james in sixteen eighty eight there followed in america also a bloodless revolution governor andros whom james had sent to imitate his own harsh tyranny in the colonies was seized and shipped back to england william was proclaimed king the ensuing strife with france was marked by the most bloody of all america's indian massacres the iroquois descended suddenly on canada the very suburbs of its capital montreal were burned and more than a thousand of the unsuspecting settlers were tortured or more mercifully slain outright in the later war about the spanish throne england captured nova scotia the southern extremity of the french canadian seaboard and part of the price louis the fourteenth paid for peace was to leave this colony in england's hands the scale of american power began to swing markedly in her favor everywhere over the world as the eighteenth century progressed england with her parliamentary government was rising into power at the expense of france and absolutism end of preface Section number one of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matthew Flowett. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. Edited by Charles F. Horn. Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Louis the Fourteenth establishes absolute monarchy. A. D. 1661 by James Cotter Morrison. Not only was the reign of Louis the Fourteenth one of the longest in the world's history, but it also marked among Western nations the highest development of the purely monarchical principle including the time that Louis ruled under the guardianship of his mother and the control of his minister, Cardinal Mazarin, the reign covered more than 70 years, 1643 to 1715. The sovereign who could say, I am the state, l'état c'est moi, and see his subjects acquiesce with almost Asiatic humility, while Europe looked on in admiration and fear may be said to have embodied for modern times the essence of absolutism. That all things domestic and foreign seem to be in concurrence for giving practical effect to the Grand Monarch's assumption of supremacy is shown by the fact that his name dominates the whole history of his time. His reign was not only the Augustan age of France, it marked the ascendancy of France in Europe. Of such a reign, no adequate impression is to be derived from reading even the most faithful narrative of its thronging events. But the reign as well as the personality of Louis is set in clear perspective for us by Morrison's picturesque and discriminating treatment. The reign of Louis XIV was the culminating epoch in the history of the French monarchy. What the age of Pericles was in the history of the Athenian democracy what the age of the Scipios was in the history of the Roman Republic, that was the reign of Louis XIV in the history of the old monarchy of France. The type of polity which that monarchy embodied, the principles of government on which it reposed or brought into play, in this reign attain their supreme expression and development. Before Louis XIV, the French monarchy has evidently not attained its full stature. It is thwarted and limited by other forces in the state. After him, though unresisted from without, it manifests symptoms of decay from within. It rapidly declines and totally disappears 77 years after his death. But it is not only the most conspicuous reign in the history of France, it is the most conspicuous reign in the history of monarchy in general. Of the very many kings whom history mentions, who have striven to exalt the monarchical principle, none of them achieved a success remotely comparable to his. His two great predecessors in kingly ambition, Charles V and Philip II, remained far behind him in this respect. 
They may have ruled over wider dominions, but they never attained the exceptional position of power and prestige which he enjoyed for more than half a century. They never were obeyed so submissively at home, nor so dreaded, and even respected abroad. For Louis the Fourteenth carried off that last reward of complete success, that he for a time silenced even envy, and turned it into admiration. We who can examine with cold scrutiny the make and composition of this colossus of a French monarchy, who can perceive how much the brass and clay in it exceeded the gold, who know how it afterward fell with a resounding ruin, the last echoes of which have scarcely died away, have difficulty in realizing the fascination it exercised upon contemporaries who witnessed its first setting up. Louis the Fourteenth's reign was the very triumph of commonplace greatness, of external magnificence and success, such as the vulgar among mankind can best and most sincerely appreciate. Had he been a great and profound ruler, had he considered with unselfish meditation the real interests of France, had he with wise insight discerned and followed the remote lines of progress along which the future of Europe was destined to move, it is lamentably probable that he would have been misunderstood in his lifetime and calumniated after his death. Louis XIV was exposed to no such misconception. His qualities were on the surface visible and comprehensible to all, and although none of them was brilliant, he had several which have a peculiarly impressive effect when displayed in an exalted station. He was indefatigably industrious, worked on an average eight hours a day for 54 years, had great tenacity of will. That kind of solid judgment which comes of slowness of brain, and withal a most majestic port and great dignity of manners. He had also a much kindliness of nature as the very great can be expected to have. His temper was under severe control, and, in his earlier years at least, yet a more apprehensiveness greater than the limitations of his intellect would have led one to expect. His conduct towards Moliere was throughout truly noble, and the more so that he never intellectually appreciated Moliere's real greatness. But he must have had great original fineness of tact, though it was in the end nearly extinguished by adulation and incense. His court was an extraordinary creation, and the greatest thing he achieved. He made it the microcosm of all that was the most brilliant and prominent in France. Every order of merit was invited there and received courteous welcome. To no circumstance did he so much owe his enduring popularity. By its means he impressed into his service that galaxy of great writers, the first and the last classic authors of France, whose calm and serene luster will forever illumine the epoch of his existence. It may even be admitted that his share in that luster was not so accidental and undeserved as certain king-haters have supposed. That subtle critic, M. saint Beuve thinks he can trace a marked rise even in Bossuet's style from the moment he became a courtier of Louis XIV. The king brought men together, placed them in a position where they were induced and urged to bring their talents to a focus. His court was alternately a high-bred gala and a stately university. If we contrast his life with those of his predecessor and successor, with the dreary existence of Louis XIII, and the crapulous lifelong debauch of Louis XV, we become sensible that Louis XIV was distinguished in no common degree. And when we further reflect that much of his home and all of his foreign policy was precisely adapted to flatter, in its deepest self-love, the national spirit of France, it will not be quite impossible to understand the long-continued reverberation of his fame. But Louis XIV's reign has better titles than the adulations of courtiers and the eulogies of wits and poets to the attention of posterity. It marks one of the most memorable epochs in the annals of mankind. It stretches across history like a great mountain range, separating ancient France from the France of modern times. On the further slope are Catholicism and feudalism in their various stages of splendor and decay. The France of crusade and chivalry of St. Louis and Bayard. On the hither side are free thought, industry, and centralization, the France of Voltaire, Turgot, and Cordesset. 
When Louis came to the throne, the Thirty Years' War still wanted six years of its end, and the heat of theological strife was at its intensest glow. When he died, the religious temperature had cooled nearly to a freezing point, and a new vegetation of science and positive inquiry was overspreading the world. This amounts to saying that his reign covers the greatest epoch of mental transition through which the human mind has hitherto passed, excepting the transition we are witnessing in the day which now is. We need but recall the names of the writers and thinkers who arose during Louis XIV's reign, and shed their seminal ideas broadcast upon the air to realize how full a period it was, both of birth and decay, of the passing away of the old and the uprising of the new forms of thought. To mention only the greatest, the following are among the chiefs who helped to transform the mental fabric of Europe in the age of Louis XIV. Descartes, Newton, Leibniz, Locke, Boyle. Under these leaders, the first firm, irreversible advance was made out of the dim twilight of theology into the clear dawn of positive and demonstrative science. Inferior to these founders of modern knowledge, but holding a high rank as contributors to the mental activity of the age, were Pascal, Malebranche, Spinoza, and Bale. The result of their efforts was such a stride forward as has no parallel in the history of the human mind. Of the most curious and significant proofs of it was the spontaneous extinction of the belief in witchcraft among the cultivated classes of Europe. As the English historian of rationalism has so judiciously pointed out, the superstition was not much attacked, and it was vigorously defended, yet it died a natural and quiet death from the changed moral climate of the world. But the chief interest which the reign of Louis XIV offers to the student of history has yet to be mentioned. It was the great turning point in the history of the French people. The triumph of the monarchical principle was so complete under him, independence and self-reliance were so effectually crushed, both in localities and individuals, that a permanent bent was given to the national mind, a habit of looking to the government for all action and initiative permanently established. Before the reign of Louis XIV, it was a question which might fairly be considered undecided, whether the country would be able or not, willing or not, to cooperate with its rulers in the work of the government and the reform of abuses. On more than one occasion, such cooperation did not seem entirely impossible or improbable. The admirable wisdom and moderation shown by the tiers etat in the States General of 1614, the divers efforts of the Parliament of Paris to check extravagant expenditure, the vigorous struggles of the provincial assemblies to preserve some relic of their local liberties, seemed to promise that France would continue to advance under the leadership indeed of the monarchy, yet still retaining in large measure the bright, free, independent spirit of old Gaul, the Gaul of Rabelais, Montaigne, and Joinville. After the reign of Louis XIV, such cooperation of the ruler and the ruled became impossible. The government of France had become a machine depending upon the action of a single spring. Spontaneity in the population at large was extinct, and whatever there was to do must be done by the central authority. As long as the government could correct abuses, it was well. If it ceased to be equal to this task, they must go uncorrected. When at last the reform of secular and gigantic abuses presented itself with imperious urgency, the alternative before the monarchy was either to carry the reform with a high hand or perish in the failure to do so. We know how signal the failure was, and could not help being under the circumstances and through having placed the monarchy between these alternatives, it is no paradox to say that Louis XIV was one of the most direct ancestors of the Great Revolution. Nothing but special conditions in the politics both of Europe and of France can explain the singular importance and prominence of Louis XIV's reign, and we find that both France and Europe were indeed in an exceptional position when he ascended the throne. The continent of Europe, from one end to the other, was still bleeding and prostrate from the effect of the Thirty Years' War when the young Louis, in the sixteenth year of his age, was anointed king at Reims. Although France had suffered terribly in that awful struggle, she had probably suffered less than any of the combatants, unless it be Sweden. It happened by a remarkable coincidence that precisely at this moment, when the condition of Europe was such that an aggressive policy on the part of France could be only with difficulty resisted by her neighbors, 
the power and prerogatives of the French crown attained an expansion and preeminence which they had never enjoyed in the previous history of the country. The schemes and hopes of Philip the Fair, of Louis XI, of Henry IV, and of Richelieu had been realized at last, and their efforts to throw off the insolent coercion of the great feudal lords had been crowned with complete success. The monarchy could hardly have conjectured how strong it had become, but for the abortive resistance and hostility it met with the Fronde. The flames of insurrection which had shot up, forked and menacing, fell back underground, where they smoldered for four generations yet to come. The kingly power soared, single and supreme, over its prostrate foes. Long before Louis the Fourteenth had shown any aptitude or disposition for authority, he was the object of adulation as cringing as was ever offered to a Roman emperor. When he returned from his consecration at Reims, the rector of the University of Paris, at the head of his professional staff, addressed the young king in these words. We are so dazzled by the new splendor which surrounds your majesty that we are not ashamed to appear dumbfounded at the aspect of a light so brilliant and so extraordinary. And at the foot of an engraving at the same date, he is in so many words called a demigod. It is evident that ample materials had been prepared for what the vulgar consider a great reign, abundant opportunity for an insolent and aggressive foreign policy owing to the condition of Europe. Security from remonstrance or check at home, owing to the condition of France. The temple is prepared for the deity. The priests stand by, ready to offer victims on the smoking altar. The incense is burning in anticipation of his advent. On the death of Mazarin in 1661, he entered into his own. Louis XIV never forgot the trials and humiliations to which he and his mother had been subjected during the troubles of the Fronde. It has often been remarked that rulers born in the purple have seldom shown much efficiency unless they have been exposed to exceptional and, as it were, artificial probations during their youth. During the first eleven years of Louis's reign, incomparably the most creditable to him, we can trace unmistakably the influence of the wisdom and experience acquired in that period of anxiety and defeat. He then learned the value of money and the supreme benefits of a full exchequer. He also acquired a thorough dread of subjection to ministers and favorites, a dread so deep that it implied a consciousness of probable weakness on that side. As he went on in life, he to a great extent forgot both these valuable lessons, but their influence was never entirely effaced. To the astonishment of the courtiers and even of his mother, he announced his intention of governing independently and of looking after everything himself. They openly doubted his perseverance. You do not know him, said Mazarin. He will begin rather late, but he will go further than most. There was enough stuff in him to make four kings, and an honest man besides. His first measures were dictated less by great energy of initiative than by absolute necessity. The finances had fallen into such a chaos of jobbery and confusion that the very existence of the government depended upon a prompt and trenchant reform. It was Louis's rare good fortune to find beside him one of the most able and vigorous administrators who have ever lived, Colbert. He had the merit, not a small one in that age, of letting this great minister invent and carry out the most daring and beneficial measures of reform, of which he assumed all the credit to himself. The first step was a vigorous attack on the gang of financial plunderers, who, with Fouquet at their head, simply embezzled the bulk of the state revenues. The money lenders not only obtained the most usurious interest for their loans, but actually held in mortgage the most productive sources of the national taxation. And, not content with that, they bought up, at 10% of their nominal value, an enormous amount of discredited bills, issued by the government in the time of the Fronde, which they forced the treasury to pay off at par. And this was done with the very money they had just before advanced to the government. Such barefaced plunder could not be endured and Colbert was the last man to endure it. He not only repressed peculation, but introduced a number of practical improvements in the distribution and especially in the mode of levying the taxes. So imperfect were the arrangements connected with the latter that it was estimated that of 84 millions paid by the people, only 32 millions entered into the coffers of the state. The most instantaneous effects of Colbert's measures the yawning deficit was changed into a surplus of 45 millions in less than two years, showed how gross and flagrant had been the malversation proceeding. Far more difficult 
and far nobler in the order of constructive statesmanship, were his vast schemes to endow France with manufactures, with a commercial and belligerent navy, with colonies, besides his manifold reforms in the internal administration, tariffs and customs between neighboring provinces of France, the great work of the Languedoc Canal, in fact, in every part and province of government. His success was various, but in some cases really stupendous. His creation of a navy almost surpasses belief. In 1661, when he first became free to act, France possessed only 30 vessels of war of all sizes. At the Peace of Nimwegen in 1678, she had acquired a fleet of 120 ships, and in 1683 she had got a fleet of 176 vessels, and the increase was quite as great in the size and armament of the individual ships as in their number. A perfect giant of administration, Colbert found no labor too great for his energies, and worked with unflagging energy 16 hours a day for 22 years. It is melancholy to be forced to add that all this toil was as good as thrown away, and that the strong men went broken-hearted to the grave, though seeing too clearly that he had labored in vain for an ungrateful egotist. His great visions of a prosperous France, increasing in wealth and contentment, were blighted, and he closed his eyes upon scenes of improvidence and waste more injurious to the country than the financial robbery which he had combated in his early days. The government was not plundered as it had been, but itself was exhausting the very springs of wealth by its impoverishment of the people. Bois-Gilbert, writing in 1698, only fifteen years after Colbert's death, estimated the productive powers of France to have diminished by one-half in the previous thirty years. It seems, indeed, probable that the almost magical rapidity and effect of Colbert's early reforms turned Louis XIV's head, and that he was convinced that it only depended on his good pleasure to renew them to obtain the same result. He never found, as he never deserved to find, another Colbert, and he stumbled onward in ever deeper ruin to his disastrous end. His first breach of public faith was his attack on the Spanish Netherlands, under color of certain pretended rights of the queen, his wife, the Infanta Marie Therese, although he had renounced all claims in her name at his marriage. This aggression was followed by his famous campaign in the Low Countries, when Franche Comte was overrun and conquered in 15 days. He was stopped by the celebrated Triple Alliance in mid-career. He had not yet been intoxicated by success and vanity. Colbert's influence, always exerted on the side of peace, was at its height. The menacing attitude of Holland, England, and Sweden awed him, and he drew back. His pride was deeply wounded and he revolved deep and savage schemes of revenge. Not on England, whose abject sovereign he knew could be had whenever he chose to buy him, but on the heroic little republic which had dared to cross his victorious path. His mingled contempt and rage against Holland were indeed instinctive, spontaneous, and in the nature of things. Holland was the living triumphant incarnation of the two things he hated most, the principle of liberty in politics and the principle of free inquiry in religion. With a passion too deep for hurry or carelessness, he made his preparations. The army was submitted to a complete reorganization. A change in the weapons of the infantry was effected, which was as momentous in its day as the introduction of the breech-loading rifle in ours. The old inefficient firelock was replaced by the flint musket, and the rapidity and certainty of fire vastly increased. The undisciplined independence of the officers commanding regiments and companies was suppressed by the rigorous and methodical Colonel Martinet, whose name has remained in other armies besides that of France as a synonym of punctilious exactitude. End of section 1「Section No. 2 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matthew Flowett. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Louis the Fourteenth establishes absolute monarchy. A.D. 1661 by James Cotter Morrison. 
Part 2. The means of offence being thus secured, the next step was to remove the political difficulties which stood in the way of Louis's schemes, that is, to dissolve Sir W. Temple's diplomatic masterpiece, the Triple Alliance. The effeminate Charles II was bought over by a large sum of money, and the present of a pretty French mistress. Sweden also received a subsidy, and her schemes of aggrandizement on continental Germany were encouraged. Meanwhile, the illustrious man who ruled Holland showed that kind of weakness which good men often do in the presence of the unscrupulous and wicked. John de Witt could not be convinced of the reality of Louis's nefarious designs. France had ever been Holland's best friend, and he could not believe that the policy of Henry IV, of Richelieu, of Mazarin, would suddenly be reversed by the young king of France. He tried negotiations in which he was amused by Louis so long as it suited the latter's purpose. At last, when the king's preparations were complete, he threw off the mask and insultingly told the Dutch that it was not for hucksters like them, and usurpers of authority not theirs, to meddle with such high matters. Then commenced one of the brightest pages in the history of national heroism. At first, the Dutch were overwhelmed. Town after town capitulated without a blow. It seemed as if the United Provinces were going to be subdued, as Franche Comte had been five years before. But Louis XIV had been too much intoxicated by that pride, which goes before a fall, to retain any clearness of head, if indeed he ever had any in military matters. The great Condé, with his keen eye for attack, at once suggested one of those tiger springs for which he was unequaled among commanders. Seeing the dismay of the Dutch, he advised a rapid dash with 6,000 horse on Amsterdam. It is nearly certain, if this advice had been followed, that the little commonwealth, so precious to Europe, would have been extinguished, and that that scheme, born of heroic despair, of transferring to Batavia, under new stars and amid a strange vegetation, the treasure of freedom and valor ruined in its old home by the Sardanapalus of Versailles might have been put in execution, but it was not to be. Vigilant as Louis had been in preparation, he now seemed to be as careless or incompetent in execution. Not only he neglected the advice of his best general and wasted time, but he did his best to drive his adversaries to despair and the resistance which comes of despair. They were told by proclamation that the towns which should try to resist the forces of his majesty by opening the dikes or by any other means would be punished with the utmost rigor, and when the France should have opened roads in all directions, his majesty would give no sort of quarter to the inhabitants of the said towns, but would give orders that their goods should be plundered and their houses burned. The Dutch envoys, headed by de Groot, son of the illustrious Grotius, came to the king's camp to know on what terms he would make peace. They were refused audience by the theatrical warrior and told not to return except armed with full powers to make any concessions he might dictate. Then the hucksters of Amsterdam resolved on a deed of daring which is one of the most exalted among the high traditions of the world. They opened the sluices and submerged the whole country under water. Still, their position was almost desperate as the winter frosts were nearly certain to restore a firm foothold to the invader. They came suing for peace, offering Maastricht, the Rhine fortresses, the whole of Brabant, the whole of Dutch Flanders, and an indemnity of ten millions. This was preferring more than Henry IV, Richelieu, or Mazarin had ever hoped for. These terms were refused, and the refusal carried with it practically the rejection of Belgium, which could not fail to be soon absorbed when thus surrounded by French possessions. But Louis met these offers with the spirit of an Attila. He insisted on the concession of southern Geldres and the island of Bonnel, 24 millions of indemnity, the endowment of the Catholic religion, and an extraordinary annual embassy charged to present His Majesty with a gold medal, which is set forth how the Dutch owed to him the conservation of their liberties. Such vindictive cruelty makes the mind run forward and dwell with a glow of satisfied justice on the bitter days of retaliation and revenge which in a future, still thirty years off, will humble the proud and pitiless oppressor in the dust, when he shall be a suppliant, and a suppliant in vain, at the feet of the haughty victors of Blenheim, Remilies, and Nuadenard. 
But Louis's mad career of triumph was gradually being brought to a close. He had before him not only the waste of waters, but the iron will and unconquerable tenacity of the young Prince of Orange, who needed neither hope to make him dare, nor success to make him persevere. Gradually, the threatened neighbors of France gathered together and against her king. Charles II was forced to recede from the French alliance by his parliament in 1674. The military massacre went on, indeed, for some years longer in Germany and the Netherlands. But the Dutch Republic was saved, and peace ratified by the Treaty of Nimwegen. After the conclusion of the Dutch War, the reign of Louis XIV enters on a period of manifest decline. The cost of the war had been tremendous. In 1677, the expenditure had been 110 millions, and Colbert had to meet this with a net revenue of 81 millions. The trade and commerce of the country had also suffered much during the war. With bitter grief, the great minister saw himself compelled to reverse the beneficent policy of his earlier days. To add to the tax on salt, to increase the ever-crushing burden of the tie, to create new offices, hereditary employments in the government, to the extent of 300 millions, augmenting the already monstrous army of superfluous officials, and, finally, simply to borrow money at high interest. The new exactions had produced widespread misery in the provinces before the war came to an end. In 1675, the governor of Dauphine had written to Colbert saying that commerce had entirely ceased in his district, and that the larger part of the people had lived during the winter on bread made from acorns and roots, and that at the time of his writing they were seen to be eating the grass of the fields and the bark of trees. The long-continued anguish produced at last despair and rebellion. In Bordeaux, great excesses were committed by the mob, which were punished with severity. Six thousand soldiers were quartered in the town, and were guilty of such disorders that the best families emigrated, and trade was ruined for a long period. But Brittany witnessed still worse evils. There also riots and disturbances had been produced by the excessive pressure of the imposts. An army of 5,000 men was poured into the province and inflicted such terror on the population that the wretched peasants, at the mere sight of the soldiers, threw themselves on their knees in an attitude of supplication and exclaimed, Mea culpa! The lively Madame de Savine gives us some interesting details concerning these events in the intervals when court scandal ran low and the brave doings of Madame de Montespan suffered a temporary interruption. Would you like, says the tender-hearted lady to her daughter, would you like to have news of Rennes? There are still five thousand soldiers here, as more have come from Nantes. A tax of one hundred thousand crowns has been laid upon the citizens, and if the money is not forthcoming in twenty-four hours, the tax will be doubled and levied by the soldiers. All the inhabitants of a large street have already been driven out and banished, and no one may receive them under pain of death, so that all these poor wretches, old men, Women recently delivered, and children, were seen wandering in tears as they left the town, not knowing whither to go, or where to sleep, or what to eat. The day before yesterday, one of the leaders of the riot was broken alive on the wheel. Sixty citizens have been seized, and tomorrow the hanging will begin. In other letters, she writes that the tenth man had been broken on the wheel, and she thinks he will be the last, and that by dint of hanging it will soon be left off. Such was the emaciated France which Louis the Great picked systematically to the bone for the next thirty-five years. He had long ceased to be guided by the patriotic wisdom of the great Colbert. His evil genius now was the haughty and reckless Louvois, who carefully abstained from imitating the noble and daring remonstrances against excessive expenditure which Colbert addressed to his master, and through which he lost his influence at court. Still, with a self-abnegation really heroic, Colbert begged, urged, supplicated the king to reduce his outlay. He represented the misery of the people. All letters that come from the provinces, whether from the intendants, the receivers general, and even the bishops speak of it, he wrote to the king. He insisted on a reduction of the tie by five or six millions, and surely it was time when its collection gave rise to such scenes as have just been described. It was in vain. The king shut his eyes to mercy and reason. His gigantic war expenditure, when peace came, was only partially reduced. 
for, indeed, he was still at war, but with nature and self-created difficulties of his own making. He was building Versailles, transplanting to its arid sands whole groves of full-grown trees from the depths of distant forests and erecting the costly and fantastic marble of Marley to afford a supply of water. Louis' building cost, first and last, a sum which would be represented by about twenty million pounds. The amount squandered on pensions was also very great. The great Colbert's days were drawing to a close, and he was very sad. It is related that a friend on one occasion surprised him looking out of a window in his chateau at So, lost in thought, and apparently gazing on the well-tilled fields of his own manor. When he came out of his reverie, his friend asked him his thoughts. As I look, he said, on these fertile fields, I cannot help remembering what I have seen elsewhere. What a rich country is France! If the king's enemies would let him enjoy peace, it would be possible to procure the people that relief and comfort which the great Henry promised them. I could wish that my projects had a happy issue, that abundance reigned in the kingdom, that everyone were content in it, and that without employment or dignities, far from the court and business, I saw the grass grow in my home farm. The faithful, indefatigable worker was breaking down, losing strength, losing heart, but still struggling on manfully to the last. It was noticed that he sat down to his work with a sorrowful, despondent look, and not, as had been his wont, rubbing his hands with the prospect of toil, and exulting in his almost superhuman capacity for labor. The ingratitude of the king, whom he had served only too well, gave him the final blow. Louis, with truculent insolence, reproached him with the frightful expenses of Versailles, as if they were Colbert's fault. Colbert, who had always urged the completion of the Louvre and the suppression of Versailles. At last, the foregone giant lay down to die. A tardy touch of feeling induced Louis to write him a letter. He would not read it. I will hear no more about the king, he said. Let him at least allow me to die in peace. My business now is with the King of Kings. If, he continued unconsciously, we may be sure plagiarizing Wolsey, if I had done for God what I have done for that man, my salvation would be secure ten times over. And now I know not what will become of me. Surely a tender and touching evidence of sweetness in the strong man who had been so readily accused of harshness by grasping courtiers. The ignorant ingratitude of the people was even perhaps more melancholy than the willful ingratitude of the king. The great Colbert had to be buried by night, lest his remains should be insulted by the mob. He, whose heart had bled for the people's sore anguish, was rashly supposed to be the cause of that anguish. It was a sad conclusion to a great life, but he would have seen still sadder days if he had lived. The health of the luxurious, self-indulgent Louis sensibly declined after he had passed his fortieth year. In spite of his robust appearance, he had never been really strong. His loose, lymphatic constitution required much support and management. But he habitually overate himself. He was indeed a gross and greedy glutton. I have often seen the king, says the Duchess of Orleans, eat four platefuls of various soups, a whole pheasant, a partridge, a large dish of salad, stewed mutton with garlic, two good slices of ham, a plate of pastry, and then fruit and sweetmeats. A most unwholesome habit of body was the result. An abscess formed in his upper jaw, and caused a perforation of the palate, which obliged him to be very careful in drinking, as the liquid was apt to pass through the aperture and come out by the nostrils. He felt weak and depressed, and began to think seriously about making his salvation. His courtly priests and confessors had never inculcated any duties but two, that of chastity and that of religious intolerance. And he had been very remiss in both. He now resolved to make hasty reparation. The ample charms of the haughty Montespan fascinated him no more. He tried a new mistress, but she did not turn out well. Madame de Fontaine was young and exquisitely pretty, but a giddy, presuming fool. She moreover died shortly. He was more than ever disposed to make his salvation, that is, to renounce the sins of the flesh and to persecute his God-fearing subjects, the Protestants. The revocation of the Edict of Nantes, one of the greatest crimes and follies which history records, was too colossal a misdeed for the guilt of its perpetration to be charged upon one man, however wicked or however powerful he may have been. In this case, 
As in so many others, Louis was the exponent of conditions, the visible representative of circumstances which he had done nothing to create. Just as he was the strongest king France ever had, without having contributed himself to the predominance of the monarchy, so, in the blind and cruel policy of intolerance which led to the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, he was the delegate and instrument of forces which existed independently of him. A willing instrument, no doubt, a representative of sinister forces, a chooser of the evil part when mere inaction would have been equivalent to a choice of the good. Still, it is due to historic accuracy to point out that, had he not been seconded by the existing condition of France, he would not have been able to effect the evil he ultimately brought about. Louis's reign continued thirty years after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, years crowded with events, particularly for the military historian, but over the details of which we shall not linger on this occasion. The brilliant reign becomes unbearably wearisome in its final period. The monotonous repetition of the same faults and the same crimes, profligate extravagance, revolting cruelty, and tottering incapacity is as fatiguing as it is uninstructive. Louis became a mere mummy, embalmed in etiquette, the puppet of his women and shavelings. The misery in the provinces grew apace, but there was no disturbance. France was too prostrate even to groan. In 1712, the expenditure amounted to 240 millions, and the revenue to 113 millions. But from this, no less than 76 millions had to be deducted for various liabilities the government had incurred leaving only a net income of 37 millions. That is to say, the outlay was more than six times the income. The armies were neither paid nor fed. The officers received food tickets, billets de subsistence, which they got cashed at a discount of 80%. The government had anticipated by 10 years its revenues from the towns. Still, this pale corpse of France must needs be bled anew to gratify the inexorable Jesuits, who had again made themselves complete masters of Louis XIV's mind. He had lost his confessor, Père Lachaise, who died in 1709, and had replaced him by the hideous Letellier, a blind and fierce fanatic with a horrible squint and a countenance fit for the gallows. He would have frightened anyone, says St. Simon, who met him at the corner of a wood. This repulsive personage revived the persecution of the Protestants into a fiercer heat than ever, and obtained from the moribund king the edict of March 8, 1715, considered by competent judges the clear masterpiece of clerical injustice and cruelty. Five months later, Louis XIV died, forsaken by his intriguing wife, his beloved bastard, the Duc de Main, and his dreaded priest. The French monarchy never recovered from the strain to which it had been subjected during the long and exhausting reign of Louis XIV. Whether it could have recovered in the hands of a great statesman summoned in time is a curious question. Could Frederick the Great have saved it? Had he been par impossible Louis the Fourteenth's successor? We can hardly doubt that he would have adjourned, if not have averted, the great catastrophe of 1789. But it is one of the inseparable accidents of such a despotism as France had fallen under, that nothing but consummate genius can save it from ruin and the accession of genius to the throne in such circumstances is a physiological impossibility. The House of Bourbon had become as effete as the House of Valois in the 16th century, as effete as the Merovingians and Carlovingians had become in a previous age. But the strong chain of hereditary right bound up the fortunes of a great empire with the feeble brain and bestial instincts of a Louis XV. This was the result of concentrating all the active force of the state in one predestined, irremovable human being. This was the logical and necessary outcome of the labors of Philip, Augustus, Philip the Fair, of Louis XI, of Henry IV, and Richelieu. They had reared the monarchy like a solitary obelisk in the midst of a desert. But it had to stand or fall alone. No one was there to help it, as no one was there to pull it down. This consideration enables us to pass into a higher and more reposing order of reflection, to leave the sterile impeachment of individual incapacity and rise to the broader question, and ask why and how that incapacity was endowed with such fatal potency for evil. As it has been well remarked, the loss of a battle may lead to the loss of a state. But then, what are the deeper reasons which explain why the loss of a battle should lead to the loss of a state? It is not enough to say that Louis XIV was an improvident and passionate ruler. 
that Louis XV was a dreary and revolting voluptuary. The problem is rather this. Why were improvidence, passion, and debauchery in two men able to bring down in utter ruin one of the greatest monarchies the world has ever seen? In other words, what was the cause of the consummate failure, the unexampled collapse of the French monarchy? No personal insufficiency of individual rulers will explain it. And, besides, the French monarchy repeatedly disposed of the services of admirable rulers. History has recorded few more able kings than Louis le Gros, Philip Augustus, Philip le Bel, Louis XI, and Henry IV. Few abler ministers than Sully, Richelieu, Colbert, and Turgot. Yet the efforts of all these distinguished men resulted in leading the nation straight into the most astounding catastrophe in human annals. Whatever view we take of the revolution, whether we regard it as a blessing or a curse, we must needs admit it was a reaction of the most violent kind, a reaction contrary to the preceding action. The old monarchy can only claim to have produced the revolution in the sense of having provoked it, as intemperance has been known to produce sobriety and extravagance parsimony. If the ancien regime led in the result to an abrupt transition to the modern era, it was only because it had rendered the old era so utterly execrable to mankind that escape in any direction seemed a relief were it over a precipice. End of part two. Section three of The Great Events of Famous Historians, volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Tom Merritt. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. New York taken by the English, A.D. 1664. By John R. Broadhead. For half a century... The Dutch colony in New York, then called New Netherlands, had developed under various administrations, when British conquest brought it under another dominion. This transfer of the government affected the whole future of the colony and of the great state into which it grew, although the original Dutch influence has never disappeared from its character and history. Under Peter Stuyvesant, the last Dutch governor, 1647 to 1664, the colony made great progress. He conciliated the Indians, agreed upon a boundary line with the English colonists at Hartford, Connecticut, and took possession of the colony of New Sweden in Delaware. Meanwhile, the English colonists in different parts of North America were carrying on illicit trade with the Dutch at New Amsterdam, New York City. The English government, already jealous of the growing commerce of Holland, was irritated by the loss of revenue and resolved in 1663 upon the conquest of New Netherlands. Broadhead, the historian of New York, recounts the steps of this conquest in a manner which brings the rival powers and their agents distinctly before us. England now determined boldly to rob Holland of her American province. King Charles II accordingly sealed a patent granting to the Duke of York and Albany a large territory in America comprehending Long Island and the islands in its neighborhood, his title to which Lord Sterling had released, and all the lands and rivers from the west side of the Connecticut River to the east side of Delaware Bay. This sweeping grant included the whole of New Netherlands and a part of the territory of Connecticut, which two years before Charles had confirmed to Winthrop and his associates. The Duke of York lost no time in giving effect to his patent. As Lord High Admiral, he directed the fleet, 
four ships, the Guinea, of 36 guns, the Elias, of 30, the Martin, of 16, and the William and Nicholas, of 10, were detached for service against New Netherlands, and about 450 regular soldiers with their officers were embarked. The command of the expedition was entrusted to Colonel Richard Nichols, a faithful royalist, who had served under Turenne with James and had been made one of the gentlemen of his bedchamber. Nichols was also appointed to be the Duke's deputy governor, after the Dutch possessions should have been reduced. With Nichols were associated Sir Robert Carr, Colonel George Cartwright, and Samuel Maverick as royal commissioners to visit the several colonies in New England. These commissioners were furnished with detailed instructions, and the New England governments were required by royal letters to join and assist them vigorously in reducing the Dutch to subjection. A month after the departure of the squadron, the Duke of York conveyed to Lord Berkeley and Sir George Carteret all the territory between the Hudson and Delaware rivers, from Cape May north to 41 degrees 40 seconds latitude and thence to the Hudson in 41 degrees latitude. Hereafter to be called by the name or names of Nova Caesarea or New Jersey. Intelligence from Boston that an English expedition against New Netherlands had sailed from Portsmouth was soon communicated to Stuyvesant by Captain Thomas Willett, and the burgomasters and Sheppens of New Amsterdam were summoned to assist the council with their advice. The capital was ordered to be put in a state of defense, guards to be maintained, and shippers to be warned. As there was very little powder at Fort Amsterdam, a supply was demanded from New Amstel and a loan of five or six thousand guilders was asked from Rensselaerwick. The ships about to sail for Curacao were stopped. Agents were sent to purchase provisions at New Haven, and as the enemy was expected to approach through Long Island Sound, spies were sent to obtain intelligence at Westchester and Milford. But at the moment, when no precaution should have been relaxed, a dispatch from the West India directors, who appear to have been misled by advices from London, announced that no danger need be apprehended from the English expedition, as it was sent out by the king only to settle the affairs of his colonies and establish episcopacy, which would rather benefit the company's interest in New Netherlands. Willett now retracting his previous statements, a perilous confidence returned. The Curacao ships were allowed to sail, and Stuyvesant, yielded to the solicitation of his council, went up the river to look after affairs at Port Orange. The English squadron had been ordered to assemble at Gardner's Island, but parting company in a fog, the Guinea, with Nichols and Cartwright on board, made Cape Cod and went on to Boston, while the other ships put in at Piscataway. The commissioners immediately demanded the assistance of Massachusetts, but the people of the bay, who feared perhaps that the king's success in reducing the Dutch would enable him the better to put down his enemies in New England, were full of excuses. Connecticut, however, showed sufficient alacrity, and Winthrop was desired to meet the squadron at the west end of Long Island, whither it would sail with the first fair wind. When the truth of Willett's intelligence became confirmed, the council sent an express to recall Stuyvesant from Fort Orange. Hurrying back to the capital, the anxious director endeavored to redeem the time which had been lost. The municipal authorities ordered one-third of inhabitants, without exception, 
to labor every third day at the fortifications, organized a permanent guard, forbade the brewers to malt any grain, and called on the provincial government for artillery and ammunition. Six pieces, besides the fourteen previously allotted, and a thousand pounds of powder, were accordingly granted to the city. The colonists around Fort Orange, pleading their own danger from the savages, could afford no help. But the soldiers of Esopus were ordered to come down after leaving a small garrison at Rondouet. In the meantime, the English squadron had anchored just below the Narrows in Nyack Bay, between New Utrecht and Coney Island. The mouth of the river was shut up. Communications between Long Island and Manhattan, Bergen and Actercull interrupted. Several yachts on their way to the South River captured, and the blockhouse on the opposite shore of Staten Island seized. Stuyvesant now dispatched Councillor de Decker, Burgomaster Vandergrist, and two Dominis Megapolensis with a letter to the English commanders inquiring why they had come and why they continued at Nyack without giving notice. The next morning, which was Saturday, Nichols sent Colonel Cartwright, Captain Needham, Captain Groves, and Mr. Thomas Delaval up to Fort Amsterdam with a summons for the surrender of, quote, the town situate on the island and commonly known by the name of Manhattos with all the forts thereunto belonging, end of quote. This summons was accompanied by a proclamation declaring that all who would submit to his majesty's government should be protected in his majesty's laws and justice and peaceably enjoy their property. Stuyvesant immediately called together the council and the burgomasters, but would not allow the terms offered by Nichols to be communicated to the people, lest they might insist on capitulating. In a short time, several of the burghers and city officers assembled at the Stadhuis. It was determined to prevent the enemy from surprising the town, but as opinion was generally against protracted resistance, a copy of the English communication was asked from the director. On the following Monday, the burgomasters explained to a meeting of the citizens the terms offered by Nichols. But this would not suffice. A copy of the paper itself must be exhibited. Stuyvesant then went in person to the meeting. Such a course, said he, would be disapproved of in the fatherland. It would discourage the people. All his efforts, however, were in vain, and the director, protesting that he should not be held answerable for the calamitous consequences, was obliged to yield to the popular will. Nichols now addressed a letter to Winthrop, who, with other commissioners from New England, had joined the squadron, authorizing him to assure Stuyvesant that if Manhattan should be delivered up to the king, any people from the Netherlands may freely come and plant there or thereabouts. And such vessels of their own country may freely come thither, and any of them may as freely return in vessels of their own country. Visiting the city under a flag of truce, Winthrop delivered this to Stuyvesant outside the fort and urged him to surrender. The director declined, and returning to the fort, he opened Nichols' letter before the council and the burgomasters, who desired that it should be communicated as 
all which regarded the public welfare ought to be made public. Against this, Stuyvesant earnestly remonstrated, and finding that the burgomasters continued firm, in a fit of passion, he tore the letter to pieces. The citizens, suddenly ceasing their work at the Palisades, hurried to the Stadtheis, and sent three of their members to the fort to demand the letter. In vain, the director hastened to pacify the burghers and urged them to go on with the fortifications. Complaints and curses were uttered on all sides against the company's misgovernment. Resistance was declared to be idle. The letter, the letter, was the general cry. To avoid a mutiny, Stuyvesant yielded, and a copy made out from the collected fragments was handed to the burgomasters. In answer, however, to Nichols' summons, he submitted a long justification of the Dutch title. Yet, while protesting against any breach of the peace between the king and the states general, for the hindrance and prevention of all differences and the spilling of innocent blood, not only in these parts, but also in Europe, he offered to treat. Long Island is gone and lost. The capital cannot hold out long, was the last dispatch to the Lord Majors of New Netherlands, which its director sent off that night in silence through Hellgate. Observing Stuyvesant's reluctance to surrender, Nichols directed Captain Hyde, who commanded the squadron, to reduce the fort. Two of the ships accordingly landed their troops just below Brooklyn, Brooklyn, where volunteers from New England and the Long Island villages had already encamped. The other two, coming up with full sail, passed in front of Fort Amsterdam and anchored between it and Nutton Island. Standing on one of the angles of the fortress, an artilleryman, with a lighted match at his side, the director watched their approach. At this moment, the two dominies Megapolensis, imploring him not to begin hostilities, led Stuyvesant from the rampart who then, with a hundred of the garrison, went into the city to resist the landing of the English. Hoping on against hope, the director now sent Councillor de Decker, Secretary Van Riven, Burgomaster Steenwick, and Shepin Cuso, with a letter to Nichols stating that as he felt bound to stand the storm, he desired, if possible, to arrange an accommodation. But the English commander merely declared, Tomorrow I will speak with you at Manhattan. Friends, was the answer, will be welcome if they come in a friendly manner. I shall come with ships and soldiers, replied Nichols. Raise the white flag of peace at the fort, and then something may be considered. When this imperious message became known, men, women, and children flocked to the director, beseeching him to submit. His only answer was, I would rather be carried out dead. The next day, the city authorities, the clergymen, and the officers of the burgher guard, assembling at the Stadhuis, at the suggestion of Domine Megapolensis, adopted a remonstrance to the director, exhibiting the hopeless situation of New Amsterdam on all sides, encompassed and hemmed in by enemies, and protesting against any further opposition to the will of God. Besides the shout, burgomasters, and shepins, the remonstrance was signed by Wilmerdonk, and 85 of the principal inhabitants, among whom was Stuyvesant's own son, Balthazar. At last, the director was obliged to yield. 
Although there were now 1,500 souls in New Amsterdam, there were not more than 250 men able to bear arms, besides the 150 regular soldiers. The people had at length refused to be called out, and the regular troops were already heard talking of where booty is to be found and where the young women live who wear gold chains. The city, entirely open along both rivers, was shut on the northern side by a breastwork and palisades, which, though sufficient to keep out the savages, afforded no defense against a military siege. There were scarcely 600 pounds of serviceable powder in store. A council of war had reported Fort Amsterdam untenable, for though it mounted 24 guns, its single wall of earth, not more than 10 feet high and four thick, was almost touched by the private dwellings clustered around, and was commanded within a pistol shot by hills on the north, over which ran the Heerweg, or Broadway. Upon the faith of Nichols' promise to deliver back the city and fort, quote, in case the difference of the limits of this province be agreed upon betwixt his majesty of England and the high and mighty states general, end quote. Stuyvesant now commissioned Councillor John de Decker, Captain Nicholas Varlet, Dr. Samuel Megapolensis, Burgomaster Cornelius Steenwick, Old Burgomaster Olaf Stevenson Van Cortland, and Old Shepin Jacques Cousseau, to agree upon articles with the English commander or his representatives. Nichols, on his part, appointed Sir Robert Carr and Colonel George Cartwright John Withrop and Samuel Willis of Connecticut, and Thomas Clark and John Pynchon of Massachusetts. The reason why those of Boston and Connecticut were joined, afterward explained the royal commander, was because those two colonies should hold themselves the more engaged with us if the Dutch had been overconfident of their strength. At eight o'clock the next morning, which was Saturday, the commissioners on both sides met at Stuyvesant's Bowery and arranged the terms of capitulation. The only difference which arose was respecting the Dutch soldiers, whom the English refused to convey back to Holland. The articles of capitulation promised the Dutch security in their property, customs of inheritance, liberty of conscience, and church discipline. The municipal officers of Manhattan were to continue for the present unchanged, and the town was to be allowed to choose deputies with free voices in all public affairs. Owners of property in Fort Orange might, if they pleased, slight the fortifications there and enjoy their houses, as people do where there is no fort. For six months, there was to be free intercourse with Holland. Public records were to be respected. The articles consented to by Nichols were to be ratified by Stuyvesant the next Monday morning at 8 o'clock. And within two hours afterward, the fort and town called New Amsterdam upon the Isle of Manhattos were to be delivered up, and the military officers and soldiers were to march out with their arms, drums beating, and colors flying, and lighted matches. On the following Monday morning at 8 o'clock, Stuyvesant, at the head of the garrison, marched out of Fort Amsterdam with all the honors of war, and led his soldiers down the Beaver Lane to the waterside, whence they were embarked for Holland. An English corporal's guard at the same time took possession of the fort, and Nichols and Carr, with their two companies, about 170 strong, entered the city, while Cartwright took possession of the gates and the Stadhuis. The New England and Long Island volunteers, however, were prudently kept at the Brooklyn Ferry, 
as the citizens dreaded most, being plundered by them. The English flag was hoisted on Fort Amsterdam, the name of which was immediately changed to Fort James. Nichols was now proclaimed by the burgomasters deputy governor for the Duke of York, in compliment to whom he directed the city of New Amsterdam should thenceforth be known as New York. To Nichols' European eye, the Dutch metropolis, with its earthen fort enclosing a windmill and high flagstaff, a prison and a governor's house, and a double-roofed church above which loomed a square tower, its gallows and whipping post at the river's side, and its rows of houses which hugged the citadel, presented but a mean appearance. Yet before long, he described it to the Duke as the best of all His Majesty's towns in America, and assured His Royal Highness that with proper management, within five years the staple of America will be drawn hither, of which the Brethren of Boston are very sensible. The Dutch frontier posts were thought of next. Colonel Cartwright, with Captains Thomas Willett, John Manning, Thomas Breeden, and Daniel Broadhead were sent to Fort Orange as soon as possible with a letter from Nichols requiring La Montagne and the magistrates and inhabitants to aid in prosecuting His Majesty's interest against all who should oppose a peaceable surrender. At the same time, Van Rensselaer was desired to bring down his patent and papers to the new governor, and likewise to observe Cartwright's directions. Councillor de Decker, however, traveling up to Fort George ahead of the English commissioners, endeavored without avail to excite the inhabitants to opposition, and his conduct being judged contrary to the spirit of the capitulation which he had signed, he was soon afterward ordered out of Nichols' government. The garrison quietly surrendered, and the name of Fort Orange was changed to that of Fort Albany, after the second title of the Duke of York. A treaty was immediately signed between Cartwright and the sachems of the Iroquois, who were promised the same advantages as heretofore they had from the Dutch, and the alliance was thus renewed, continued unbroken, until the beginning of the American Revolution. It only remained to reduce the South River, whither Sir Robert Carr was sent with the Guinea, the William, and Nicholas, and all the soldiers which are not in the fort. To the Dutch, he was instructed to promise all their privileges, only that they change their masters. To the Swedes, he was to remonstrate their happy return under a monarchical government. To Lord Baltimore's officers in Maryland, he was to say that their pretended rights being a doubtful case, possession would be kept until His Majesty is informed and satisfied otherwise. A tedious voyage brought the expedition before New Amstel. The burghers and planters, after almost three days' parley, agreed to Carr's demands, and Fob Uthout, with five others, signed articles of capitulation, which promised large privileges. But the governor and soldierly, refusing the English propositions, the fort was stormed and plundered, three of the Dutch being killed and ten wounded. In violation of his promises, Carr now exhibited the most disgraceful rapacity, appropriated farms to himself, his brother, and Captains Hyde and Morley, stripped bare the inhabitants and sent the Dutch soldiers to be sold as slaves in Virginia. To complete the work, a boat was dispatched to the city's colony at Horkill, which was seized and plundered of all its effects, and the marauding party even took what belonged to the quacking society of Plakhoi. 
to a very nail. The reduction of New Netherlands was now accomplished. All that could be further done was to change its name and to glorify one of the most bigoted princes in English history. The royal province was ordered to be called New York. Ignorant of James's grant of New Jersey to Berkeley and Carteret, Nichols gave to the region west of the Hudson the name of Albania and to Long Island that of Yorkshire, so as to comprehend all the titles of the Duke of York. The flag of England was at length triumphantly displayed, where for half a century that of Holland had rightfully waved. And from Virginia to Canada, the King of Great Britain was acknowledged as sovereign. Viewed in all its aspects, the event which gave to the whole of that country a unity and allegiance, and to which a misgoverned people complacently submitted, was as inevitable as it was momentous. But whatever may have been its ultimate consequences, this treacherous and violent seizure of the territory and possessions of an unsuspecting ally was no less a breach of private justice than of public faith. It may indeed be affirmed that among all the acts of selfish perfidy which royal ingratitude conceived and executed, there have been few more characteristic and none more base. End of section three. Section four of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Chris Pyle. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosader Johnson, and John Rudd. The Great Plague in London, A.D. 1665, by Daniel Defoe. None of the great visitations of disease that have afflicted Europe within historic times has wholly spared England. But from the time of the Black Death, in 1349, the country experienced no such suffering from any epidemic as that which fell upon London in 1665. That year the Great Plague is said to have destroyed the lives of nearly 100,000 people in England's capital. The plague had previously cropped up there every few years from lack of proper sanitation. At the time of this outbreak, the water supply of the city was notoriously impure. In 1665, the heat was uncommonly severe. Pepys said that June 7th of that year was the hottest day that he had ever known. The plague of 1665 is said, however, to have been brought in merchandise directly from Holland, where it had been smoldering for several years. Its ravages in London have often been described, and Defoe found in the calamity a subject for a special story on history. Probably he was not more than six years old when the plague appeared, but he assumes throughout the pose of a respectable and religious householder of the period. All his recollections, all the legends of the time, and the parish records are grouped in masterly fashion to form a single picture. The account has been described as a masterpiece of verisimilitude. In the first place, a blazing star or comet appeared for several months before the plague, as there did the year after, a little before the great fire. The old women and the weak-minded portion of the other sex, whom I could almost call old women too, remarked, especially afterward, though not till both those judgments were over, that those two comets passed directly over the city, and that so very near the houses, that it was plain they imported something peculiar to the city alone, that the comet before the pestilence was of a faint, dull, languid color, and its motion very heavy, solemn, and slow, but that the comet before the fire was bright and sparkling, or, as others said, flaming, and its motion swift and furious, and that, accordingly, one foretold a heavy judgment, slow, but severe, terrible, and frightful. 
as the plague was. But the other four told a stroke, sudden, swift, and fiery, like the conflagration. Nay, so particular some people were that, as they looked upon that comet preceding the fire, they fancied that they not only saw it pass swiftly and fiercely, and could perceive the motion with the eye, but they even heard it, that it made a rushing, mighty noise, fierce and terrible, though at a distance, and but just perceivable. I saw both these stars, and I must confess, had so much of the common notions of such things in my head, that I was apt to look upon them as the forerunners and warnings of God's judgments, and especially when after the plague had followed the first, I saw yet another of the like kind. I could not but say, God had not sufficiently scourged the city. But I could not, at the same time, carry these things to the height that others did, knowing, too, that natural causes are assigned by the astronomers for such things, and that their motions, and even their evolutions, are calculated, or pretended to be calculated, so that they cannot be so perfectly called the forerunners or foretellers, much less the procurers of such events as pestilence, war, fire, and the like. But let my thoughts, and the thoughts of the philosophers, be or have been what they will. These things had a more than ordinary influence upon the minds of the common people, and they had, almost universally, melancholy apprehensions of some dreadful calamity and judgment coming upon the city, and this principally from the sight of the comet, and the little alarm that was given in December by two people dying in St. Giles. The apprehensions of the people were likewise strangely increased by the error of the times, in which I think the people, from what principles I cannot imagine, were more addicted to prophecies and astrological conjurations, dreams, and old wives' tales, than ever they were before or since. Whether this unhappy temper was originally raised by the follies of some people who got money by it, that is to say, by printing predictions and prognostications, I know not. But certain it is, books frightened them terribly, such as Lily's Almanac, Gadbury's Allogical Predictions, Poor Robin's Almanac, and the like. Also several pretended religious books, one entitled, Come Out of Her, My People, Lest You Be Partaker of Her Plagues, another called, Fair Warning, another, Britain's Remembrancer, and many such, all or most part of which foretold directly or covertly, the ruin of the city. Nay, some were so enthusiastically bold as to run about the streets with their oral predictions, pretending they were sent to preach to the city, and one in particular, who, like Jonah to Nineveh, cried in the streets, Yet forty days and London shall be destroyed. I shall not be positive whether he said, Yet forty days, or Yet a few days. Another ran about naked, except a pair of drawers about his waist, crying day and night, as a man that Josephus mentions, who cried, Woe to Jerusalem, a little before the destruction of that city. So this poor naked creature cried, O the great and the dreadful God, and said no more, but repeated these words continually, with a voice and countenance full of horror, a swift pace, and nobody could ever find him to stop or rest or take any sustenance, at least that ever I could hear of. I met this poor creature several times in the streets, and would have spoken to him, but he would not enter into conversation with me or anyone else, but held on his dismal cries continually. These things terrified the people to the last degree, and especially when two or three times, as I have mentioned already, they found one or two in the bills dead of the plague at St. Giles. The justices of peace from Middlesex, by direction of the Secretary of State, have begun to shut up houses in the parishes of St. Giles in the Fields, St. Martin's, St. Clement Danes, etc., and it was with good success, for in several streets where the plague broke out, after strictly guarding the houses that were infected, and taking care to bury those that died immediately after they were known to be dead, the plague ceased in those streets. It was also observed that the plague decreased sooner in those parishes, after they had been visited in a tale, than it did in the parishes of Bishopsgate, Shoreditch, Aldgate, Whitechapel, Stepney, and others, the early care taken in that manner being a great check to it. This shutting up of houses was a method first taken, as I understand, in the plague which happened in 1603 on the ascension of King James I to the crown, 
and the power of shutting people up in their own houses was granted by an act of parliament entitled an act for the charitable relief and ordering of persons infected with the plague on which act of parliament the lord mayor and aldermen of the city of london founded the order they made at this time june 1665 when the numbers infected within the city were but few the last bill for the ninety-two parishes being but four by these means when there died about one thousand a week in the whole the number in the city was but twenty-eight and the city was more healthy in proportion than any other place all the time of the infection these orders of my lord mayor were published as i have said toward the end of june they came into operation from july first and were as follows orders conceived and published by the lord mayor and aldermen of the city of london concerning the infection of the plague sixteen sixty five whereas in the reign of our late sovereign king james of happy memory an act was made for the charitable relief and ordering of persons infected with the plague whereby authority was given to justices of the peace mayors bailiffs and other head officers to appoint within their several limits examiners searchers watchmen surgeons and nurse keepers and barriers for the persons and places infected and to minister unto them oaths for the performance of their offices and the same statute did also authorize the giving of other directions as unto them for the present necessity should seem good in their discretions it is now upon special consideration thought very expedient for preventing and avoiding of infection of sickness it shall so please almighty god that these officers be appointed and these orders hereafter duly observed then follows the orders giving these officers instructions in detail and prescribing the extent and limits of their several duties next orders concerning infected houses and persons sick of the plague they had reference to the notice to be given of the sickness sequestration of the sick airing the stuff shutting up of the house burial of the dead forbidding infected stuff to be sold and a person's leaving infected houses marking of infected houses and regulating hackney coaches that have been used to convey infected persons lastly there followed orders for cleansing and keeping the streets and houses sweet and orders concerning loose persons and idle assemblies such as beggars plays feasts and tippling houses signed sir john lawrence lord mayor sir george waterman sir charles doe sheriffs i need not say that these orders extended only to such places as were within the lord mayor's jurisdiction so it is requisite to observe that the justices of the peace within those parishes and those places called the hamlets and outparts took the same method as i remember the orders for shutting up of houses did not take place so soon on our side because as i said before the plague did not reach the eastern parts of the town at least not begin to be very violent till the beginning of august now indeed it was coming on amain for the burials that same week were in the next adjoining parishes thus st luke's shortage sixty four the next week prodigiously increased as eighty four to august first thus one hundred ten st boltoff's bishopsgate sixty five the next week prodigiously increased as one hundred and five to august first thus one hundred sixteen st giles cripplegate two hundred thirteen the next week prodigiously increased as four hundred thirty one to august first thus five hundred fifty four the total burials in the first week three hundred and forty two in the next week six hundred and twenty to august first thus seven hundred and eighty the shutting up of houses was at first considered a very cruel and unchristian thing and the poor people so confined made bitter lamentations complaints were also daily brought to my lord mayor of houses causelessly and maliciously shut up i cannot say but upon inquiry many that complained so loudly were found in a condition to be continued and others again inspection being made upon the sick person on his being content to be carried to the pest house were released indeed many people perished in these miserable confinements which it is reasonably to believe would not have been distempered if they had had liberty though the plague was in the house at which the people were at first very clamorous and uneasy and several acts of violence were committed on the men who were set to watch the houses so shut up also several people broke out by force 
in many places, as I shall observe by and by, still it was a public good that justified the private mischief, and there was no obtaining the least mitigation by any application to magistrates. This put the people upon all manner of stratagems, in order, if possible, to get out, and would fill a little volume to set down the arts used by the people of such houses, to shut the eyes of the watchmen who were employed, to deceive them, and to escape or break out from them. A few incidents on this head may prove not uninteresting. As I went along Houndsditch one morning, about eight o'clock, there was a great noise. It is true, indeed, there was not much crowd, because people were not very free to gather or to stay long together, but the outcry was loud enough to prompt my curiosity. And I called to one that looked out of a window and asked what was the matter. A watchman, it seems, had been employed to keep his post at the door of a house which was infected, or said to be infected, and was shut up. He had been there all night for two nights together, as he told his story, and the day watchman had been there one day, and had now come to relieve him. All this while no noise had been heard in the house, no light had been seen. They called for nothing, sent him no errands, which was the chief business of the watchman. Neither had they given him any disturbance, as he said, from the Monday afternoon, when he heard great crying and screaming in the house, which, as he supposed, was occasioned by some of the family dying just at that time. It seems the night before the dead cart, as it was called, had been stopped there, and a servant-maid had been brought down to the door dead, and the barriers or bearers, as they were called, put her into the cart, wrapped only in a green rug, and carried her away. The watchman had knocked at the door, it seems, when he heard that noise and crying as above, and nobody answered a great while. But at last one looked out and said with an angry quick tone, What do ye want, that ye make such a knocking? He answered, I am the watchman. How do you do? What is the matter? The person answered, What is that to you? Stop the dead cart. This, it seems, was about one o'clock, soon after, as the fellow said, he stopped the dead cart, and then knocked again, but nobody answered. He continued knocking, and the bellman called out several times, Bring out your dead! But nobody answered, till the man that drove the cart, being called to other houses, would stay no longer and drove away. The watchman knew not what to make of all this, so he let them alone till the day watchman came to relieve him, giving him an account of the particulars. They knocked at the door a great while, but nobody answered and they observed that the window or casement at which the person had looked out continued open, being up two pair of stairs. Upon this the two men, to satisfy their curiosity, got a long ladder, and one of them went up to the window and looked into the room, where he saw a woman lying dead upon the floor, in a dismal manner, having no clothes on her but her shift. Although he called aloud, and knocked hard on the floor with his long staff, yet nobody stirred or answered, neither could he hear any noise in the house. Upon this he came down again, and acquainted his fellow, who went up also, and finding the case as above, they resolved either to acquaint the Lord Mayor or some other magistrate with it. The magistrate, it seems, upon the information of the two men, ordered the house to be broken open, a constable and other persons being appointed to be present, that nothing might be plundered, and accordingly it was so done, when nobody was found in the house but that young woman who, having been infected and past recovery, the rest had left her to die by herself. Every one was gone, having found some way to delude the watchman, and to get open the door, or get out at some back door, or over the tops of the houses, so that he knew nothing of it. And as to those cries and shrieks which the watchman had heard, it was supposed they were the passionate cries of the family, at the bitter parting which, to be sure, it was to them all, this being the sister to the mistress of the house. Many such escapes were made out of infected houses, as particularly when the watchman was sent on some errand, that is to say, for necessaries, such as food and physic, to fetch physicians if they would come, or surgeons or nurses, or to order the dead cart and the like. Now when he went it was his duty to lock up the outer door of the house and take the key away with him, but to evade this and cheat the watchman. People got two or three keys made to their locks, or they found means to unscrew the locks, open the door, and go out as they pleased. This way of escape being found out, the officers afterward had orders to padlock up the doors on the outside and place bolts on them as they thought fit. At another house, as I was informed, in the street near Aldgate, 
A whole family was shut up and locked in because the maidservant was ill. The master of the house had complained by his friends to the next alderman and to the lord mayor, and had consented to have the maid carried to the pest house, and was refused. So the door was marked with a red cross, a padlock on the outside as above, and the watchman set to keep the door according to public order. After the master of the house found there was no remedy, but that he, his wife, and his children were to be locked up with this poor, distempered servant, he called to the watchman and told him he must go then and fetch a nurse for them to attend this poor girl, for that it would be certain death to them all to oblige them to nurse her, and that if he would not do this, the maid must perish either of the distemper or be starved for want of food, for he was resolved none of his family should go near her, and she lay in the garret, four-story high, where she could not cry out or call to anybody for help. The watchman went and fetched a nurse as he was appointed, and brought her to them the same evening. During the interval, the master of the house took the opportunity of breaking a large hole through his shop into a stall where formerly a cobbler had sat, before or under his shop window, but the tenant, as may be supposed, at such a dismal time as that, was dead or removed, and so he had the key in his own keeping. Having made his way into the stall, which he could not have done if the man had been at the door, the noise he was obliged to make being such as would have alarmed the watchman, I say having made his way into this stall, he sat still till the watchman returned with the nurse, and all the next day also. But the night following, having contrived to send the watchman another trifling errand, he conveyed himself and all his family out of the house, and left the nurse and the watchman to bury the poor woman, that is, to throw her into the cart and take care of the house. I could give a great many such stories as these, which in the long course that dismal year I met with, that is, heard of, and which are very certain to be true, or very near the truth, that is to say, true in general. For no man could, at such time, learn all the particulars. There was, likewise, violence used with the watchman, as were reported, in abundance of places, and I believe that, from the beginning of the visitation to the end, not less than eighteen or twenty of them were killed, are so severely wounded as to be taken up for dead, which was supposed to have been done by the people in the infected houses which were shut up, and where they attempted to come out and were opposed. For example, not far from Coleman Street, they blowed up a watchman with gunpowder, and burned the poor fellow dreadfully, and while he made hideous cries, and nobody would venture to come near to help him, the whole family that were able to stir got out at the windows one story high, two that were left sick, calling out for help. Care was taken to give the latter nurses to look after them. But the fugitives were not found till after the plague abated, when they returned, but as nothing could be proved, so nothing could be done to them. It is to be considered, too, that these were prisons without bars or bolts, which our common prisons are furnished with. So the people let themselves down out of their windows, even in the face of the watchman, bringing swords or pistols in their hands, and threatening to shoot the poor wretch if he stirred or called for help. In other cases, some had gardens and walls, or palings between them and their neighbors, or yards and back houses, and these, by friendship and entreaties, will get leave to get over those walls or palings, and so go out at their neighbors' doors, or, by giving money to their servants, get them to let them through in the night so that, in short, the shutting up of houses was in no way wise to be depended upon. Neither did it answer the end at all, serving more to make the people desperate and drive them to violent extremities in their attempts to break out. But what was still worse, those that did thus break out spread the infection by wandering about with the distemper upon them, and many that did so were driven to dreadful exigencies and extremities, and perished in the streets or fields, or dropped down with the raging violence of the fever upon them. Others wandered into the country, and went forward any way as their desperation guided them, not knowing whither they went or would go, till faint and tired, the houses and villages on the road refusing to admit them to lodge, whether infected or no, they perished by the roadside. On the other hand, when the plague had first seized a family, that is to say, when any one of the family had gone out and unwarily or otherwise caught the distemper and brought it home, it was certainly known by the family before it was known to the officers who were appointed to examine into the circumstances of all sick persons when they heard of their being sick. 
I remember, and while I am writing this story, I think I hear the very shrieks. A certain lady had an only daughter, a young maiden about nineteen years old, and who was possessed of a very considerable fortune. The young woman, her mother, and the maid, had been out for some purpose, for the house was not shut up. But about two hours after they came home, the young lady complained she was not well. In a quarter of an hour more, she vomited and had a violent pain in her head. Pray God, says her mother, in a terrible fright, my child has not the distemper. The pain in her head increasing, her mother ordered the bed to be warmed, and resolved to put her to bed, and prepared to give her things to sweat, which was the ordinary remedy to be taken when the first apprehensions of the distemper began. While the bed was being aired, the mother undressed the young woman, and on looking over her body with a candle, immediately discovered the fatal tokens. Her mother, not being able to contain herself, threw down her candle and screeched out in such a frightful manner that it was enough to bring horror upon the stoutest heart in the world. Overcome by fright, she first fainted, then recovered, then ran all over the house, up the stairs and down the stairs, like one distracted. Then she continued screeching and crying out for several hours, void of all sense, or at least government of her senses, and, as I was told, never came thoroughly to herself again. As to the young maiden, she was dead from that moment, for the gangrene which occasions the spots had spread over her whole body, and she died in less than two hours. But still the mother continued crying out, not knowing anything more of her child, several hours after she was dead. I went all the first part of the time freely upon the streets, though not so freely as to run myself into apparent danger, except when they dug the great pit in the churchyard of our parish of Aldgate. A terrible pit it was, and I could not resist the curiosity to go and see it, so far as I could judge, it was about forty feet in length and about fifteen or sixteen feet broad, and at the time I first looked at it, about nine feet deep. But it was said they dug it nearly twenty feet deep afterward, when they could go no deeper, for the water. They had dug several pits in another ground when the distemper began to spread in our parish, and especially when the dead carts began to go about, which in our parish was not till the beginning of August. Into these pits they had put perhaps fifty or sixty bodies each, then they made larger holes, wherein they buried all that the cart brought in a week, which, by the middle to the end of August, came to from two hundred to four hundred a week. They could not dig them larger because of the order of the magistrates, confining them to leave no bodies within six feet of the surface. Besides the water coming on at about seventeen or eighteen feet, they could not well put more in one pit. But now at the beginning of September, the plague being at its height, and the number of burials in our parish increasing to more than were ever buried in any parish about London of no larger extent, they ordered this dreadful gulf to be dug, for such it was, rather than a pit. They had supposed the pit would have supplied them for a month or more when they dug it, and some blamed the church wardens for suffering such a frightful thing, telling them they were making preparations to bury the whole parish and the like. But time made it appear, the church wardens knew the condition of the parish better than they did, for the pit being finished September 4th, I think they began to bury in it on the 6th, and by the 20th, which was just two weeks, they had thrown into it 1,114 bodies, when they were obliged to fill it up, the bodies being within six feet of the surface. It was about September 10th that my curiosity led, or rather drove me, to go and see this pit again when there had been about four hundred people buried in it, and I was not content to see it in the daytime, as I had done before, for then there would have been nothing to see but the loose earth, for all the bodies that were thrown in were immediately covered with earth by those they called the barriers, and I resolved to go in the night and see some of the bodies thrown in. There was a strict order against people coming to those pits, and that was only to prevent infection, but after some time that order was more necessary for people that were infected, and near their end, and delirious also, would run to those pits, wrapped in blankets or rags, and throw themselves in and bury themselves. I got admittance into the churchyard by being acquainted with the sexton, who, though he did not refuse me at all, yet earnestly persuaded me not to go, telling me very seriously, for he was a good and sensible man, that it was indeed their business and duty to run all hazards, and that in so doing they might hope to be preserved, but that I had no apparent call 
except my own curiosity, which he said he believed I would not pretend was sufficient to justify my exposing myself to infection. I told him I had been pressed in my mind to go, and that perhaps it might be an instructing sight that might not be without its uses. Nay, said the good man, if you will venture on that score, in the name of God go in, for depend upon it, twill be a sermon to you. It may be the best you ever heard in your life. It is a speaking sight, says he, and has a voice with it and a loud one, to call us to repentance. And that he opened the door and said, Go if you will. His words had shocked my resolution a little, and I stood wavering for a good while. But just at that interval I saw two links come over from the end of the minories, and heard the bellman, and then appeared a dead cart. So I could no longer resist my desire and went in. There was nobody that I could perceive at first in the churchyard or going into it, but the barriers and the fellow that drove the cart, or rather led the horse and cart. But when they came up to the pit, they saw a man going to and fro, muffled in a brown cloak, and making motions with his hands under his cloak, as if he was in great agony, and the barriers immediately gathered about him, supposing he was one of those poor, delirious, or desperate creatures that used to bury themselves. He said nothing as he walked about, but two or three times groaned very deeply and loud, and sighed, as he would break his heart. When the barriers came up to him, they soon found he was neither a person infected and desperate, as I had observed above, nor a person distempered in mind, but one oppressed with a dreadful weight of grief, indeed having his wife and several of his children in the cart that had just come in, and he followed it in an agony and excess of sorrow. He mourned heartily, as it was easy to see, but with a kind of masculine grief that could not give itself vent in tears, and calmly desiring the barriers to let him alone, said he would only see the bodies thrown in and go away, so they left him portuning him. But no sooner was the cart turned round, and the body shot into the pit promiscuously, which was a surprise to him, for he at least expected they would have been decently laid in, though indeed he was afterward convinced that was impracticable. I say, no sooner did he see the sight, but he cried out aloud, unable to contain himself. I could not hear what he said, but he went backward and forward two or three times and fell down in a swoon. The barriers ran to him, and took him up, and in a little while he came to himself, and they led him away to the Pie Tavern, over against the end of Houndsditch, where it seems the man was known, and where they took care of him. He looked into the pit again as he went away, but the barriers had covered the body so immediately, with throwing in the earth, that, though there was light enough, for there were lanterns and candles placed all round the sides of the pit, yet nothing could be seen. This was a mournful scene, indeed, and affected me almost as much as the rest, but the other was awful and full of terror. The cart had in it sixteen or seventeen bodies. Some were wrapped up in linen sheets, some in rugs, some all but naked, or so loose that what covering they had fell from them in being shot out of the cart for coffins were not to be had for the prodigious numbers that fell in such a calamity as this. It was reported, by way of scandal upon the barriers, that if any corpse was delivered to them decently wrapped in a winding sheet, the barriers were so wicked as to strip them in the cart, and carry them quite naked to the ground, but as I cannot easily credit anything so vile among Christians, and at a time so filled with terrors as that was, I can only relate it and leave it undetermined. I was indeed shocked at the whole sight. It almost overwhelmed me, and I went away with my heart full of the most afflicting thoughts, such as I cannot describe. Just at my going out of the churchyard and turning up the street toward my own house, I saw another cart with links and a bellman going before, coming out of Harrow Alley, in the butcher row, on the other side of the way, and being, as I perceived, very full of dead bodies, and went directly toward the church. I stood a while, but I had no desire to go back again to see the same dismal scene over again, so I went directly home, for I could not but consider with thankfulness the risk I had run. Here the poor unhappy gentleman's grief came into my head again, and indeed I could not but shed tears in reflecting upon it, perhaps more than he did himself. But his case lay so heavy upon my mind that I could not constrain myself from going again to the Pie Tavern, resolving to inquire what became of him. It was by this time one o'clock in the morning, and the poor gentleman was still there. The truth was the people of the house, knowing him, had kept him there all the night, notwithstanding the danger of being infected by him, though it appeared the man was perfectly sound himself. 
It is with regret that I take notice of this tavern. The people were civil, mannerly, and obliging enough, and had till this time kept their house open and their trade going on, though not so very publicly as formerly. And a dreadful set of fellows frequented their house, who, in the midst of all this horror, met there every night, behaved with all the reveling and roaring extravagances, as are usual for such people to do at other times, and indeed to such an offensive degree, that the very master and mistress of the house grew first ashamed, and then terrified at them. They sat generally in a room next the street, and as they always kept late hours, so when the dead cart came across the street in to go into Houndsditch, which was in view of the tavern windows, they would frequently open the windows as soon as they heard the bell and look out at them. And as they might often hear sad lamentations of people in the streets, or at their windows as the carts went along, they would make their impudent mocks and jeers at them, especially if they heard the poor people call upon God to have mercy upon them, as many would do at those times in passing along the streets. These gentlemen, being something disturbed with the clatter of bringing the poor gentleman into the house, as above, were first angry and very high with the master of the house for suffering such a fellow, as they called him, to be brought out of the grave into their house. But being answered that the man was a neighbor, and that he was sound, but overwhelmed with the calamity of his family and the like, they turned their anger into ridiculing the man and his sorrow for his wife and children, taunting him with want of courage to leap into the great pit and go to heaven, as they jeeringly expressed it, along with them adding some profane and blasphemous expressions. They were at this vile work when I came back to the house, and as far as I could see, though the man sat still, mute and disconsolate, and their affronts could not divert his sorrow, yet he was both grieved and offended at their words. Upon this I gently reproved them, being well enough acquainted with their characters, and not unknown in person to two of them. They immediately fell upon me with ill language and oaths, asked me what I did out of my grave at such a time, when so many honester men were carried into the churchyard, and why I was not at home, saying my prayers till the dead cart came for me. I was indeed astonished at the impudence of the men, though not at all discomposed at their treatment of me. However, I kept my temper. I told them that, though I defied them or any man in the world to tax me with any dishonesty, Yet I acknowledge that in this terrible judgment of God many a better man than I was swept away and carried to his grave. But to answer their question directly, it was true that I was mercifully preserved by that great God whose name they had blasphemed and taken in vain by cursing and swearing in a dreadful manner, and that I believed I was preserved, in particular, among other ends of his goodness, that I might reprove them for their audacious boldness of behaving in such a manner and in such an awful time as this was, especially for their jeering and mocking at an honest gentleman and a neighbor, who they saw was overwhelmed with sorrow for the sufferings with which it had pleased God to afflict his family. They received all reproof with the utmost contempt, and made the greatest mockery that was possible for them to do at me, giving me all the opprobrious, insolent scoffs that they could think of for preaching to them, as they called it, which indeed grieved me rather than angered me. I went away, however, blessing God in my mind that I had not spared them, though they had insulted me so much. They continued this wretched course three or four days after this, continually mocking and jeering at all that showed themselves religious or serious, or that were any way us, and I was informed they flouted in the same manner at the good people who, notwithstanding the contagion, met at the church, fasted, and prayed God to remove his hand from them. I say they continued this dreadful course three or four days, I think it was no more, when one of them, particularly he who asked the poor gentleman what he did out of his grave, was struck with the plague and died in a most deplorable manner. And in a word, they were every one of them carried into the great pit, which I had mentioned above, before it was quite filled up, which was not above a fortnight, or thereabout. End of section four. Section number five of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume Twelve. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Matthew Flout. 
The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Great Fire in London, A.D. 1666, by John Evelyn. In the reign of Charles II, the Merry Monarch, of whom one of his ministers observed that he never said a foolish thing, and never did a wise one, the calamities which happen eclipse the merriment of his people, if not that of the sovereign himself. In 1666, England had not fully recovered from the civil wars of 1642 to 1651. She was now at war with the allied Dutch and French, and was suffering from the terrible effects of the Great Plague, which ravaged London in 1665. During September 2nd to the 5th, 1666, occurred a catastrophe of almost equal horror. A fire, which broke out in a baker's house near the bridge, spread on all sides so rapidly that the people were unable to extinguish it until two-thirds of the city had been destroyed. Evelyn's account, from his famous diary, is that of an eyewitness who took a prominent part in dealing with the conflagration, during which the inhabitants of London, like those of some of our cities in recent times, were reduced to be spectators of their own ruin. Besides suspecting the French and Dutch of having landed, and, as Evelyn records, of firing the town, people assign various other possible origins for the disaster, charging it upon the Republicans, the Catholics, etc. It was obviously due, as Hume thought it worthwhile to note, to the narrow streets, the houses built entirely of wood, the dry season, and a strong east wind. But the fire, says a later writer, though destroying so much, was most beneficial in thoroughly eradicating the plague. The fever dens in which it continually lurked were burned, and the new houses which were erected were far more healthy and better arranged. In the year of our Lord, 1666, 2nd of September, this fatal night, about ten, began that deplorable fire near Fish Street in London. The fire continuing, after dinner I took coach with my wife and son, and went to the bankside in Southwark, where we beheld that dismal spectacle, the whole city in dreadful flames near the waterside, all the houses from the bridge, all Thames Street, and upward toward Cheapside, down to the three cranes were now consumed. The fire having continued all this night, if I may call that night, which was as light as day for ten miles round bout, after a dreadful manner, when conspiring with a fierce eastern wind in a very dry season, I went on foot to the same place, and saw the whole south part of the city burning from Cheapside to the Thames, and all along Cornhill, for it kindled back against the wind as well as forward, Tower Street, Fenchurch Street, Gracechurch Street, and so along to Baynard's Castle, and was now taking hold of St. Paul's Church, to which the scaffolds contributed exceedingly. The conflagration was so universal, and the people so astonished, that from the beginning, I know not by what despondency or fate, they hardly stirred to quench it, so that there was nothing heard or seen but crying out in lamentation, running about like distracted creatures, without at all attempting to save even their goods. Such a strange consternation there was upon them. So as it burned, both in breadth and length, the churches, public halls, exchange, hospitals, monuments and ornaments, leaping after a prodigious manner from house to house and street to street, at great distances one from the other, for the heat, with a long set of fair and warm weather, had even ignited the air and prepared the materials to conceive the fire, which devoured, after an incredible manner, houses, furniture, and everything. Here we saw the Thames covered with goods floating, all the barges and boats laden with what some had time and courage to save, as on the other, the carts, etc., carrying out to the fields, which for many miles were strewed with movables of all sorts, and tents erecting to shelter both people and what goods they could get away. Oh, the miserable and calamitous spectacle, such as happily the world has not seen the like since the foundation of it, nor be outdone till the universal conflagration. All the sky was of a fiery aspect, 
like the top of a burning oven. The light seen above forty miles round about for many nights. God grant my eyes may never behold the like. Now seeing above ten thousand houses all in one flame, the noise and cracking and thunder of the impetuous flames, the shrieking of women and children, the hurry of people, the fall of towers, houses and churches was like a hideous storm, and the air all about so hot and inflamed that at last one was not able to approach it, so that they were forced to stand still and let the flames burn on, which they did for near two miles in length and one in breadth. The clouds of smoke were dismal and reached upon computation near fifty miles in length. Thus I left it this afternoon burning, a resemblance of Sodom or the last day. London was, but is no more. The burning still rages, and it has now gotten as far as the inner temple, all Fleet Street, the Old Bailey, Ludgate Hill, Warwick Lane, Newgate, Paul's Chain, Watling Street, now flaming and most of it reduced to ashes. The stones of St. Paul's flew like granados, the melting lead running down the streets in a stream, and the very pavements glowing with fiery redness, so as no horse, no man was able to tread on them, and the demolition had stopped all the passages, so that no help could be applied. The eastern wind still more impetuously drove the flames forward. Nothing but the almighty power of God was able to stop them, for vain was the help of man. It crossed toward Whitehall. Oh, the confusion there was then at that court. It pleased his majesty to command me among the rest to look after the quenching of Fetter Lane, and to preserve, if possible, that part of Holborn, while the rest of the gentlemen took their several posts. For now they began to bestir themselves, and not till now, who hitherto had stood as men intoxicated, with their hands across, and began to consider that nothing was likely to put a stop but the blowing up of so many houses might make a wider gap than any had yet been made by the ordinary method of pulling them down with engines. This some stout seamen proposed early enough to have saved nearly the whole city, but this some tenacious and avaricious men, aldermen, etc., would not permit, because their houses must have been of the first. It was therefore now commanded to be practised, and my concern, being particularly for the hospital of St. Bartholomew near Smithfield, where I had many wounded and sick men, made me the more diligent to promote it. Nor was my care for the Savoy less. It now pleased God, by abating the wind, and by the industry of the people, infusing a new spirit into them, and the fury of it began sensibly to abate about noon. So as it came no further than the temple westward, nor than the entrance of Smithfield north, but continued all this day and night so impetuous toward Cripplegate and the tower, as made us all despair. It also broke out again in the temple, but the courage of the multitude persisting, and many houses being blown up, such gaps and desolations were soon made, as with the former three days' consumption the backfire did not so vehemently urge upon the rest as formerly. There was yet no standing near the burning and glowing ruins by near a furlong space. The coal and wood wharfs and magazines of oil, resin, etc., did infinite mischief, so, as the invective, which a little before I had dedicated to his majesty and published, giving warning what might probably be the issue of suffering those shops to be in the city, was looked on as a prophecy. The poor inhabitants were dispersed about St. George's Fields and Moorfields, as far as Highgate, and several miles in circle, some under tents, some under miserable huts and hovels, many without a rag, or any necessary utensils, bed, or board, who, from delicateness, riches, and easy accommodations in stately and well-furnished houses, were now reduced to extremest misery and poverty. In this calamitous condition I returned with a sad heart to my house, blessing and adoring the mercy of God to me and mine, who in the midst of all this ruin was like Lot, in my little Zor, safe and sound. I went this morning on foot from Whitehall as far as London Bridge, through the late Fleet Street, Ludgate Hill, by St. Paul's, Cheapside, Exchange, Bishopsgate, Aldersgate, and out to Moorfields, thence through Cornhill, etc. 
with extraordinary difficulty clambering over heaps of yet smoking rubbish and frequently mistaking where I was. The ground under my feet was so hot that it even burned the soles of my shoes. In the meantime, His Majesty got to the tower by water to demolish the houses about the graff, which, being built entirely about it, had they taken fire and attacked the White Tower, where the magazine of powder lay, would undoubtedly not only have beaten down and destroyed all the bridge, but sunk and torn the vessels in the river, and rendered the demolition beyond all expression for several miles about the country. At my return, I was infinitely concerned to find that goodly church, St. Paul's, now a sad ruin, and that beautiful portico, or structure comparable to any in Europe, as not long before repaired by the king, now rent in pieces. Flakes of vast stones split asunder, and nothing remaining entire but the inscription in the architrave, showing by whom it was built, which had not one letter of it defaced. It was astonishing to see what immense stones the heat had in a manner calcined, so that all the ornaments, columns, friezes, and projectures of massy Portland stone flew off, even to the very roof, where a sheet of lead covering a great space was totally melted. The ruins of the vaulted roof, falling broken to St. Faith's, which being filled with the magazines of books belonging to the stationers, and carried thither for safety, they were all consumed, burning for a week following. It is also observable that the lead over the altar at the east end was untouched, and among the divers' monuments the body of one bishop remained entire. Thus lay in ashes the most venerable church, one of the most ancient pieces of early piety in the Christian world, besides near one hundred more. The lead, ironwork, bells, plate, etc., melted. The exquisitely wrought Mercer's Chapel, the sumptuous exchange, the august fabric of Christ Church, all the rest of the company's halls, sumptuous buildings, arches, all in dust. The fountains dried up and ruined, while the very waters remained boiling. The vorigos of subterranean cellars, wells and dungeons, formerly warehouses, still burning in stench and dark clouds of smoke, so that in five or six miles traversing about, I did not see one load of timber consumed, nor many stones, but what were calcined white as snow. The people who now walked about the ruins appeared like men in a dismal desert, or rather in some great city laid waste by a cruel enemy, to which was added the stench that came from some poor creature's bodies, beds, etc. Sir Thomas Gresham's statue, though fallen from its niche in the Royal Exchange, remained entire, when all of those of the kings since the conquest were broken to pieces also the standard in Cornhill, and Queen Elizabeth's effigies, and with some arms on Ludgate, continued with but little detriment, while the vast iron chains of the city streets, hinges, bars, and gates of prisons, were many of them melted and reduced to cinders by the vehement heat. I was not able to pass through any of the narrow streets, but kept the widest. The ground and air, smoke and fiery vapor, continued so intense that my hair was almost singed and my feet insufferably surheated. The by-lanes and narrower streets were quite filled up with rubbish, nor could one have known where he was but by the ruins of some church or hall that had some remarkable tower or pinnacle remaining. I then went toward Islington and Highgate, where one might have seen two hundred thousand people of all ranks and degrees, dispersed and lying along by their heaps of what they could save from the fire, deploring their loss, and, though ready to perish for hunger and destitution, yet not asking one penny for relief, which to me appeared a stranger sight than any I had yet beheld. His Majesty in Council, indeed, took all imaginable care for their relief, by proclamation for the country to come in and refresh them with provisions. In the midst of all this calamity and confusion there was, I know not how, an alarm begun that the French and Dutch, with whom we are now in hostility, were not only landed, but even entering the city. There was, in truth, some days before, great suspicion of these two nations joining, and now that they had been the occasion of firing the town. This report did so terrify that on a sudden there was such an uproar and tumult that they ran from their goods and, taking what weapons they could come at, 
they could not be stopped from falling on some of those nations whom they casually met, without sense or reason. The clamor and peril grew so excessive that it made the whole court amazed, and they did, with infinite pains and great difficulty, reduce and appease the people, sending troops of soldiers and guards to cause them to retire into the fields again, where they were watched all this night. I left them pretty quiet, and came home sufficiently weary and broken. Their spirits thus a little calmed, and the affright abated. They now began to repair into the suburbs about the city, where such as had friends or opportunity got shelter for the present, to which His Majesty's proclamation also invited them. End of section 5「Section 6 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in July 2023. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rosita Johnson, and John Rudd. Discovery of Gravitation, A.D. 1666, by Sir David Brewster. Many admirers of Sir Isaac Newton have asserted that his was the most gigantic intellect ever bestowed on man. He discovered the law of gravitation, and by it explained all the broader phenomena of nature, such as the movement of the planets, the shape and revolution of the earth, the succession of the tides. Copernicus had asserted that the planets moved, Newton demonstrated it mathematically. His discoveries in optics were, in his own time, almost equally famous, while in his later life he shared with Leibniz the honor of inventing the infinitesimal calculus, a method which lies at the root of all the intricate marvels of modern mathematical science. Newton should not, however, be regarded as an isolated phenomenon, a genius, but for whom the world would have remained in darkness. His first flashing idea of gravitation deserves perhaps to be called an inspiration. But in all his other labors, experimental as well as mathematical, he was but following the spirit of the times. The love of science was abroad, and its infinite curiosity. Each of Newton's discoveries was claimed also by other men who had been working along similar lines. Of the dispute over the gravitation theory, Sir David Brewster, the great authority for the career of Newton, gives some account. The controversy over the calculus was even more bitter and prolonged. It were well, however, to disabuse one's mind of the idea that Newton's work was a finality, that it settled anything. As to why the law of gravitation exists, why bodies tend to come together, the philosopher had little suggestion to offer, and the present generation knows no more than he. Before Copernicus and Newton, men looked only with their eyes, and accepted the apparent movements of sun and stars as real. Now, going one step deeper, we look with our brains and see their real movements which underlie appearances. Newton supplied us with the law and rate of the movement, but not its cause. It is toward that cause, that great why, that science has ever since been dimly groping. In the year 1666, when the plague had driven Newton from Cambridge, he was sitting alone in the garden at Woolsthrope, and reflecting on the nature of gravity, that remarkable power which causes all bodies to descend toward the centre of the earth. As this power is not found to suffer any sensible diminution at the greatest distance from the earth's centre to which we can reach, being as powerful at the tops of the highest mountains as at the bottom of the deepest mines, he conceived it highly probable that it must extend much further than it was usually supposed. No sooner had this happy conjecture occurred to his mind that he considered what would be the effect of its extending as far as the moon. That her motion must be influenced by such a power he did not for a moment doubt, and a little reflection convinced him that it might be sufficient for retaining that luminary in her orbit round the earth. 
though the force of gravity suffers no sensible diminution at those small distances from the earth's centre at which we can place ourselves yet he thought it very possible that at the distance of the moon it might differ much in strength from what it is on the earth in order to form some estimate of the degree of its diminution he considered that if the moon be retained in her orbit by the force of gravity the primary planets must also be carried round the sun by the same power and by comparing the periods of the different planets with their distances from the sun he found that if they were retained in their orbits by any power like gravity its force must decrease in the duplicate proportion or as the squares of their distances from the sun in drawing this conclusion he supposed the planets to move in orbits perfectly circular and having the sun in their centre having thus obtained the law of the force by which the planets were drawn to the sun his next object was to ascertain if such a force emanating from the earth and directed to the moon was sufficient when diminished in the duplicate ratio of the distance to retain her in her orbit in performing this calculation it was necessary to compare the space through which heavy bodies fall in a second at a given distance from the centre of the earth that is at its surface with the space through which the moon as it were falls to the earth in a second of time while revolving in a circular orbit being at a distance from books when he made this computation he adopted the common estimate of the earth's diameter then in use among geographers and navigators and supposed that each degree of latitude contained sixty english miles in this way he found that the force which retains the moon in her orbit as deduced from the force which occasions the fall of heavy bodies to the earth's surface was one-sixth greater than that which is actually observed in her circular orbit this difference threw a doubt upon all his speculations but unwilling to abandon what seemed to be otherwise so plausible he endeavoured to account for the difference of the two forces by supposing that some other cause must have been united with the force of gravity in producing so great velocity of the moon in her circular orbit as this new cause however was beyond the reach of observation he discontinued all further inquiries into the subject and concealed from his friends the speculations in which he had been employed after his return to cambridge in sixteen sixty six his attention was occupied with optical discoveries but he had no sooner brought them to a close than his mind reverted to the great subject of the planetary motions upon the death of oldenburg in august sixteen seventy eight dr hook was appointed secretary to the royal society and as this learned body had requested the opinion of newton about the system of physical astronomy he addressed a letter to dr hook on november twenty eighth sixteen seventy nine in this letter he proposed a direct experiment for verifying the motion of the earth that is by observing whether or not bodies that fall from a considerable height descend in a vertical direction for if the earth were at rest the body would describe exactly a vertical line whereas if it revolved around its axis the falling body must deviate from the vertical line toward the east the royal society attached great value to the idea thus casually suggested and dr hook was appointed to put it to the test of experiment being thus led to consider the subject more attentively he wrote to newton that wherever the direction of gravity was oblique to the axis on which the earth revolved that is in every part of the earth except the equator falling bodies should approach to the equator and the deviation from the vertical in place of being exactly to the east as newton maintained should be to the southeast of the point from which the body began to move newton acknowledged that this conclusion was correct in theory and dr hook is said to have given an experimental demonstration of it before the royal society in december sixteen seventy nine newton had erroneously concluded that the path of the falling body would be a spiral but dr hook on the same occasion on which he made the preceding experiment read a paper to the society in which he proved that the path of the body would be an eccentric ellipse in vacuo and an elliptic spiral 
if the body moved in a resisting medium. This correction of Newton's error, and the discovery that a projectile would move in an elliptical orbit when under the influence of a force varying in the inverse ratio of the square of the distance, led Newton, as he himself informs us in his letter to Halley, to discover the theorem by which he afterward examined the ellipsis, and to demonstrate the celebrated proposition that a planet acted upon by an attractive force varying inversely as the squares of the distances will describe an elliptical orbit in one of whose foci the attractive force resides. But though Newton had thus discovered the true cause of all the celestial motions, he did not yet possess any evidence that such a force actually resided in the sun and planets. The failure of his former attempt to identify the law of falling bodies at the Earth's surface with that which guided the moon in her orbit threw a doubt over all his speculations and prevented him from giving any account of them to the public. An accident, however, of a very interesting nature induced him to resume his former inquiries and enabled him to bring them to a close. In June 1682, when he was attending a meeting of the Royal Society of London, the measurement of a degree of the meridian, executed by M. Picard in 1679, became the subject of conversation. Newton took a memorandum of the result obtained by the French astronomer, and, having deduced from it the diameter of the earth, he immediately resumed his calculation of 1665, and began to repeat it with these new data. In the progress of the calculation, he saw that the result which he had formerly expected was likely to be produced, and he was thrown into such a state of nervous irritability that he was unable to carry on the calculation. In this state of mind he entrusted it to one of his friends, and he had the high satisfaction of finding his former views amply realized. The force of gravity, which regulated the fall of bodies at the Earth's surface, when diminished as the square of the moon's distance from the earth, was found to be almost exactly equal to the centrifugal force of the moon as deduced from her observed distance and velocity. The influence of such a result upon such a mind may be more easily conceived than described. The whole material universe was spread out before him, the sun with all his attending planets, the planets with all their satellites, the comets wheeling in every direction in their eccentric orbits, and the systems of the fixed stars stretching to the remotest limits of space. All the varied and complicated movements of the heavens, in short, must have been at once presented to his mind as the necessary result of that law which he had established in reference to the earth and the moon. After extending this law to the other bodies of the system, he composed a series of propositions on the motion of the primary planets about the sun, which were sent to London about the end of 1683, and were soon afterward communicated to the Royal Society. About this period other philosophers had been occupied with the same subject. Sir Christopher Wren had many years before endeavoured to explain the planetary motions by the composition of a descent toward the sun and an impressed motion, but he at length gave it over, not finding the means of doing it. In January 1683 to 1684, Dr. Halley had concluded from Kepler's law of the periods and distances that the centripetal force decreased in the reciprocal proportion of the squares of the distances, and, having one day met Sir Christopher Wren and Dr. Hook, the latter affirmed that he had demonstrated upon that principle all the laws of the celestial motions. Dr. Halley confessed that his attempts were unsuccessful, and Sir Christopher, in order to encourage the inquiry, offered to present a book of forty shillings value to either of the two philosophers who should, in the space of two months, bring him a convincing demonstration of it. Hook persisted in the declaration that he possessed the method, but avowed it to be his intention to conceal it for time. He promised, however, to show it to Sir Christopher, but there is every reason to believe that his promise was never fulfilled. 
In August 1684, Dr. Halley went to Cambridge for the express purpose of consulting Newton on this interesting subject. Newton assured him that he had brought this demonstration to perfection, and promised him a copy of it. This copy was received in November by the doctor, who made a second visit to Cambridge in order to induce its author to have it inserted in the register book of the society. On December 10th, Dr. Halley announced to the society that he had seen at Cambridge Newton's treatise De Motu Corporum, which he had promised to send to the society to be entered upon their register, and Dr. Halley was desired to unite with Mr. Paget, master of the mathematical school in Christ's Hospital, in reminding Newton of his promise, for securing the invention to himself till such time as he can be at leisure to publish it. On February 25th, Mr. Aston, the secretary, communicated a letter from Newton in which he expressed his willingness to enter in the register his notions about motion and his intentions to fit them suddenly for the press. The progress of his work was, however, interrupted by a visit of five or six weeks which he made in Lincolnshire, but he proceeded with such diligence on his return that he was able to transmit the manuscript to London before the end of April. This manuscript, entitled Philosophic Naturalis Principia Mathematics, and dedicated to the Society, was presented by Dr. Vincent on April 28, 1686, when Sir John Hoskins, the Vice-President and the particular friend of Dr. Hook, was in the chair. Dr. Vincent passed a just encomium on the novelty and dignity of the subject, and another member added that Mr. Newton had carried the thing so far that there was no more to be added. To these remarks, the Vice-President replied that the method was so much the more to be prized as it was both invented and perfected at the same time. Dr. Hook took offence at these remarks and blamed Sir John for not having mentioned what he had discovered to him, but the Vice-President did not seem to recollect any such communication, and the consequence of this discussion was that these two, who till then were the most inseparable cronies, have since scarcely seen one another and are utterly fallen out. After the breaking up of the meeting, the society adjourned to the coffee-house, where Dr. Hook stated that he not only had made the same discovery, but had given the first hint of it to Newton. An account of these proceedings was communicated to Newton through two different channels. In a letter dated May 22nd, Dr. Halley wrote to him, quote, that Mr. Hook has some pretensions upon the invention of the rule of the decrease of gravity being reciprocally as the squares of the distances from the centre. He says you had the notion from him, though he owns the demonstration of the curves generated thereby to be wholly your own. How much of this is, so you know best, as likewise what you have to do in this matter? Only Mr. Hook seems to expect you would make some mention of him in the preface, which it is possible you may see the reason to prefix. End quote. This communication from Dr. Halley induced the author, on June 20th, to address a long letter to him, in which he gives a minute and able refutation of Hook's claims. But before this letter was dispatched, another correspondent, who had received his information from one of the members that were present, informed Newton that Hook made a great stir, pretending that he had all from him, and desiring they would see that he had justice done him. This fresh charge seems to have ruffled the tranquillity of Newton, and he accordingly added an angry and satirical postscript in which he treats Hook with little ceremony, and goes so far as to conjecture that Hook might have acquired his knowledge of the law from a letter of his own to Huygens, directed to Oldenburg, and dated January 14, 1672 to 1673. Quote, my letter to Hugenius was directed to Mr. Oldenburg, who used to keep the originals. His papers came into Mr. Hook's possession. Mr. Hook, knowing my hand, might have the curiosity to look into that letter, and there I take the notion of comparing the forces of the planets arising from their circular motion, and so what he wrote to me afterwards about the rate of gravity might be nothing but the fruit of my own garden. 
End quote. In replying to this letter, Dr. Halley assured him that Hooke's manner of claiming the discovery had been represented to him in worse colours than it ought, and that he neither made public application to the Society for Justice, nor pretended that you had all from him. The effect of this assurance was to make Newton regret that he had written the angry postscript to his letter, and in replying to Halley on July 14, 1686, he not only expresses his regret, but recounts the different new ideas which he had acquired from Hooke's correspondence, and suggests it as the best method of compromising the present dispute to add a scolium, in which Wren, Hooke, and Halley are acknowledged to have independently deduced the law of gravity from the second law of Kepler. At the meeting of April 28th, at which the manuscript of the Principia was presented to the Royal Society, it was agreed that the printing of it should be referred to the Council, that a letter of thanks should be written to its author, and at a meeting of the Council on May 19th, it was resolved that the manuscript should be printed at the Society's expense, and that Dr. Halley should superintend it while going through the press. These resolutions were communicated by Dr. Halley in a letter dated May 22nd, and in Newton's reply on June 20th, already mentioned, he makes the following observations. Quote, the proof you sent me I like very well. I designed the whole to consist of three books. The second was finished last summer, being short, and only once transcribing and drawing the cuts fairly. Some new propositions I have since thought on, which I can as well let alone. The third wants the theory of comets. In autumn last I spent two months in calculation to no purpose, for want of a good method, which made me afterward return to the first book and enlarge it with diverse propositions, some relating to comets, others to other things found out last winter. The third I now design to suppress. Philosophy is such an impertinently litigious lady that a man had as good be engaged in lawsuits as have to do with her. I found it so formerly, and now I can no sooner come near her again, but she gives me warning. The first two books, without the third, will not so well bear the title of Philosophies Naturalis Principia Mathematica, and therefore I had altered it to this, De Moti Corporum Libri Duo. But after second thoughts I retain the former title. It will help the sale of the book, which I ought not to diminish, now it is yours. End quote. In replying to this letter on July 29th, Dr. Halley regrets that our author's tranquillity should have been thus disturbed by envious rivals, and implores him in the name of the society not to suppress the third book. I must again beg you, says he, not to let your resentments run so high as to deprive us of your third book, wherein your applications of your mathematical doctrine to the theory of comets, and several curious experiments, which, as I guess by what you write, ought to compose it, will undoubtedly render it acceptable to those who will call themselves philosophers without mathematics, which are much the greater number. To these solicitations Newton seems to have readily yielded. His second book was sent to the Society, and presented on March 2, 1687. The third book was also transmitted, and presented on April 6, and the whole work was completed and published in the month of May 1687. Such is the brief account of the publication of a work which is memorable not only in the annals of one science or of one country, but which will form an epoch in the history of the world, and will ever be regarded as the brightest page in the records of human reason. We shall endeavour to convey to the reader some idea of its contents, and of the brilliant discoveries which it disseminated over Europe. The Principia consists of three books. The first and second, which occupy three-fourths of the work, are entitled On the Motion of Bodies, and the third bears the title On the System of the World. The first two books contain the mathematical principles of philosophy, namely, the laws and conditions of motions and forces, and they are illustrated with several philosophical scholia which treat of some of the most general and best-established points in philosophy, 
such as the density and resistance of bodies, spaces void of matter, and the motion of sound and light. The object of the third book is to deduce from these principles the constitution of the system of the world, and this book has been drawn up in as popular a style as possible, in order that it may be generally read. The great discovery which characterizes the Principia is that of the principle of universal gravitation as deduced from the motion of the moon, and from the three great facts or laws discovered by Kepler. This principle is that every particle of matter is attracted by or gravitates to every other particle of matter with a force inversely proportional to the squares of their distances. From the first law of Kepler, namely the proportionality of the areas to the times of their revolution, Newton inferred that the force which kept the planet in its orbit was always directed to the sun, and from the second law of Kepler, that every planet moves in an ellipse with the sun in one of its foci, he drew the still more general inference that the force by which the planet moves round that focus varies inversely as the square of its distance from the focus. As this law was true in the motion of satellites round their primary planets, Newton deduced the equality of gravity in all the heavenly bodies toward the sun, upon the supposition that they are equally distant from its centre, and in the case of terrestrial bodies he succeeded in verifying this truth by numerous and accurate experiments. By taking a more general view of the subject, Newton demonstrated that a conic section was the only curve in which a body could move when acted upon by a force varying inversely as the square of the distance, and he established the conditions depending on the velocity and the primitive position of the body, which were requisite to make it describe a circular, an elliptical, a parabolic, or a hyperbolic orbit. Notwithstanding the generality and importance of these results, it still remained to be determined whether the forces resided in the centers of the planets or belonged to each individual particle of which they were composed. Newton removed this uncertainty by demonstrating that if a spherical body acts upon a distant body with a force varying as the distance of this body from the center of the sphere, the same effect will be produced as if each of its particles acted upon the distant body according to the same law. And hence it follows that the spheres, whether they are of uniform density or consist of concentric layers, with densities varying according to any law whatever, will act upon each other in the same manner as if their force resided in their centers alone. But as the bodies of the solar system are very nearly spherical, they will all act upon one another, and upon bodies placed on their surfaces, as if they were so many centers of attraction, and therefore we obtain the law of gravity which subsists between spherical bodies, namely that one sphere will act upon another with a force directly proportional to the quantity of matter, and inversely as the square of the distance between the centers of the spheres. From the equality of action and reaction, to which no exception can be found, Newton concluded that the sun gravitated to the planets, and the planets to their satellite, and that the earth itself to the stone which falls upon its surface, and, consequently, that the two mutually gravitating bodies approached to one another with velocities inversely proportional to their quantities of matter. Having established this universal law, Newton was enabled not only to determine the weight which the same body would have at the surface of the sun and the planets, but even to calculate the quantity of matter in the sun and in all the planets that had satellites, and even to determine the density or specific gravity of the matter of which they were composed. In this way he found that the weight of the same body would be twenty-three times greater at the surface of the sun than at the surface of the earth, and that the density of the earth was four times greater than that of the sun, the planets increasing in density as they receded from the center of the system. If the peculiar genius of Newton has been displayed in his investigation of the law of universal gravitation, 
it shines with no less lustre in the patience and sagacity with which he traced the consequences of this fertile principle the discovery of the spheroidal form of jupiter by cassini had probably directed the attention of newton to the determination of its cause and consequently to the investigation of the true figure of the earth the next subject to which newton applied the principle of gravity was the tides of the ocean the philosophers of all ages had recognized the connection between the phenomena of the tides and the position of the moon the college of jesuits at coimbra and subsequently antonio de dominis and kepler distinctly referred the tides to the attraction of the waters of the earth by the moon but so imperfect was the explanation which was thus given of the phenomena that galileo ridiculed the idea of lunar attraction and substituted for it a fallacious explanation of his own that the moon is the principal cause of the tides is obvious from the well-known fact that it is high water at any given place about the time when she is in the meridian of that place and that the sun performs a secondary part in their production may be proved from the circumstance that the highest tides take place when the sun the moon and the earth are in the same straight line that is when the force of the sun conspires with that of the moon and that the lowest tides take place when the lines drawn from the sun and moon to the earth are at right angles to each other that is when the force of the sun acts in opposition to that of the moon by comparing the spring and neap tides newton found that the force with which the moon acted upon the waters of the earth was to that with which the sun acted upon them as four point four eight to one that the force of the moon produced a tide of eight point six three feet that of the sun one of one point nine three feet and both of them combined one of ten and a half french feet a result which in the open sea does not deviate much from observation having thus ascertained the force of the moon on the waters of our globe he found that the quantity of matter in the moon was to that in the earth as one to forty and the density of the moon to that of the earth as eleven to nine the motions of the moon so much within the reach of our own observation presented a fine field for the application of the theory of universal gravitation the irregularities exhibited in the lunar motions had been known in the time of hipparchus and ptolemy tycho had discovered the great inequality called the variation amounting to thirty-seven minutes and depending on the alternate acceleration and retardation of the moon in every quarter of a revolution he had also ascertained the existence of the annual equation of these two inequalities newton gave a most satisfactory explanation although there could be little doubt that the comets were retained in their orbits by the same laws which regulated the motions of the planets yet it was difficult to put this opinion to the test of observation the visibility of comets only in a small part of their orbits rendered it difficult to ascertain their distance and periodic times and as their periods were probably of great length it was impossible to correct approximate results by repeated observations newton however removed this difficulty by showing how to determine the orbit of a comet namely the form and position of the orbit and the periodic time by three observations by applying this method to the comet of 1680 he calculated the elements of its orbit and from the agreement of the computed places with those which were observed he justly inferred that the motions of comets were regulated by the same laws as those of the planetary bodies this result was one of great importance for as the comets enter our system in every possible direction and at all angles with the ecliptic and as a great part of their orbits extends far beyond the limits of the solar system it demonstrated the existence of gravity in spaces far removed beyond the planet and proved that the law of the inverse ratio of the squares of the distance was true in every possible direction and at very remote distances from the center of our system such is a brief view of the leading discoveries which the principia first announced to the world the grandeur of the subjects of which it treats 
the beautiful simplicity of the system which it unfolds the clear and concise reasoning by which that system is explained and the irresistible evidence by which it is supported might have ensured it the warmest admiration of contemporary mathematicians and the most welcome reception in all the schools of philosophy throughout europe this however is not the way in which great truths are generally received though the astronomical discoveries of newton were not assailed by the class of ignorant pretenders who attacked his optical writings yet they were everywhere resisted by the errors and prejudices which had taken a deep hold even of the strongest minds the philosophy of descartes was predominant throughout europe appealing to the imagination and not to the reason of mankind it was quickly received into popular favour and the same causes which facilitated its introduction extended its influence and completed its dominion over the human mind in explaining all the movements of the heavenly bodies by a system of vortices in a fluid medium diffused through the universe descartes had seized upon an analogy of the most alluring and deceitful kind those who had seen heavy bodies revolving in the eddies of a whirlpool or in the gyrations of a vessel of water thrown into a circular motion had no difficulty in conceiving how the planets might revolve round the sun by an analogous movement the mind instantly grasped at an explanation of so palpable a character and which required for its development neither the exercise of patient thought nor the aid of mathematical skill the talent and perspicuity with which the cartesian system was expounded and the show by which it was sustained contributed powerfully to its adoption while it derived a still higher sanction from the excellent character and the unaffected piety of its author thus entrenched as the cartesian system was in the strongholds of the human mind and fortified by its most obstinate prejudices it was not to be wondered at that the pure and sublime doctrines of the principia were distrustfully received and perseveringly resisted the uninstructed mind could not readily admit the idea that the great masses of the planets were suspended in empty space and retained in their orbits by an invisible influence residing in the sun and even those philosophers who had been accustomed to the rigour of true scientific research and who possessed sufficient mathematical skill for the examination of the newtonian doctrines viewed them at first as reviving the occult qualities of the ancient physics and resisted their introduction with a pertinacy which it is not easy to explain prejudiced no doubt in favour of his own metaphysical views leibniz himself misapprehended the principles of the newtonian philosophy and endeavoured to demonstrate the truths in the principia by the application of different principles huygens who above all other men was qualified to appreciate the new philosophy rejected the doctrine of gravitation as existing between the individual particles of matter and received it only as an attribute of the planetary masses john bernoulli one of the first mathematicians of his age opposed the philosophy of newton myran in the early part of his life was a strenuous defender of the system of vortices cassini and maraldi were quite ignorant of the principia and occupied themselves with the most absurd methods of calculating the orbits of comets long after the newtonian method had been established on the most impregnable foundation and even fontenelle a man of liberal views and extensive information continued throughout the whole of his life to maintain the doctrines of descartes the chevalier louville of paris had adopted the newtonian philosophy before seventeen twenty gravesande had introduced it into the dutch university at a somewhat earlier period and maupertius in consequence of a visit which he paid to england in seventeen twenty eight became a zealous defender of it but notwithstanding these and some other examples that might be quoted we must admit the truth of the remark of voltaire that though newton survived the publication of the principia more than forty years yet at the time of his death he had not above twenty followers out of england End of section 6
Section 7 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Caveat. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. Edited by Charles F. Horne, Rossiter Johnson and John Rudd. Morgan, the Buccaneer, Sacks, Panama. A.D. 1671. Johann W. von Archenholz. Part 1. In the 17th century appeared a class of rovers wholly distinct from any of their predecessors. In the annals of the world, differing as widely as in their plans, organizations and exploits as in the principles that governed their actions. These adventurers were a piratical gang called buccaneers, or sometimes, as in the following narrative, freebooters who became noted for their exploits in the West Indies and on the South American coasts. The nucleus of this association of pirates is traced to bands of smugglers, English, French and Dutch, who carried on a secret trade with the island of Santo Domingo. Later, they settled there and on other islands, and after a while began to prey upon Spanish commerce. In 1630, they made their chief headquarters on the island of Tortuga. In 1655, they aided in the English conquest of Jamaica, and ten years later settled in the Bahamas. All these islands became centres of their activities. Most renowned among the leaders of the buccaneers was Sir Henry Morgan, a Welshman, who died in Jamaica in 1688. For years he carried stolen riches to England, and Charles II rewarded him with a knighthood. Having pillaged parts of Cuba, he took and ransomed Portobello in Colombia, 1668 and Maracaibo in Venezuela in 1669. In 1670, Morgan gathered a fleet of nearly 40 vessels and a force of over 2,000 men for the greatest of the exploits of the buccaneers, the capture and plunder of the wealthy city of Panama. By the end of the century, the buccaneers had become dispersed among contending European armies, and little more was heard of them. Morgan's plan of capturing Panama was apparently attended with innumerable difficulties. The chief obstacle was the position of that city on the Pacific coast at such a great distance from the Caribbean Sea, and not an individual on board the fleet was acquainted with the road that led to the goal. To remedy this inconvenience, Morgan determined, in the first instance, to go to the island of St. Catherine, where the Spanish confined their criminals, and thence supply himself with guides. The passage was rapid. Morgan landed in that island 1,000 men who, by threatening to put to death everyone that hesitated for a moment to surrender, so terrified the Spaniards that they speedily capitulated. It was stipulated that, to save at least the honour of the garrison, there should be a sham fight. In consequence of this, a very sharp fire ensued from the forts on one side and on the other from the ships, but on both sides the cannons discharged only powder. Further, to give a serious appearance to this military comedy, the governor suffered himself to be taken while attempting to pass from Fort Jerome to another fort. At the beginning, the crafty Morgan did not rely too implicitly on this feint, and to provide for every event, he secretly ordered his soldiers to load their fusees with bullets, and to discharge them in the air, unless they perceived some treachery on the part of the Spaniards. But his enemies adhered most faithfully to their capitulation, and this mock engagement, in which neither party was sparing of powder, was followed for some time with all the circumstances which give it the semblance of reality. Ten forts surrendered. One after another, after sustaining a kind of siege or assault, and this series of successes did not cost the life of a single man, not even a scratch, on the part either of the victors or of the conquered. All the inhabitants of the island were shut up in the great fort of Santa Teresa, which was built on a steep rock, and the conquerors, who had not taken any sustenance for twenty-four hours, declared a most serious war against the horned cattle and game of the district. In the island of St. Constantine, Morgan found 449 persons of both sexes, 190 of whom were soldiers, 42 criminals, 85 children and 66 negroes. There were 10 forts containing 68 cannon which were so defended in other respects by nature that very small garrisons were deemed amply sufficient to protect them. Besides an immense quantity of fusees and grenades, which were at that time much used, upward of 300 quintals of gunpowder were found in the arsenal. The whole of this ammunition was carried on board the pirate ships. The cannon, which could be of no service to them, was spiked. The carriages were burned, and all the forts demolished excepting one which the freeboaters themselves garrisoned. 
Morgan selected three of the criminals to serve him as guides to Panama. These he afterwards, on his return to Jamaica, set at liberty, even giving them a share of the booty. The plan conceived by this intrepid chieftain inspired all his companions in arms with genuine enthusiasm. It had the character of grandeur and audacity that inflamed their courage. How capable they were of executing it, the subsequent pages will demonstrate. Panama, which stood on the shore of the Pacific Ocean in the ninth degree of northern latitude, was at that time one of the greatest as well as the most opulent cities in America. It contained 2,000 large houses, the greater number of which were very fine piles of building, and 5,000 smaller dwellings, each mostly three stories in height. Of these, a pretty considerable number were erected of stone, all the rest of cedar wood, very elegantly constructed and magnificently furnished. That city was defended by a rampart and was surrounded with walls. It was the emporium for the silver of Mexico and the gold of Peru, whence those valuable metals were brought on the backs of mules, 2,000 of which animals were kept for this purpose only, across the isthmus toward the northern coast of the Pacific. A great commerce was also carried on at Panama in Negroes, which trade at that time was almost exclusively confined to the English, Dutch, French and Danes. With this branch of commerce, the Italians were intimately acquainted. They gave lessons in it to all of the rest of Europe, and, as two things were necessary in which the Genoese were by no means sufficient, money and address, they were chiefly occupied in the slave trade, and supplied the provinces of Peru and Chile with Negroes. At the period now referred to, the President of Panama was the principal intendant or overseer of the civil department, and Captain General of all the troops in the Viceroyalty of Peru. He had in his dependency Puerto Bello and Nata, two cities inhabited by the Spaniards, together with the towns of Cruces, Panama, Caprica and Veruga. The city of Panama had also a bishop, who was a suffragan of the Archbishop of Lima. The merchants lived in great opulence, and their churches were decorated with uncommon magnificence. The cathedral was erected in the Italian style, surmounted with a large cupola, and enriched with gold and silver ornaments, as also were the eight convents which the city comprised. At a small distance from its walls, there were some small islands, alike embellished by art and by nature, where the richest inhabitants had their country houses, from which circumstance they were called the Gardens of Panama. In short, everything concurred to render this place important and agreeable. Here, several of the European nations had palaces for carrying on their commerce, and among these were the Genoese, who were held in great credit, and who had vast warehouses for receiving the articles of their immense trade, as also a most magnificent edifice. The principal houses were filled with beautiful paintings, and the masterpieces of the arts, which had been accumulated more than from an intense desire of being surrounded with all the splendour of luxury, since they possessed the means of procuring it, than from a refined taste. Their superabundance of gold and silver had been employed in obtaining these splendid superfluities, which were of no value but to gratify the vanity of the possessors. Such was Panama in 1670, when the freebooters selected it as the object of their bold attempt, and as the victim of their extravagancies, and immortalised their name by reducing it to a heap of ruins. In the execution of this design, which stupefied the New World, they displayed equal prudence and cruelty. Previous to the adoption of any other measure, it was necessary that the pirates should get possession of Fort St. Laurent, which was situated on the banks of the river Chagres. With this view, Morgan detached four ships with 400 men under the command of the intrepid Broderley, who had happily succeeded in victualling the fleet, and who was intimately acquainted with the country. Morgan continued at the island of St. Catherine with the rest of his forces. His plan was to dissemble his vast projects against Panama as long as it was possible, and to cause the pillage of Fort saint laurent to be regarded as a common expedition to which he would confine himself. Broderley discharged his commission with equal courage and success. That castle was situated on a lofty mountain at the mouth of the river, and was inaccessible on almost every side. The first attempts were fruitless, and the freebooters who advanced openly that any other arms than their fusees and sabres, at first lost many of their comrades, for the Spaniards not only made use of all their artillery and musketry against them, but they also seconded by the Indians that were there with them in the fort and whose arrows were far more fatal than the bullets. The assailants saw their companions in arms fall by their side without being able to avenge them. The danger of their present situation and the nature of their arms seemed to render the enterprise altogether impracticable. The courage began to waver, 
the ranks were thrown into disorder, and they already thought of retiring when the provocations of the Spaniards inspired them with new vigour. "'You heretic dogs!' cried they in a triumphant tone. "'You cursed English, possessed by the devil! Ah, you will go to Panama, will you? No, no, that you shall not! You shall all bite the dust here, and all your comrades shall share the same fate!' From these insulting speeches, the pirates learned that the design of their expedition was discovered, and from that moment they determined to carry the fort or die to a man upon the spot. They immediately commenced the assault in defiance of the shower of arrows that were discharged against them, and undismayed by the loss of their commander, both of whose legs had been carried away by a cannonball, one of the pirates, whose shoulder and arrow was deeply fixed, tore it out himself, exclaiming, Patience, comrades! An idea strikes me! All the Spaniards are lost! He tore some cotton out of his pocket, with which he covered his ramrod, set the cotton on fire, and shot this burning material in lieu of bullets at the houses of the fort, which were covered with light wood and the leaves of palm trees. His companions collected together the arrows which had been strewn around them upon the ground, and employed them in a similar manner. The effect of this novel mode of attack was most rapid. Many of the houses caught fire, a powder wagon blew up, the besieged being thus diverted from their means of defence, thought only of stopping the progress of the fire. Night came on, and under cover of the darkness, the freebooters attempted also to set on fire the palisades, which were made of a kind of a wood that was easily kindled. In this attempt, likewise, they were crowned with success. The soil which the palisades supported fell down for want of support, and filled up the ditch. The Spaniards nevertheless continued to defend themselves with much courage, being animated by the example of their commander, who fought till the very moment he received a mortal blow. The garrison had, throughout, the use of their cannon, which kept up a most violent fire, but the enemy had already made too much in progress to be disconcerted with it. They persevered in their attack, until they at length became masters of the fort. A great number of Spaniards, finding themselves deprived of all resource, precipitated themselves from the tops of the walls into the river, that they might not fall alive into the hands of the freebooters, who made only twenty-four prisoners, and ten of these were wounded men who had concealed themselves among the dead in the hope of escaping their ferocious conquerors. These twenty-four men were all that remained of the three hundred and forty who had composed the garrison, which had shortly before been reinforced, for the president of Panama had been apprised from Cartagena of the real object of the pirates' expedition. He came to encamp with thirty-six hundred men in the vicinity of the threatened city. This information was confirmed to the freebooters after the capture of the fort, at the same time, they learned that among his body of troops there were 400 horsemen, 600 Indians, and 200 mulattoes, the last of whom, being very expert in hunting bulls, were intended, in case of necessity, to send 2,000 of those animals among the freebooters. It is scarcely credible that Broderley continued to command, notwithstanding the severity of his wounds, but he would not, by retiring, compromise the advantages which he had so dearly purchased, for out of 400 men who had composed his little army, 160 had been killed, 80 wounded, and of these 80, 60 were altogether out of the battle. The bodies of the French and English were interred, but those of the Spanish were thrown down from the top of the fort and remained in a heap at the foot of its walls. Broadley found much ammunition and the abundance of provisions with which he was more satisfied, as he knew that the Grand Fleet was greatly in want of both of these articles. He caused the fort to be rebuilt as far as was practical in order that he might defend himself there in case the Spaniards should make a speedy attempt to retake it. In this situation he waited for Morgan, who in a short time appeared with his fleet. As the pirates approached, they beheld the English flag flying on the fort, and abandoned themselves to the most tumultuous joy and excessive drinking, without dreaming of the dangers occurring at the mouth of the river Chagres, beneath whose waters there was a sunken rock. The coasting pilots of those latitudes came to their assistance, but their intoxication and their impatience would not permit them to attend to the latter. This negligence was attended with most fatal consequences, and cost them four ships, one of which was the Admiral's vessel. The crews, however, together with their ladings, were saved. This loss greatly affected Morgan, who was wholly intent upon his vast designs, but who nevertheless made his entrance into Saint Laurent, where he left a garrison of 500 men. He also detached from his body of troops 150 men, for the purpose of seizing several Spanish vessels that were in the river. The remainder of his forces Morgan directed to follow him south. They carried but a small supply of provisions, not only that his march might not be impeded, but also because the means of conveyance were very limited. 
Besides, he was apprehensive lest he should expose to famine the garrison he had left at the fort, which did not abound with provisions, and was cut off on every side from receiving supplies. It was likewise necessary that he should leave sufficient for the support of all the, the prisoners and slaves, whose number amounted very nearly to a thousand. After all of these steps had been taken, Morgan briefly addressed his comrades, whom he exhorted to arm themselves with courage, calculated to subdue every obstacle, that they might return to Jamaica with an increase of glory and riches sufficient to supply all their wants for the rest of their lives. At length, on January the 18th, he commenced his march toward Panama, with a chosen body of freebooters, who were 1,300 strong. The greatest part of their journey was performed by water, following the course of the river. Five vessels were laden with artillery, and the troops were placed in a very narrow compass on board 32 boats. One reason why they had brought only a small quantity of provisions was because they hoped to meet with a supply on their route, but on the very day of their arrival at Rio de los Bravos, the expectations of the pirates were frustrated. At the place where they landed, they literally found nothing. The terror which they everywhere inspired had preceded them. The Spaniards had betaken themselves to flight, and had carried with them all their cattle, even to the very last article of their movables. They had cut the grain and pulse without waiting for their maturity, the roots of which were even torn out of the ground. The houses and stables were empty. The first day of their voyage was spent in abstinence. Tobacco affording them the only gratification that was not refused them. The second day was not more prosperous. In addition to the various impediments by which their passage was obstructed, want of rain had rendered the waters of the river very shallow, and a great number of trees had fallen into it, presenting almost insurmountable obstacles. On their arrival at Cruz de Juan Galago, they had no other alternative left but to abandon their boats and pursue their route by land, otherwise they must have resigned themselves to the confusion necessarily consequent on retracing their steps. Animated, however, by their chieftains, they determined to try the adventure. On the third day, their way led them to a forest, where there was no beaten path, and the soil of which was marshy. But it was indispensably necessary that they should leave this wretched passage, in order that they might reach, with incredible difficulties indeed, the town of Siedro Biono. For all these excessive fatigues, they found no indemnification. Whatever, there were no provisions, not even a single head of game. These luckless adventurers at length saw themselves surrounded by all the horrors of famine. Many of them were reduced to devour the leaves of trees. The majority were altogether destitute of sustenance. In this state of severe privations, and with very light clothing, they passed the nights laying on the shore, benumbed with cold, incapable of enjoying, even in the smallest degree, the solace of sleep, and expecting with anxiety the return of the day. Their courage was supported only with the hope of meeting some bodies of Spaniards or some groups of fugitive inhabitants, and consequently of finding provisions, with an abundance of which the latter never failed to supply themselves when they abandoned their dwellings. Further, the pirates were obliged to continue their route at a small distance only from the river, as they had contrived to drag their canoes along with them. But whenever the water was of sufficient depth, part of the men embarked on board them, while the remainder prosecuted their journey by land. They were preceded a few hundred paces by an advance guard of thirty men, under the direction of a guide who was intimately acquainted with the country, and the strictest silence was observed, in order they might discover the ambuscades of the Spaniards, and, if it were possible, make some of them prisoners. On the fourth day, the freebooters reached Torna Cavalos, a kind of fortified place which had also been evacuated, the Spaniards having carried away with them everything that was portable, and consumed the rest by fire. Their design was to leave the pirates neither movables nor utensils. In fact, this was the only resource left them by which they could reduce those formidable guests to such a state of privation as to compel them to retire. The only things which had not been burned or carried off were some very large sacks of hides, which were to these freebooters objects of avidity, and which had almost occasioned a bloody dispute. Previously to devouring them, it was necessary to cut them into pieces with all possible equity. Thus divided, the leather was cut into small bits. These were scraped and violently beaten between two stones. It was then soaked in water in order to become soft, after which it was roasted. Nor thus prepared could it have been swallowed if they had not taken most copious draughts of water. After this repast, the freebooters resumed their route and arrived at Torno Money, where also they found an abandoned fortress. On the fifth day, they reached Barbacos. 
but still no place presented to their view either man, animal, or any kind of provisions, whatever. Here, likewise, the Spaniards had taken the precaution of carrying away or destroying anything that could serve for food. Fortunately, however, they discovered in the hollow of a rock two sacks of flour, some fruit, and two large vessels filled with wine. This discovery would have transported with joy a less numerous troop, but to so many famished men it presented only very feeble resource. Morgan, who did not suffer less from hunger than the rest, generously appropriated none of it to his own use, but caused this scanty supply to be distributed among those who were just ready to faint. Many, indeed, were almost dying. These were conveyed on board the boats, the charge of which was committed to them, while those who had hitherto had the care of the vessels were united to the body that was travelling by land. Their march was very slow. Both on account of the extreme weakness of these men, even after the very moderate refreshment they had just taken, as well as from the roughness and difficulties of the way, and during the fifth day the pirates had no other sustenance but the leaves of the trees and the grass of the meadows. End of section 7section 8 of the great events by famous historians volume 12 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org read by caveat the great events by famous historians volume 12 edited by charles f horn roster johnson and john rudd morgan the buccaneer sacks panama ad 671 Johann von Archenholz. Part 2 On the following day, the freebooters made still less progress. Want of food had totally exhausted them, and they were frequently obliged to rest. At length they reached a plantation, where they found a vast quantity of maize in a granary that had just been abandoned. What a discovery was this to men whose appetites were sharpened by such long protractions. A great many of them devoured the grains in a raw state. The rest covered their shares with the leaves of the banana tree, and thus cooked or roasted the maize. Reinvigorated by this food, they pursued their route, and on the same day they discovered a troop of Indians on the other side of the river, but those savages betook themselves to flight, so that it was impossible to reach them. The cruel freebooters fired on them and killed some of them. The rest escaped, exclaiming, "'Come, you English dogs! Come into the meadow!' We will there wait for you. To this challenge, the pirates were little tempted to answer. Their supply of maize was exhausted, and they were further obliged to lie down in the open air without eating anything. Hitherto, in the midst of the privations, the most severely painful, as well as the most difficult labours, they had evinced an inexhaustible patience. But at length, violent murmurs arose. Morgan and his rash enterprise became the object of their execrations, a great number of the freebooters were desirous of returning, but the rest, although discontented, declared that they would rather perish than not terminate an expedition so far advanced and which had cost them so much trouble. On the following day they crossed the river and directed their march towards a place which they took for a town, or, at all events, for a village, where, to their great satisfaction, they thought they perceived at distance the smoke issuing from several chimneys. There at last, said they, we shall surely find both men and provisions. Their expectations were completely frustrated. Not a single individual appeared throughout the place. They found no other articles of sustenance but a leather sack full of bread, together with a few cats and dogs, which were instantly killed and devoured. The place where they had now arrived was the town of Crucis, at which were usually landed those commodities which were further carried up the river Chagres in order to be carried by land to Panama which was eight French leagues distant. Here were some fine warehouses built of stone, and likewise some stables belonging to the King of Spain, which at the moment of the pirates' arrival were the only buildings that remained untouched, all the inhabitants having betaken themselves to flight after they had set their houses on fire. Every corner of these royal buildings was ransacked by the freebooters, who at length discovered seventeen large vessels full of Peruvian wine, which were immediately emptied. Scarcely, however, had they drunk this liquor, which was to recruit their exhausted strength, than they all fell ill. At first they thought the wine was poisoned, they were overwhelmed with consternation, and were fully persuaded that their last hour had come. The terrors were unfounded, as their sudden indisposition was easily accounted for by the nature of the unwholesome food 
that they had so recently taken, by the extreme diminution of their strength and the avidity with which they had swallowed the wine. In fact, they found themselves much better on the following day. As Morgan had been reduced to the necessity of removing at this place to a distance from all his ships, he was obliged to land all his men, not even excepting those who were most exhausted by weakness. The Salops alone, with sixty men, were sent to the spot where his vessels and largest ships had been left. A single shallop only was reserved to carry news, if occasion offered, to the flotilla. Morgan prohibited every man from going alone to any distance, and even required that they should not make excursions in troops amounting to less than a hundred men. Famine, however, compelled the freebooters to infringe this prohibition. Six of them went out to some distance in quest of food. The event justified the foresight of their chieftain. They were attacked by a large body of Spaniards and could not, without great difficulty, regain the village. They had also the mortification to see one of their comrades taken prisoner. Morgan now determined to prosecute his march. After viewing his companions in arms, he found they amounted to 1,100 men. As he foresaw that they were apprehensive lest their lost comrades should betray the secret of their enterprise and the state of their forces, Morgan made them believe that he had not been taken, that he had only lost his way in the woods, but had now returned to the main body. The freebooters were now on the eighth day of their painful journey, and nothing but the hope of speedily terminating their labours could support them much longer, for they had now ascertained that they were on the way to Panama. An advance guard of 200 men was therefore formed, which was to watch the movements of the enemy. They marched onward for a whole day without perceiving any living object whatever, when suddenly a shower of three or four thousand arrows was discharged upon them from the top of a rock. For some minutes they were struck with astonishment. No enemy presented himself to their view. They beheld around them at their feet, above their heads, nothing but steep rocks, trees and abysses, and, without striking a single blow, they reckoned twenty of their comrades killed or wounded. The unexpected attack not being continued, they pursued their march across a forest, where, in a hollow way, they fell upon a large body of Indians, who opposed their progress with much valour. In this engagement the free boaters were victorious, though they lost eight killed and ten wounded. They made every possible effort to catch some of the fugitives, but these fled away with the velocity of stags across the rocks, with all the turnings and windings of which they were intimately acquainted. Not a single man fell into their hands. The Indian chieftain was wounded, and notwithstanding, he lay on the ground. He continued to fight most obstinately until he received a mortal blow. He wore a crown of party-coloured feathers. His death made a great impression on the Indians, and was the principal cause of their defeat. The ground on which they had attacked the pirates was so favourable that one hundred men would have been fully sufficient to have destroyed the whole troop of freebooters. The latter availed themselves of the inconceivable negligence of the Spaniards in not taking more effectual measures for the defence of such an important pass. They exerted all possible diligence to make their way out of this labyrinth of rocks, for a second attack of a similar kind would have been attended with consequences of the most fatal tendency to them and to get into an open and level country. On the ninth day they found themselves in a plain or spacious meadow, entirely divested of trees, so that nothing could shelter them against the ardour of the solar rays. It rained, however, most copiously at the moment of their arrival, and this circumstance added yet more to their difficulties. In a short time they were wetted to their skins. In case of a sudden attack, their arms and ammunition would have afforded them but little assistance, while the Spaniards would be able most effectively to use their spears, which could not be damaged by the rain. No human means could remedy this inconvenience. The pirates had only to abandon themselves to their fate. Morgan most ardently desired that some prisoner might fall into his hands, from whose confessions, either voluntary or involuntary, he might obtain some information by which to direct his march. With this intention, fifty men were detached in different directions, with a promised reward of three hundred piastres out of the society's stock to the man who should bring in either a Spaniard or an Indian exclusive of the share of booty to which he should be entitled. About noon they ascended a steep hill from whose summit they began to discover the Pacific. At this sight, which announced the speedy termination of their miseries, they were transported with joy. From the top of this eminence they also perceived six ships departing from Panama, sailing towards the islands of Taraga and Taragiela, which were situated in the vicinity of that city. 
Panama itself for the present escaped their observation, but how was their satisfaction increased on beholding in a valley a vast number of bulls, cows, horses, and particularly of asses, which were under the care of some Spaniards, who betook themselves to flight the moment they saw the formidable pirates approaching. To the latter, no reconnoitre could be more desirable. They were ready to faint with famine and fatigue. The sustenance which they immediately devoured would contribute to give them that strength, which every moment would become so necessary to them, and it is altogether inconceivable how the Spaniards could abandon such a prey to their famished enemies. This want of foresight can only be accounted for by the panic with which the Spaniards were seized. The spot which had just been deserted was occupied for some hours by the freebooters. They stood in great need of rest, and were in much greater want of provisions. They rushed therefore on the animals that had been left behind, of which they killed a great number, and devoured their half-raw flesh with such avidity that the blood streamed in torrents from their lips over the whole of their bodies. What could not be consumed on the spot, they carried away with them, for Morgan, apprehensive of an attack by the flower of the Spaniards' troops, allowed them only a small space of time for their repose. They resumed their march, but the uncertainty in which they had been so long involved was not yet at an end. Notwithstanding all that that chief's experience, his spies could not succeed in taking a single prisoner, a circumstance which seems almost incredible in a populous country, and after nine days' march, Morgan was deprived of every hint that was so essentially necessary to him. Further, the freebooters were utterly ignorant how near they were to Panama, when, from the summit of a hill, they discovered the towers of that city. They could not refrain from shouting for joy. The air re-echoed with the sound of trumpets and cymbals. They threw up their caps in the air, vociferating, Victory! Victory! In this place they halted and pitched their camp, with a firm determination of attacking Panama on the following day. At this time the Spaniards were in the utmost confusion. The first defensive step, which they had deemed it advisable to take, was to dispatch fifty horsemen for the purpose of reconnoitring the enemy. The detachment approached the camp within musket shot, and offered some insults to the freebooters, but speedily returned towards the city, exclaiming, Paros nos batamos! You dogs, we shall see you again! Shortly after a second detachment of two hundred men appeared, who occupied every pass, in order that, after the victory, which they considered as infallible, not one single pirate might escape. The freebooters, however, beheld with the utmost concern the measures which were adopted in order to block them up, and, previously to every other consideration, turned their attention towards their abundant supply of provisions. As they were prohibited from kindling any fire, they devoured the meat they had brought with them entirely in their raw state. They could not conceive how the Spaniards could carry their neglect or their fancied security to such a length as to not disturb that repose in which they stood so greatly in need nor how they could allow them the necessity leisure for recruiting their exhausted strength, and thus become the more fit for battle. They availed themselves of this oversight and were perfectly at ease. After they had glutted themselves with the animal food, they lay down upon the grass and slept quietly. Throughout the night, the Spaniards made their artillery roar without intermission, in order to display their vigilance. On the ensuing day, which was the 10th of their march, January the 27th, 1671, the pirates advanced at a very early hour with their military music, and took the road leading to Panama. By the advice, however, of one of their guides, they quitted the main road and went out of their way across a thick wood, through which there was no footpath. For this the Spaniards were unprepared, having confined themselves to the erection of batteries and construction of redoubts on the highway. They soon perceived the inutility of this measure, and were obliged to relinquish their guns in order to oppose their enemies on the contrary side. But not being able to take their cannons away from their batteries, they were consequently incapacitated from making use of one part of their defensive means. After two hours' march, the freebooters discovered the hostile army, which was a very fine one, well equipped, and was advancing in battle array. The soldiers were clad in party-coloured silk stuffs, and the horsemen were seated upon their meddlesome steeds, as if they were going to a bullfight. The President in person took command of this body of troops, which was of considerable importance, both for the country and likewise for the forces supported there by Spain. He marched against the pirates with four regiments of the line, consisting of infantry, besides 2,400 foot soldiers of another description, 400 horsemen, and 2,400 wild bulls, under the conduct of several hundred Indians and Negroes. 
This army, which extended over the whole plain, was discovered by the pirates from the summit of a small eminence, and presented them a most imposing appearance, insomuch that they were struck with a kind of terror. They now began to feel some anxiety as to the event of an engagement with forces so greatly superior to them in point of numbers, but they were soon convinced they must actually conquer or die, and encourage each other to fight till the very last drop of their blood was shed. A determination this, which, on the part of these intrepid men, was by no means a vain resolution. They divided themselves into three bodies, placed two hundred of their best marksmen in the front, and marched boldly against the Spaniards, who were drawn up in order of battle on a very spacious plain. The governor immediately ordered the cavalry to charge the enemy, and the wild bulls to be at the same time let loose upon them. But the ground was unfavourable for this purpose. The horsemen encountered nothing but marshes, behind which were posted the two hundred marksmen, who kept up such a continual and well-directed fire that horses and men fell in heaps beneath their shots before it was possible to effect a retreat. Fifty horsemen only escaped this formidable discharge of musketry. The bulls on whose service they had calculated so highly it became impractical to drive among the pirates. Hence such a confusion arose as to completely reverse the whole plan of the battle. The freebooters, in consequence, attacked the Spanish infantry with so much of the greater vigour. They successively knelt on the ground, fired and rose up again, while those who were on one knee directed their fire against the hostile army, which began to waver. The pirates, who continued standing, rapidly charged their firearms. Every man on this occasion evinced a dexterity and presence of mind which decided the fate of the battle. Almost every shot was fatal. The Spaniards, nevertheless, continued to defend themselves with much valour, which proved of little service against an exasperated enemy whose courage, inflamed by despair, derived additional strength from their successes. At length the Spaniards had recourse to their last expedient. The wild cattle were let loose upon the rear of freebooters. The buccaneers were in their element. By their shouts they intimidated the bulls, at the same time waving party-coloured flags before them, fired on the animals and laid them all upon the ground without exception. The engagement lasted two hours, and notwithstanding the Spaniards were so greatly superior, both in numbers and in arms, it terminated entirely in favour of the freebooters. The Spaniards lost the chief part of their cavalry on which they had built their expectations of victory. The remainder returned to the charge repeatedly, but their efforts only tended to render their defeat the more complete. A very few horsemen only escaped, together with some few of the infantry who threw down their arms to facilitate the rapidity of their flight. Six hundred Spaniards lay dead on the field of battle. Besides these, they sustained a very considerable loss in such as were wounded and taken prisoner. Among the latter were some Franciscans who had exposed themselves to the greatest danger in order that they might animate the combatants and afford the last consolations of religion to the dying. They were conducted into Morgan's presence, who instantly pronounced sentence of death upon them. In vain did these hapless priests implore the pity which they might have expected from a less ferocious enemy. They were all killed by pistol shots. Many Spaniards, who were apprehensive lest they should be overtaken in their flight, had consumed themselves in the flags and rushes of along the banks of the river. They were mostly discovered and hacked to pieces by the merciless pirates. The freebooters' task, however, was by no means completed. They had yet to take Panama, a large and populous city, which was defended by forts and batteries, and into which the governor had retired, together with the fugitives. The conquest of this place was the more difficult, as the pirates had dearly purchased their victory, and the remaining forces were in no respect adequate to the encounter, the difficulties attending to such an enterprise. It was, however, determined to make an attempt. Morgan had just procured from a wounded captive Spanish officer the necessary information, but he had not a moment to lose. It would not do to allow the Spaniards time to adopt new measures of defence. The city was therefore assaulted on the same day, in defiance of a formidable artillery which wrought great havoc amongst the freebooters, and at the end of three hours they were in possession of Panama. The capture of that city was followed by a general pillage. Morgan, who dreaded the consequence of excessive intoxication, especially after his men had suffered such a long abstinence, he foresaw that such a prohibition would infallibly be infringed, unless it was sanctioned by an argument far more powerful than the fear of punishment. He therefore caused it to be announced that he had received information that the Spaniards had poisoned all their wine. This dexterous falsehood produced the desired effect, and for the first time the freebooters were temperate. The majority of the inhabitants of Panama had betaken themselves to flight. They had embarked their women, their riches, all their movables that were of any value, 
and small in bulk, and had sent his valuable cargo to the island of Taroga. The men were dispersed over the country, but in sufficiently great numbers to appear formidable to the pirates, whose forces were much diminished, and who could not expect any assistance from abroad. They therefore continued constantly together, and for their greater security most of them encamped without the walls. We have now reached the time when Morgan committed a barbarous and incomprehensible action concerning which his comrades, some of whom were his historians, have only given a very ambiguous explanation. Notwithstanding that all the precious articles had been carried away from Panama, there still remained, as in every great European trading city, a vast number of shops, warehouses and magazines filled with every kind of merchandise. Besides a very great quantity of wrought and manufactured articles, the productions of luxury and industry, that city contained immense stores of flour, wine and spices, vast magazines of that metal which is justly deemed the most valuable of all because it is the most useful, extensive buildings in which were accumulated prodigious stores of iron tools and implements, anvils and ploughs which had just been received from Europe and were destined to revive the Spanish colonies. Some judgment may be formed respecting the value of the last mentioned articles, only what is considered that a quintal, one hundred weight of iron, was sold at Panama for thirty-two piastres, about thirty-three dollars. All these multifarious articles, so essentially necessary for furnishing colonists with a means of subsistence, were, it should seem, of no value in the estimation of the ferocious Morgan, because he could not carry them away, although by preserving them, he might have made use of them by demanding a specific ransom for them. Circumstances might also enable him to derive some further advantage from them, but, in fact, whatever was distant or uncertain presented no attraction to this barbarian, who was eager to enjoy, but more ardent to destroy. He was struck by one consideration only. All these bulky productions of art and industry were for the moment of no use to the freebooters. Of what importance to him was the ruin of many thousand innocent families? He consulted only the ferocity of his character, and without communicating his design to any individual, he secretly caused the city to be set on fire in several places. In a few hours it was almost entirely consumed. The Spaniards that had remained in Panama, as well as the pirates themselves, who were at first ignorant when the conflagration proceeded, ran together and united their efforts in order to extinguish the flames. They brought water, pulled down houses with a view to prevent the further progress of that destructive element. All their exertions were fruitless. A violent wind was blowing, and in addition to this circumstance, the principal part of the buildings in that city were constructed of wood. Its finest houses, together with their valuable furniture, among which was the magnificent palace belonging to the Genoese, the churches, convents, courthouse, shops, hospitals, pious foundations, warehouses loaded with sacks of flour, nearly two hundred other warehouses filled with merchandise, were all reduced to ashes. The fire also consumed a great number of animals, horses, mules, and many slaves who had concealed themselves and were burned alive. A very few houses only escaped the fire, which continued burning upward of four weeks, amid the havoc produced in every quarter by the conflagration, but the freebooters did not neglect to pillage as much as they possibly could, by which means they collected a considerable booty. Morgan seemed ashamed of his atrocious act. He carefully concealed that he had ever executed it, and gave out that the Spaniards themselves had set their city on fire. End of section 8。section 9 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, volume 12。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12, edited by Charles F. Horne, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. A Struggle of the Dutch Against France and England, A.D. 1672, by C. M. Davies, Part 1. Seldom has any people held out so heroically against overwhelming numbers as did the Dutch in 1672. Of the various wars during the reign of Louis XIV, that which he carried on against Holland was one of the most important. By its settlement at the Peace of Nimwegen, 1678-1679, 
the long hostilities between France and Holland and their allies were brought to a close, and Holland was once more saved from threatened destruction. Louis, having invaded the Spanish Netherlands, had reluctantly consented to the Treaty of Aix-la-Chapelle, 1668, by which he retained a small part of the Low Countries. By insisting on this treaty, Holland gave deep offence to the French monarch, who in 1672 began a war of revenge against the Netherlands, where his schemes of large acquisition had been thwarted. His first attempt was to isolate Holland, and having purchased the King of Sweden, he bribed Charles II of England, uncle of William of Orange, to enter into a secret treaty against the Netherlands. The principal events of the war are narrated by Davies, who shows how the old spirit of the Dutch return to them in this supreme hour of new peril to their liberties. The Dutch, though, in defence of their religion and liberties, they had beaten the first soldiers of the world, were never essentially a military nation, and in 1672, a long interval of peace and devotion to the pursuits of commerce had rendered them quite unfit for warlike enterprises. The army was entirely disorganized. The officers, appointed by the magistrates of the towns on the score of relationship or party adherence, without the slightest regard to their efficiency, were suffered, without fear of punishment, to keep the numbers of their regiments incomplete in order that they might appropriate the pay of the vacancies, while the men, independent and undisciplined, were allowed to spend their time in the pursuit of some gainful trade or peaceful occupation instead of practicing military exercises. The dispute concerning the appointment of a captain general had impeded any fresh levies, the recruits refusing to take the oath to the states except in conjunction with the Prince of Orange, and had induced many of the best and most experienced officers to take service in the French army, the fortifications of the towns were in a dilapidated condition, and no measures had been adopted for the security of the frontier. Such was the state to which party spirit had reduced a nation filled with brave, intelligent, and virtuous inhabitants, and governed by statesmen as able and wise as the world ever saw when the two most powerful sovereigns of Europe declared war against her. The manifests were both issued on the same day. That of the King of England is strongly marked by the duplicity, which was the defining characteristic both of himself and of his court, as then constituted. From the style of the document, one might be led to suppose that he was forced into the war with extreme reluctance and regret, and only in consequence of the impossibility of obtaining redress by any other means for the deep injuries he had sustained. He declared that, so far back as the year 1664, his Parliament had complained of the wrongs and oppressions exercised by the Dutch on his subjects in the East Indies, and for which they had refused to make reparation by amicable means. They had openly refused him the honour of the flag, one of the most ancient prerogatives of his crown, had sought to invite the King of France to hostilities against him, and had insulted his person and dignity by the abusive pictures and medals exposed in all their towns. This expression was understood to allude to a medal complained of three years before, and to a portrait of Cornelius de Witt, in the perspective of which was a representation of the burning of Chatham. Cornelius de Witt, being an ex-burgomaster of Dordrecht, the council of that town had, with a natural pride, caused this picture to be painted and hung up in the council chamber. The extreme sensitiveness manifested by Charles on this point appeared to the states rather superfluous in a monarch whose own kingdom 
teemed with the most offensive truths relative to himself and his government. As if determined that the mode of commencing hostilities should be as lawless and unjust as the war itself, the Court of England, several days before the declaration was issued, had commanded Sir Robert Holmes to attack the Dutch Smyrna fleet on its return. While cruising near the Isle of Wight, Holmes met the Admiral Sprague, by whom he was informed of the near approach of the vessels. But, anxious to secure to himself the whole of the booty, estimated at near a million and a half of guilders, he suffered Sprague to sail away in ignorance of his instructions, and leaving him with no more than nine frigates and three yachts. His covetousness, happily, proved the salvation of the fleet. After a short encounter of two days' duration, Holmes was forced to retire, having captured no more than three or four of the more inconsiderable ships, while the remainder gained their harbours in safety. The King of France appeared, by the tenor of his declaration of war, to imagine that his power and dignity entitled him to set at naught alike the natural rights of mankind and the law of nations. It resembled, indeed, rather the threat of a predatory incursion on the part of a barbarian chief than the justification of the taking up of arms by a civilized government Without adducing a single cause of complaint, he satisfied himself with declaring that the conduct of the states had been such as it was not consistent with his glory to endure any longer. If anything indeed could justify the arrogant tone assumed by Louis, the circumstances in which he found himself would have done so. An army of 120,000 able and well-equipped troops, commanded by Condé and Turenne, and numbering in its ranks volunteers of the noblest families in France, eager to distinguish themselves under the eye of their sovereign, funds lavishly supplied by the able minister of finance, Colbert, with vast magazines of ammunition and every other necessary collected, and winter quarters secured in the neighbouring and friendly territories of Cologne and Munster, seemed means almost absurdly disproportioned in magnitude to the end to be attained. At the same time he was but too well informed of the defenceless condition of the enemy. Jan de Witt and the States conceived that his first attempt would be upon Maastricht, the possession of which he was known to have long coveted, and that the difficulties of his conquest would be sufficient to deter from further enterprise a monarch of whose military prowess no very high idea was entertained, and who was supposed to be far more enamoured of the pomp and circumstance of war than of its toils and dangers. They accordingly fortified and provided Maastricht with the utmost care, leaving the frontier towns on the Rhine in an utterly inefficient state of defence. Aware of this fact, Louis commenced his operations on the side of Clebes and, separating his army into four divisions, laid siege simultaneously to as many places. He himself summoned the town of Rinberg. The Duke of Orléans sat down before Orsay. Condé was summoned to reduce Vaisal and Turenne, Burick, all surrendered within a week. To give an example of the capture of the towns which followed would be but to heap example upon example of cowardice or treachery, or, as they are generally found together, both. Nothing less than entire unanimity and the most undaunted resolution would have enabled the Dutch to resist the overwhelming force employed against them, whereas the miserable effect of the internal dissensions of the Republic had been to destroy for the time all mutual confidence. In some places, the garrisons, despising their incapable commanders, refused to act, or the governors, 
mistrustful of their undisciplined troops, lost all hope of prolonging a defence. In others, the detestation entertained by the magistrates toward the Orange Party was so great that, preferring to submit to France rather than to a native stadtholder, they hastened to deliver up their towns to the invader. On the other hand, the friends of the House of Orange looked not without some complacency on the misfortunes which threatened the state and which they hoped would reduce it to the necessity of raising the prince to the dignities of his family. While in those places where the Catholics were numerous, the populace, under the guidance of the priests, forced both garrisons and governments to open their gates to the sovereign, whom they hailed as the restorer of their religion. With scarcely a show of opposition, therefore, Louis advanced to the Rhine. The drought of the summer was so excessive that this river had become fordable in three places, which, being pointed out to the French by some peasants of Gwelderland, the king determined on attempting the passage between Schenkenschans and Arnhem near the Tollhaus, a village and tower about two miles distant from the separation of the branch of the river called the Vahal. The Prince of Orange, who was stationed with about 22,000 men at Arnhem and along the banks of the Issel, instead of concentrating his forces to oppose the passage of the enemy, contented himself with detaching de Montbar to guard the Betteva and to throw succors, if requisite, into Nimwegen. But this general, deeming the troops placed under his command insufficient for the purpose required, abandoned his post. He was arrested and sent to Utrecht, but afterward allowed to escape. Immediately on the retreat of Montbar, the prince dispatched General Wurz, but still with a vastly inadequate force, to occupy the post at the Tull House. The French curasseurs, led on by the Counts de Guiche and Revel, first waded into the fort under the fire of the artillery from the tower, which, however, as there were no more than seventeen men stationed in it, was not very formidable. They were followed by a number of volunteers, and in a short time the whole of the cavalry passed over with trifling loss. The Dutch troops, discouraged as well by the unexpectedness of the attempt as by their own inferiority in number, were driven back after a short skirmish. A bridge was then thrown across the river for the infantry, and thus this famous passage was accomplished with comparative ease and safety. As the position of the Prince of Orange on the Issel which in consequence of the drought was fordable throughout nearly the whole of its course, was now no longer tenable. He retired to Utrecht, abandoning Arnhem to the enemy, who soon after received the submission of Nimwegen and the whole of Gwelderland, Teal and the Bommel. In order to put Utrecht into a state of defence, the prince considered it necessary to burn down all the suburbs, a measure which, when he proposed to the states of the province, he found them reluctant to comply with. He therefore immediately quitted that city, and with the whole of his forces made a further retreat into Holland. Thus left wholly unprotected, the states of Utrecht conceived that the only resource which remained to them was to mollify the conqueror by a speedy submission, and accordingly, while Louis was yet at Dursburg, they sent deputies to tender to him the keys of the city and the submission of the whole province. The king shortly after entered Utrecht in triumph. While the good fortune rather than the arms of Louis subdued Gwelderland and Utrecht, his allies, the bishops of Cologne and Munster, found no more vigorous resistance in Overissel. Oldenzeel, Ansheda, and other small towns yielded at once to their summons. De Fenter, though well garrisoned and amply provided, was surrendered at once by the municipal government, who, by their exhortations and example, 
induce that of Zwoll to adopt a like disgraceful course of conduct. The easily acquired spoil was divided among the captors. The king of France, who had furnished a subsidy of troops, placed garrisons at Campen and Elberg. The archbishop of Cologne retained Defenter, Graal and Brivort being allotted to the bishop of Munster, while Zwoll was held in common. The troops of these warlike prelates exercised everywhere unbounded license and cruelties. Numbers of unhappy families were driven from their homes, and taking refuge in Holland added to the consternation which prevailed there. The province was now in imminent danger. No barrier remained, as it appeared, to oppose the progress of the enemy. The army of the prince had dwindled to about 13,000 men. Two of the frontier towns, Verden and Udavata, had solicited safeguards from the invaders, and Narden was surprised by the Count of Rochefort. Had he marched on at once to Mauden, he might have occupied that town also, a post of immense importance from its situation, as ships going to Amsterdam must come within reach of its cannon, and by means of a sluice there, the surrounding country may at any time be inundated. It had been left destitute of a garrison, but the French commander remaining two or three days inactive at Narden, time was afforded to John Maurice of Nassau to enter Mauden with a strong body of troops, and the chance thus lost was gone for ever. Amazed at the rapid advances of the invader, and dispirited by the symptoms of daily increasing aversion, which the great body of the people manifested to his government. The courage of Jan de Witt at this crisis so entirely forsook him that he took upon himself the disgrace of being the first to propose to the states of Holland that they should implore mercy from the conqueror. The resolution was immediately adopted and by them proposed to the states general, where it was passed with the dissident voice only of Zealand, who was of opinion that they should treat simultaneously with England, from whence that province had to apprehend the principal danger. A deputation was accordingly sent to Louis at Keppel, near Dursberg, headed by de Groot, and commissioned to inquire upon what terms His Majesty was inclined to grant peace to the Republic. They were answered by Louvois, that the king was not disposed to restore any of the conquests he had made, or to enter into any negotiations, unless the deputies were furnished with full powers and instructions as to what the states intended to offer. Returning to The Hague, de Groot made his report to the states of Holland, and representing the desperate condition of their affairs, recommended that Louis should be gratified with Maastricht and all the other towns of the Generality and that a sum should be offered him to defray the expenses of the war, provided that the king would leave them in possession of their liberty and sovereignty. Leyden, Harlem, and most of the other towns followed the example of the nobles in receiving these pusillanimous counsels with approbation. Amsterdam, however, proved that the spirit of the Guier was not yet utterly extinct in Holland. Prevailing with four towns of North Holland to follow their example, the Council of Amsterdam refused to send deputies to debate upon the question of granting full powers to the ambassadors, and made vigorous preparations for the defence of their city. They repaired the fortifications and strengthened them with considerable outworks, the magistrates themselves being the first to sacrifice their magnificent country houses in the suburbs for this purpose. They assigned to each of the regiments of burgher guards, who were 10,000 in number, a portion of the city to watch, took into their pay as soldiers all those inhabitants whom the secession of trade would throw out of employment, stationed outliers in the E. Amstel, Zydersee, and Pampas, and cutting the dikes, laid the country to a great distance round under water. They likewise passed a resolution that, 
though all the rest of Holland should make terms with the conqueror, they would sustain the siege single-handed till some friendly power should offer them assistance. The causes which combined to expose the United Provinces to these terrible disasters by land had, happily, no influence on their affairs by sea. The fleet, commanded by de Rauter, an officer surpassed by none of any age or nation in ability and courage, and of devoted fidelity to the present government, had been increased to 91 ships and frigates of war, 54 fire ships and 23 yachts. That of the Allies, commanded by the Duke of York, comprised after the junction of the French squadron under the Count de Trey, 149 ships of war, besides the smaller vessels. Sailing in quest of the enemy, de Rauter discovered them lying in Seoul Bay, evidently unprepared for his approach. On this occasion was felt the disadvantage of an entrusting an officer with the chief command without at the same time giving him sufficient authority to ensure its beneficial exercise. In consequence of the presence on board of Cornelius de Witt, the deputy of the States, de Rauter, instead of ordering an immediate attack, was obliged to call a council of war, and thus gave the English time to arrange themselves in order of battle, which they did with astonishing celerity. The Dutch advanced in three squadrons, nearly in a line with each other, the Admiral Bankert on the left to the attack of the French, Van Gend on the right, with the purpose of engaging the Blue Squadron, commanded by Montague, Earl of Sandwich, while de Rauter in the middle directed his course toward the red flag of the English, and pointing with his finger to the Duke of York's vessel, said to his pilot, There is our man. The pilot instantly steered the ship right down upon that of the Duke, and a terrific broadside was returned with equal fury. After two hours' incessant firing, the English admiral retreated, his ship being so damaged that he was obliged to transfer his flag on board the London. At the same time, Brakel, a captain who had signalized himself in the burning of Chatham, with a vessel of 62 guns, attacked the Royal James of 104 guns, the ship of the Earl of Sandwich, which he boarded and fired. Montague, refusing to surrender, was drowned in an attempt to escape in a boat. On the other hand, Van Gend, the admiral of the squadron engaged with the earls, was killed in the beginning of the action. The contest was maintained with a daring and steady valour characteristic of both nations from seven in the morning until nightfall. The French had received instructions to keep aloof from the fight and allow the two fleets to destroy each other, and these they took care to carry out to the full. Thus, the only assistance they afforded to the English was to prevent the Dutch squadron engaged in watching their movements from acting, an advantage more than counterbalanced by the discouragement their behaviour occasioned among their allies. Though both parties claimed the victory, it undoubtedly inclined in favour of the Dutch, who sustained a loss somewhat inferior to that of their antagonists, and had the satisfaction, moreover, of preventing a descent upon Zealand by the combined fleets, which was to have been the immediate consequence of a defeat. This was, however, attempted about a month after when the disasters attending the arms of the states by land, having induced them to diminish the number of their ships, de Rauter received commands to remain in the ports and avoid an engagement. The whole of the English fleet appeared in the Texel, provided with small craft for the purpose of landing. But, by a singular coincidence, it happened that, on the very day fixed for the attempt, the water continued, for some unknown cause, so low as to render it impossible for the vessels to approach the shore, and to impress the people with the idea that the ebb of the tide lasted for the space of twelve hours. 
Immediately after, a violent storm arose, which drove the enemy entirely away from the coasts. The internal condition of the United Provinces was at this time such as to incite the combined monarchs, no less than their own successes, to treat them with insolence and oppression. They beheld the inhabitants, instead of uniting with one generous sentiment of patriotism in a firm and strenuous defence of their fatherland, torn by dissensions, and turning against each other the rage which should have been directed against their enemies. The divisions in every province and town were daily becoming wider and more embittered. Though both parties had merited an equal share of blame for the present miscarriages, the people imputed them exclusively to the government of Jan de Witt and his adherents, who, they said, had betrayed and sold the country to France. And this accusation, to which their late pusillanimous counsels gave but too strong a colour of plausibility, the heads of the Orange Party, though well aware of its untruth, diligently sustained and propagated the ministers of the church always influential and always on the alert made the pulpits resound with declamations against the treachery and incapacity of the present government as the cause of all the evils under which they groaned and emphatically pointed to the elevation of the prince of orange to the dignities of his ancestors as the sole remedy now left them to this measure, De Witt and his brother were now regarded as the only obstacles, and so perverted had the state of public feeling become that the most atrocious crimes began to be looked upon as meritorious actions, provided only they tended to the desired object of removing these obnoxious ministers. On one occasion, Jan De Witt, having been employed at the Chamber of the States, to a late hour of the night, was returning home attended by a single servant, according to his custom, when he was attacked by four assassins. He defended himself for a considerable time, till having received some severe wounds he fell, and his assailants decamped, leaving him for dead. One only, James van der Graaff, was arrested. The other three took refuge in the camp, where, though the states of holland earnestly enjoined the prince of orange and the other generals to use diligent means for their discovery they remained unmolested till the danger was past van der graaf was tried and condemned to death the pensionary was strongly solicited by his friends to gratify the people by interceding for the pardon of the criminals but he resolutely refused to adopt any such mode of gaining popularity. Impunity, he said, would but increase the number and boldness of such miscreants, nor would he attempt to appease the causeless hatred of the people against him by an act which he considered would tend to endanger the life of every member of the government. The determination, however just, was imprudent. The criminal, an account of whose last moments was published by the minister who attended him, was regarded by the populace as a victim to the vengeance of Jan de Witt and a martyr to the good of his country. On the same day, a similar attempt was made on the life of his brother Cornelius de Witt at Dordrecht by a like number of assassins who endeavoured to force their way into his house but were prevented by the interference of a detachment of the burgher guard. Cornelius had already, on his return from the fleet, in consequence of impaired health, been greeted with a spectacle of his picture, which had given such umbrage to the King of England, cut into strips and stuck about the town, with a head hanging upon the gallows. These symptoms of tumult rapidly increased in violence. A mob assembling with loud cries of Orange Boven, De Witten Oden, Long Live the Prince of Orange, Down with the De Witts, surrounded the houses of the members of the council, whom they forced to send for the prince and to pass an act, repealing the perpetual edict, declaring him stadtholder, and releasing him from the oath he had taken not to accept that office while he was captain general. 
having been signed by all the other members of the council this act was carried to the house of cornelius de witt who was confined to his bed by sickness the populace at the same time surrounding the house and threatening him with death in case of refusal he long resisted observing that he had too many balls falling round him lately to fear death which he would rather suffer than sign that paper but the prayers and tears of his wife and her threats that if he delayed compliance she would throw herself and her children among the infuriated populace in the end overcame his resolution he added to his signature the letters v c we coactus but the people informed by a minister of their purport obliged him to erase them similar commotions broke out in rotterdam harlem leyden amsterdam and in other towns both of holland and zealand where the populace constrained the magistrates by menace and violence to the repeal of the edict reluctant to have such a measure forced upon them by tumult and sedition the states of holland and zealand now unanimously passed an act revoking the perpetual edict and conferring on the prince of orange the dignity of stadtholder captain and admiral general of these provinces soon afterwards cornelius de witt was thrown into prison and put to the torture on a false charge of planning the assassination of the prince of orange jan de witt visited his brother in his agony and a mob bursting into the jail seized upon both brothers as traitors and murdered them with horrid brutality from this time the authority of william became almost uncontrolled in the united provinces most of the leaders of the Lufenstein party either convinced of the necessity of his elevation to power in the present emergency or unwilling to encounter the vexation of a fruitless opposition acquiesced in the present state of things many were afterward employed by him and distinguished themselves by fidelity and zeal in his service the constant co-operation and participation in his views also of the pensionary fagel gave him an advantage which none of his predecessors had ever enjoyed the influence of the pensionaries of holland having hitherto been always opposed and forming a counterpoise to that of the stadtholder End of section 9section 10 of the great events by famous historians volume 12 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Struggle of the Dutch against France and England, A.D. 1672, by C. M. Davies, Part 2. Unquestionably, the Dutch, while thus parting with their liberties, reaped in some degree the benefits usually attended on such a sacrifice in the increased firmness and activity of a government conducted by a sole responsible head at the time of the embassy of peter de groot to solicit peace from the king of france the prince had so far partaken of the general dejection as to ask permission of the states to nominate a deputy to treat of his particular interests but no sooner was he created stadtholder than he began to adopt bolder and more spirited resolutions for the safety of a country to which he felt himself attached by new and stronger ties being invited by the assembly of the states to give his opinion on the terms offered by the allied monarchs he declared that their acceptance would entail upon them certain ruin and that the very listening to such was pernicious in the highest degree to affairs as tending to disunite and dispirit the people he encouraged them to hope for speedy assistance from his allies 
pointed out the resources which yet existed for the support of the war and persuaded them rather to resolve if they were driven to extremity to embark on board their vessels and found a new nation in the east indies than accept the conditions at the same time he spurned with indignation the flattering proposals made him both by the kings of france and england for so singularly are men appointed to work out their own destiny these monarchs now vied with each other and were in fact principally instrumental in exalting the power and dignity of a prince who ere long was to hurl the brother of the one from the throne of his ancestors and prepare for the other an old age of vexation and disgrace if not to lay the first foundation of the ruin of his kingdom in the next century louis upon the appointment of the prince to the office of stadtholder was liberal in offers of honour and advantages to his person and family and among the rest was one which he considered could scarcely fail of its effect that namely of making him sovereign of the provinces under the protection of france and england william however was found wholly immovable on this point declaring that he would rather retire to his lands in germany and spend his life in hunting than sell his country and liberty to france nor were the dispiriting representations made by the english ambassadors that holland was utterly lost unless he consented to the terms proposed at all more influential i have thought of a means he replied to avoid beholding the ruin of my country to die in the last ditch neither indeed was the state of the country though sufficiently deplorable such as to leave him no choice but to become the vassal of her haughty enemies the progress of the invader in holland was effectually arrested by the state of defence into which that province had been put imitating the noble example set them by amsterdam the other towns readily opened the sluices of the lek meurs issel and fecht inundating by that means the whole of the intervening tracts of land the dutch army was stationed at the five principal posts of the provinces prince maurice john being placed at mauden and visp field marshal wurz at gorkum the count of horn at the gerjanfervellen schlaus another detachment occupied verden and the prince himself took up his headquarters at bodegrava and neuferberg at length finding his army increased by the addition of subsidies from spain to twenty four thousand men william determined to infuse new vigour into the public mind by the commencement of offensive hostilities he first formed the design of surprising Naden and Verden, both of which attempts, however, proved unsuccessful. He then marched towards Maastricht, captured and demolished the fort of Falkenberg, by which that town was straitened, and with a view of diverting the force of the enemy by carrying the war into his own territory, advanced to the siege of Charolais but the middle of winter having already arrived before he commenced the enterprise he was soon after compelled by the severity of the weather to abandon it and retire to holland which during his absence had from the same cause been exposed to imminent danger the duke of luxembourg who had been left in command of the forces in utrecht on the departure of the king of france for paris finding that the ice with which the land water was covered was sufficiently strong to bear the passage of cavalry marched with a strong body of troops to svanadam and thence to berda grava both of which were abandoned the purpose of the french commander was to advance directly upon the hague and to force the states to acknowledge the sovereignty of the king of france a measure which would he conceived involve the immediate submission of the whole of the provinces but happily 
his project was defeated by a sudden thaw which obliged him to return to utrecht and had it not been that the fort of neuverberg situated on the dyke which afforded the only passage thither was deserted by the commander Pain his retreat must have been cut off and his army exposed to almost certain destruction before his departure luxembourg revenged himself on the luckless villages he had captured which he pillaged and burned to the ground footnote the accounts given by the dutch historians of the revolting outrages and barbarities exercised by the invaders on this expedition are strenuously denied by the writers on the french side their conduct in utrecht however which we shall have occasion hereafter to notice affords but too ample evidence that there was some truth in the accusations on the other hand that the dutch authors are guilty of exaggeration may be easily believed since one of them gravely puts into the mouth of the duke of luxembourg the following address to his soldiers go my children plunder murder destroy and if it be possible to commit yet greater cruelties be not negligent therein so that i may see i am not deceived in my choice of the flower of the king's troops End footnote pain Evin was afterward tried for breach of duty and executed though it might well have been feared that the failure of all the enterprises of the prince of orange would have renewed the discontents lately prevalent in the united provinces such an effort was in no degree produced the very boldness of the designs it seemed had been the cause of their ill success and argued a zeal and activity for the public good which inspired unbounded confidence in his future measures the appearance of renovated vigour in the united provinces moreover encouraged surrounding states to make some demonstrations in their favour they had wished to see them humbled but not destroyed the emperor and princes of germany in especial contemplated with dread the prospect of exchanging the neighbourhood of the inoffensive and industrious people who rarely appeared to them in any other light than as the dispensers of abundance wealth and luxury for that of an ambitious and unscrupulous monarch whose glory was in destruction and from whose encroachments their boundaries would be for not one moment safe though deeply imbued with these sentiments the elector of brandenburg had hitherto been deterred from lending them any assistance lest should they be forced to make a peace with the king of france the whole power and vengeance of that monarch might be directed against himself he now induced the emperor leopold to enter into an alliance with him by virtue of which he levied a force of twenty four thousand men to be joined with an equal number furnished by himself for the purposes of opposing the advances of louis though the secret treaty which the emperor had made with france binding himself not to afford aid to any member of the triple alliance and of which the elector was in ignorance limited the employment of the imperial army strictly to the protection of the empire and consequently prevented it from marching at once to the support of the provinces its movement was of considerable advantage to their affairs in calling off turenne from bois le duc to which he had laid siege to the defence of the places on the rhine the bishops of munster and cologne also whom the brave defence of the garrison of groningen had forced to raise the siege were under the necessity of abandoning both that province and Gelderland and hastening to the protection of their own territories. Among the benefits which the Dutch anticipated with the utmost confidence as the consequence of the elevation of the Prince of Orange to his paternal dignities was the appeasing the hostility of his uncle, the King of England, in this however they were wholly deceived on the meeting of parliament in this year 
the chancellor shaftesbury addressed the two houses in a strain of hostile feeling to the dutch nation more bitter than the court as yet ventured to express he represented that besides the personal indignities in the way of pictures medals and other public affronts which the king received from the states they came at last to such a height of insolence as to deny him the honour of the flag though an undoubted jewel of the crown and disputed the king's title to it in all the courts of europe making great offers to the french king if he would stand by them in this particular but both kings knowing their own interest resolved to join against them who were the common enemies of all monarchies but especially the english their only competitor in commerce and naval power and the chief obstacle to their attainment of the dominion they aimed at a dominion as universal as that of rome and so intoxicated were they with that vast ambition that under all their present distress and danger they haughtily rejected every overture for a treaty or a cessation of arms that the war was a just and necessary measure advised by the parliament itself from the conviction that at any rate de lenda est cartago such a government must be destroyed and that therefore the king may well say it was their war which had never been begun but that the states refused him satisfaction because they believed him to be in so great want of money that they must sit down under any affronts but the parliament always disinclined to the war had now begun to view it with absolute aversion and though moved by the king's representations of the embarrassed condition he should be reduced to if the supply were refused to yield a subsidy of seventy thousand pounds a month for eighteen months they forced him to pay a high price for their complaisance by extorting his consent to the test act by the operation of this act the duke of york the inveterate enemy of the dutch and sir thomas clifford the minister who had the most zealously pushed forward the business of the war were forced to resign their offices with the funds granted him by parliament charles was enabled to complete the equipment of a fleet which when joined by a squadron of french ships under d'estrees numbered one hundred fifty sail the prince of orange had wisely continued de Rauta in the command of the fleet as lieutenant admiral of the provinces with almost unlimited instructions and suffered himself to be wholly guided by him in naval affairs interfering only so far as to reinstate tromp in the office of admiral under the college of amsterdam and to effect a perfect reconciliation between him and de Rauta a matter which the placable and magnanimous temper of the latter rendered of easy accomplishment having failed in a scheme of blocking up the thames by means of sinking vessels in the bed of that river de Rauter stationed himself at schoenfeldt with the purpose of protecting the coast of zealand against a meditated descent of the enemy while at anchor he descried the hostile fleet approaching but a calm succeeded by rough weather prevented them for some days from coming to an engagement the dutch were considerably inferior in strength to the allies the number of their vessels being no more than fifty-two men of war and twelve frigates of which moreover the equipages were owing to the scarcity of seamen by no means complete but this deficiency was more than compensated by the spirit and conduct of their great commander the weaker our fleet is observed de Rauter, in answer to some remark made to him on the subject the more confidently i expect a victory not from our own strength but from the arm of the almighty under a favourable breeze the french and english ships bore down upon their unequal antagonists in the full expectation that they would avoid the encounter by retiring behind the sandbanks of flushing the dutch however 
firmly awaited the shock commenced by the squadron of french ships which on this occasion had been placed in the van to avoid the imputation cast upon them in the last battle they engaged with that of tromp whose impetuous firing compelled the french admiral to retire for a time but quickly rallying he returned to the charge with such vigour that tromp was obliged to remove his flag on four different vessels successively de Rauter, meanwhile had engaged the red squadron commanded by prince rupert which after a sharp contest he threw into some disorder and succeeded in cutting off a considerable number of ships from the remainder instead however of pursuing his advantage de Rauter, becoming aware of the danger of his rival who was now entirely surrounded by the enemy hastened to his rescue on seeing him approach tromp exclaimed comrades here is our grandsire a pet name given to de Rauter among the sailors coming to help us so long as i live i will never forsake him the generous aid was no less effectual than well timed since the enemy astonished at his unexpected appearance fell back i am pleased to see he said that our enemies still fear the seven provinces the name of the vessel which carried his flag the fight was continued with unremitting obstinacy till darkness separated the combatants when the dutch found that they had gained about three miles upon their antagonists that the issue of such a contest should be doubtful was in itself equivalent to a victory on the side of the dutch a victory of which they reaped all the advantages as well as the glory since besides delivering their coasts from the intended invasion their loss was so inconsiderable that within a week the fleet was able to put to sea in its original numbers and strength another engagement fought with less of energy and resolution on the side of the english than usually distinguished them terminated in their retreat towards the thames which de Rauter conceiving to be a feint to draw the fleet off their coasts he declined the pursuit the movement however had its origin in a far different cause the english sailors fully participated in the feelings entertained by the great body of the nation who viewed the aggrandizement of their ally with jealousy and the undeserved misfortunes of their enemy with pity and considered every advantage gained over the dutch as a step toward the completion of the sinister designs they suspected their own sovereign of harboring against their religion and liberties they accordingly made no concealment of their reluctance to fight longer in such a quarrel it was now become evident to the government that the only mode of reconciling the people in any degree to the present state of things was the execution of some brilliant achievement which should flatter their national vanity and kindle their ambition or lead to the acquisition of spoil sufficiently considerable to afford some sensible assistance in supporting the war a descent on holland was therefore resolved on or if that were found impracticable it was proposed to intercept the indian fleet whose arrival was hourly expected with this view a formidable fleet of one hundred fifty sail made its appearance in the texel and was met by de Rauter about five miles from the village of the helder the dutch though far inferior in number having only seventy-five vessels convinced that this struggle was to be the most desperate and the last prepared themselves for it as men who had everything at stake after a short but inspiring harangue de Rauter gave the signal for attack as if with a presentiment that long years would elapse before they should again try the strength of each other's arm the english and dutch seemed mutually determined to leave upon the minds of their foes an ineffaceable impression of their skill and prowess all the resources which ability could suggest or valour execute were now employed each admiral engaged with the antagonist against whom it had before been his fortune to contend 
De Ruyter attached himself to the squadron of Prince Rupert. Tromp attacked Sprague, who commanded the blue flag, while Bankert was opposed to the French. The latter, however, after a short skirmish on the part of Rear Admiral Martel, who was unacquainted with the secret orders given to the commander d'Estrée, dropped off to a distance. Nor could all the signals made by Prince Rupert induce them to take any further share in the fight. Bankert therefore joined de Ruyter, who was engaged in a terrific contest with the squadron of Prince Rupert. The firing was kept up for several hours without cessation, the discharges from the cannon of the Dutch vessels being, it was said, as rapid as those of musketry, and in proportion of three to one to those of the enemy. Trump, whose actions always reflected more honour on his courage than conduct, separated himself, as was his custom, from the remainder of the fleet, and pressed forward into the midst of the enemy. He had sustained a continued cannonading from the vessel of spray for upward of three hours, without a single one of his crew being wounded, when de Ruyter, who had forced Prince Rupert to retire, came to his assistance. The prince on the other side joined Admiral Sprague, and the fight was renewed with increased ardour. The vessel of Trump was so damaged that he was obliged to remove his flag on board of another. Sprague was reduced to a similar necessity of quitting his ship, the Royal Prince, for the St. George, which, ere long, was so much disabled that he was obliged to proceed to a third. But the boat in which he was passing, being struck by a cannonball, sank, and himself and several others were drowned. Toward the close of evening, one English man of war was on fire, and two foundered. Not a single ship of war was lost on the side of the Dutch, but both fleets were so much damaged as to be unable to renew the engagement on the next morning. Each side, as usual, returned thanks for the victory, to which, however, the English failed to establish their claim, neither by accomplishing the projected invasion or intercepting the East India fleet, the whole of which, except one vessel, reached the ports in safety. In the more distant quarters of the world, the war was carried on with various success. The French captured the ports of Trincomalee in Ceylon and St. Thomas on the coast of Coromandel, which were, however, recovered in the next year and made an unsuccessful attempt on Corayao. The English possessed themselves of the island of Tobago and seized four merchantmen returning from India. But, on the other hand, the state's admiral, Effertson, made himself master of New York and, attacking the Newfoundland ships, took or destroyed no less than sixty-five and returned to Holland laden with booty. The king of France, meanwhile, well satisfied to have secured at so easy a rate a powerful diversion of the forces of Holland and the mutual enfeebling of the two most formidable maritime powers of Europe, cared little how the affairs of his ally prospered, so that he had been enabled to pursue the career of his conquest on land. Marching in person at the head of his troops, he laid siege to Maastricht, a town famous for its gallant defence against the Duke of Parma in 1579, but which now, notwithstanding several brisk and murderous sallies, capitulated in less than a month. With this achievement, the campaign of Louis ended. The progress of his arms and the development of his schemes of ambition had now raised him up a phalanx of enemies, such as not even his presumption could venture to despise. He had planned and executed his conquests in full reliance on the cooperation or neutrality of the neighbouring powers, and found himself in no condition to retain them in defiance of their actual hostility. He had from the first been strongly advised by Condé and Turenne to destroy the fortifications of the less important town, retaining so many only of the larger as to ensure the subjection of the provinces. He had, however, deemed it more consonant to his glory to follow the advice of Louvois 
in preserving all his conquests entire, and had thus been obliged to disperse a large portion of his army into garrison, leaving the remainder, however, thinned moreover by sickness and desertion, wholly insufficient to make head against the increasing number of his opponents. He therefore came to the mortifying resolution of abandoning the United Provinces, the possession of which he had anticipated with so much pride. This auspicious dawn of better fortunes to the provinces was followed by the long and ardently desired peace with England. The circumstances of the last battle in which, as the English declared, themselves and the Dutch had been made the gladiators for the French spectators, had more than ever disgusted that nation with the alliance of an ambitious and selfish monarch who, they perceived, was but gratifying his own rapacity at the expense of their blood and treasure. Spain had threatened a rupture with England unless she would consent to a reasonable peace, and even Sweden herself had declared, during the conferences at Cologne, that she should be constrained to adopt a similar course if the King of France persisted in extending his conquests. Should a war with these nations occur, the English saw themselves deprived of the, of the valuable commerce they carried on in their ports, to be transferred most probably to the United Provinces. In addition to which consideration, their navigation had already sustained excessive injury from the privateering of the Zealanders, who had captured, it is said, no less than 2,700 English merchant ships. These and various other causes had provoked the Parliament to use expressions of the highest indignation at the measures of the court, and to a peremptory refusal of further supplies for the war, unless the Dutch, by their obstinacy in rejecting terms of peace, should render its continuance unavoidable. Aware of this disposition, the States had addressed a letter to the King, which, with sufficient adroitness, they had contrived should arrive precisely at the meeting of Parliament, offering the King restitution of all the places they had gained during the war, and satisfaction with respect to the flag, or any other matter they had not already ordered according to his wishes. This communication, received with feelings of extreme irritation by the court, had all the effect intended on the House of Commons. It was in vain that the King complained of the personal insults offered him by the Dutch, in vain that the Chancellor expatiated on their obstinacy, arrogance, and enmity to the English, and that the court party remonstrated against the imprudence of exposing England defenceless to the power of that haughty enemy. The Parliament persisted in refusing the solicited supply, voted the standing army a grievance, bitterly complained of the French alliance, and resolved that His Majesty should be advised to proceed in a treaty with the States General in order to a speedy peace. A few days sufficed to accomplish a treaty, the Dutch obviating the principal difficulty by yielding the honour of the flag in the most ample manner. They now agreed that all their ships should lower their topsails and strike the flag upon meeting one or more English vessels bearing the royal standard within the compass of the four seas from Cape Finisterre to Staten in Norway and engage to pay the king two million guilders for the expenses of the war. Shortly after, the bishops of Munster and Cologne alarmed at the probability of being abandoned by the french to the anger of the emperor who had threatened them with the ban of the empire consented to a treaty with the united provinces in virtue of which they restored all the places they had conquered end of section ten Section 11 of The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, 
please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Mario Pineda. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Discovery of the Mississippi, A.D. 1673-1682, by François-Javier Gardeau. During the early colonization of New France, in the era of Count Frontenac, a remarkable spirit of adventure and discovery manifested itself in Canada among both clerics and laymen. This enterprise, in seeking to open up and colonize the country, indeed showed itself under each successive governor from the first settlement of Quebec in 1608 down to the fall in 1759 of the renowned capital of the St. Lawrence. In the entail arduous labor, full as it was of hazard and peril, the pathfinders of empire in the New World, besides laymen, were largely the Jesuit missionaries. The spirit of adventure especially began to show itself in the colony at the period when Monsieur Talon became intendant, when the government of New France, at the time of Louis XIV's minister, Colbert, became vested directly in the French crown. Through Talon's instrumentality, the colony revived, and by his large-minded policy, its commerce, which had fallen into the hands of a company of monopolists, was in time set free from many of its restrictions. Before Talon quitted the country, he took steps to extend the dominion of France in the New World toward Hudson's Bay and westward in the direction of the Great Lakes. In 1671, he dispatched a royal commissioner to Sault Sault Marie at the foot of Lake Superior to assemble the Indians of the region and induce them to place themselves under the protection and aid the commerce of the French king. While thus engaged, the commissioner heard of the Mississippi River from the Indians, and Talon entrusted the task of tracking its waters to Father Marquette and to Monsieur Jolet, a merchant of Quebec. With infinite toil, these two adventurous spirits reached the great river they were in search of and explored it as far south as the Arkansas. Here, unfriendly Indian tribes compelled them to return without being permitted to trace the mighty stream to its outlet. This, however, is supposed to have been accomplished in 1682 by Robert Cavalier, Sieur de La Salle, a daring young Frenchman who descended the Mississippi, it is currently believed, to the Gulf of Mexico, naming the whole region Louisiana in honor of Louis XIV. Whether La Salle actually explored the great river to its mouth is, among historians, still a moot point. It is supposed that early in his adventures, he retraced his steps and returned to Canada, where, as well as in France, he had numerous detractors, among whom was de la Barre, the then governor of New France. It is known that he was soon again in Quebec to meet his enemies, which he did successfully, after which he proceeded to France. Here he was royally received by the king, and, as a proof of the monarch's confidence in him, La Salle was entrusted with the command of a colonizing expedition which was sent to Louisiana by sea. The expedition never reached its destination, for differences with the commander of the vessels, Beaujau, interfered with the direction of the expedition. The mouths of the Mississippi, it seems, were passed, and the ships reached the coast of Texas. Disaster now dogged the leader's footsteps for Bijou ran one of the ships on the rocks and then deserted with another. La Salle and some of his more trusty followers were left to their fate, which was a cruel one, for disease broke out in the ranks, and famine and savage foes made havoc among the survivors. His colony being reduced to forty persons, La Salle set out overland with sixteen men for Canada to procure recruits. On the way, his companions mutinied, put La Salle to death, and but a handful of the party reached Canada, the remainder perishing in the wilderness. Were we to express in the briefest of terms the motives which induced the leading European races of the 15th and 16th centuries who came to the Americas, we should say that the Spaniards went thither in quest of gold, the English for the sake of enjoying civil and religious freedom, the French in view of propagating the gospel among the aborigines, Accordingly, we find, from the beginning, in the annals of New France, 
religious interests overlying all others. The members of the Society of Jesus, becoming discredited among the nations of Europe for their subservience to power, usually exalting the rights of kings, but at all times inculcating submission both by kings and their subjects to the Roman pontiffs, individual Jesuits, we say, whatever might have been their demerits, as members of the confraternity in Europe or in South America, did much to redeem this by their apostolic labors in the wilderness of the northern continent, cheerfully encountering, as they did, every form of suffering, braving the cruelest tortures, and even welcoming death as the expected seal of their martyrdom for the cause of Christ and for the advancement of civilization among barbarous nations. From Quebec, as a center point, the missionary lines of the Jesuit fathers radiated in all directions through every region inhabited by our savages, from the Laurentian Valley to the Hudson's Bay Territory, along the Great Lake countries, and down the valley of the Mississippi. Scantily equipped, as it seemed to the worldly eye, with a breviary around the neck and a crucifix in hand, the missionary set forth and became a pioneer for the most adventurous secular explorers of the desert. To such our forefathers owed their best earliest knowledge of vast regions to whose savage inhabitants they imparted the glad tidings of the gospel and smoothed the way for native alliances with their compatriots of the lady of the greatest after import to the colony. Such devotedness, at once heroic and humble, could not but confound worldly philosophy, while it has gained for the members of the order the admiration of many Protestants. Thus we have the candid testimony of Bancroft, the able historian of the English plantations in this continent, that the annals of missionary labors are inseparably connected with the origin of all the establishments of French America. Not a cape was doubled, not a stream discovered, that a Jesuit did not show the way. On the other hand, there were instances where secular explorers, seeking to illustrate their names by great discoveries, or to enrich themselves by traffic, opened the way for the after labors of the missionary. The most celebrated of such were Champlain, Nicolet, Perrault, Joliet, La Salle, and Le Berendry. In regions south of the St. Lawrence, Père Drillet was the first European who passed overland from that river to the eastern Atlantic seaboard, ascending the Chaux de Fer and descending the Kennebec in 1646. He did good service to the colony by preserving for it the amity of that brave nation, the only one which the Iroquois were slow to attack. In another direction, the traffickers and missionaries, constantly moving onward toward the sources of the St. Lawrence, had reached the upper extremity of Lake Huron, Père Bribord, Daniel, Lalemann, Jogues, and Rimbaud, founded in the regions around its waters the Christianized settlements, villages of St. Joseph, St. Michel, St. Ignace, and St. Mary. The last named, seated at the point where Lake Huron communicates with Lake Erie, was long the central point of the Northwestern missions. In 1639, John Nicolet, following the curse of a river flowing out of Lake Michigan at Green Bay, was led within three days' navigation of the Great Water, such was the distinctive name the Aborigines gave to the Mississippi. In 1671, the relics of the Huron tribes, tired of wandering from forest to forest, settled down in Michilimackinac at the end of Lake Superior under the care of Père Marquette who thus became the earliest founder of a European settlement in Michigan. The natives of the vicinity were of the Algonquin race, but the French called them Sauteurs, from their being near to Sault Saint Marie. Between the years 1635 and 1647, communication with the region was little attempted, the hostile feeling of the Iroquois making the navigation of Lake Ontario perilous to adventurers, and obliging them to pass to and from the western mission filled by the valley of the Ottawa. The Neuters territory, visited by Champlain, and the southern lake board of Erie beyond Buffalo, were as yet almost unknown. The new impulse which had been given to Canada by Colbert and Talon began to bear fruit. Commerce revived, immigration increased, and the Aborigines, dominated by the genius of civilization, 
feared and respected everywhere the power of France. Perrault, a famous explorer, was the first European who reached the end of Lake Michigan and the Miami's country, where deputies from all the native tribes of the regions, irrigated by the headwaters of the Mississippi, the sources of the Red River, and the St. Lawrence, responded to his call to meet him at the Salt Sainte Marie, from one discovery to another, as so many successive stages in a journey, the French attained a certainty that the great water did exist, and they could, in advance, trace its probable course. It appeared certain, from the recent search made for it in northerly and eastern directions, that its waters, so voluminous as the natives asserted, must at last find their sea bent either in the Bay of Mexico or in the Pacific Ocean. Talon, who took a strong interest in the subject during his intendancy, recommended Captain Poulet, a skillful mariner of deep, to verify the passage from sea to sea through the Straits of Magellan. He induced Monsieur de Frontenac to send Monsieur Joliet into the region where the great stream, yet unseen, must take its rise and follow its course, if found, till its waters reach the sea. The person thus employed on a mission which interested everyone at the time was a man of talent, educated in the Jesuits College of Quebec, probably in view of entering the church, but who had gone into the peltry trade. He had traveled much of the countries around Lake Superior and gained great experience of the natives, especially those of the Ottawa tribes. Monsieur Joliet and Père Marquette set out together in the year 1673. The latter, who had lived among the Potawatomi Indians as a missionary and gained their affections, was forewarned by them of the perils, they alleged, which would beset his steps in so daring an enterprise, admonishing him and his companion that the people of the farther countries would allow no stranger to pass through them, that travelers were always pillaged at the least, that the great river swarmed with monsters and devoured men, and that the climate was so hot that human flesh could not endure it. Having progressed to the farthest horde over the Fox River, where Père Alouet was known, and the extremest point yet touched by any European, the adventurers found the people of the diverse tribes living together in harmony, viz. the Kikapoos, Mascudins, and Miamis. They accorded the strangers a kind reception and furnished guides to direct the party, which was composed of nine persons in all, Joliet, Marquette, with five other whites and two natives. On June 10th, they set out, bearing two light canoes on their shoulders, for crossing the narrow portage which separates the Fox River from that of Wisconsin, where the latter, after following it suddenly, takes a western course. Here the Indian guides left them, fearing to go farther. Arrived at the lower Wisconsin, they embarked and glided down the stream, which led the travelers through a solitude, they remarking that the level around them presented an unbroken expanse of luxuriant herbage of forests of lofty trees. Their progress was slow, for it was not till the tenth day that they attained the confluence of the Wisconsin and Mississippi. But the goal was surely, if tardily, attained. They were now floating on the bosom of the Father of Waters, a fact they at once felt assured of, and fairly committed themselves to the course of the doubled current. This event constituted an epoch in American annals. The two canoes, says Bancroft, with sails outspread under a new sky, sped their way, impelled by favoring breezes, along the surface of the calm and majestic ocean tributary. At one time, the French adventurers glided along sandbanks, the rest in places of innumerable aquatic birds. At others, they passed around wooden islands in mid-flood, and other whiles, again, their course lay through the vast plains of Illinois and Iowa, covered with magnificent woods, or dotted with clumps of bush scattered about limitless prairie lands. It was not till the voyagers had descended sixty leagues of the great stream that they discovered any signs of the presence of man. But at length, observing on the right bank of the river a foot track, they followed it for six miles and arrived at a horde, Burgad, situated on a river called by the natives Moingona, an appellation afterward corrupted into Riviere des Moines. Seeing no one, the visitors hollowed lustily, and four old men answered the call, 
bearing in hand the calumet of peace we are illinois said the indians you are our fellow men we bid you welcome they had never before seen any whites but had heard mention of the french and long wished to form an alliance with them against the iroquois whose hostile excursions extended even to their country they were glad to hear from julia that the colonists had lately chastised those whom no others could vanquish and feasted the visitors to manifest their gratitude as well as respect the chief of the tribe with some hundreds of his warriors escorted the party to their canoes and as a mark of parting esteem he presented a calumet ornated with feathers of various colors a safe conduct this held inviolable among the aborigines the voyagers again on their way were forewarned of the confluence of the missouri with the main stream by the noise of its discharging waters forty leagues lower they reached the influx of the ohio in the territory of the chuanaus by degrees the region they traversed changed its aspect instead of vast prairies the voyagers only saw thick forests around them inhabited by savages whose language was to them unknown in quitting the southern line of the ohio they left the algonquin family of aborigines behind and had come upon a region of nomads the chickasaw nation being here denizens of the forest the dakotas or sioux frequented the riverain lands in the southern region watered by the great flood thus interpreters were needed by the natives who wished to parley from either bank of the mississippi each speaking one of two mother tongues both distinct from those of the hurons and algonquins much of the latter being familiar to joliet and others of the party continuing their descent the confluence of the arkansas with the mississippi was attained the voyagers were now under the thirty-third parallel of north latitude at a point of the river course reported to have been previously reached from the opposite direction by the celebrated spanish mariner de soto here the illinois chiefs present stood the party in good stead for on exhibiting his ornate calumet they were treated with profuse kindness bread made of maize was offered by the chief of the horde located at the mouth of the arkansas river hatched heads of steel in use by the natives gave intimation that they traded with europeans and that the spanish settlements of the bay of mexico were probably not far off the walks in summer heats too gave natural corroboration to the same inferences the party had now in fact attained to a region without a winter unless as such be reckoned that part of its year known as the rainy season it now became expedient to call a halt for the stored provisions were beginning to fail and chance supplies could not be depended upon in such a wilderness as the bold adventurers had already traversed and they were still more uncertain as to what treatment they might receive from savage populations if they proceeded farther one thing was made plain to their perceptions the mississippi afforded no passage to the east indian seas they rightly concluded also that it found its sea outlet in the bay of mexico not the pacific ocean they had therefore now done enough to entitle them to the grateful thanks of their compatriots and for the names of their two leaders to take a permanent place in the annals of geographical discovery the task of ascending the great river must have been arduous and the return voyage protracted arrived at the point where it is joined by the illinois they left it for that stream which ascending for a part of its lower curves per marquette elected to remain with the natives of tribes located near to its banks while Monsieur joliet with the rest of the party passed overland to chicago thence he proceeded to quebec and reported his proceedings to the governor m talon at that time being in france this duty he had to perform orally having lost all his papers when shooting the rapids of the st lawrence above montreal he afterward drew up a written report with a tracing of his route from memory the encouragement the intendant procured for the enterprise fairly entitles him to share its glory with those who so ably carried it out for we cannot attach too much honor to the memory of a statesman who turned to account their opportunities of patronizing useful adventure m Jolet received in property the island of anticosti as a reward for his western discoveries 
and for an exploratory voyage he made to Hudson's Bay. He was also nominated Hydrographer Royal and got enfeft in a seigniory near Montreal. Expecting to reap great advantage from Anticosti as a fishing and fur trading station, he built a fort thereon, but after living some time on the island with his family, he was obliged to abandon it. His patronymic was adopted as the name of a mountain situated near the Riviere de Plain, a tributary of the Illinois, and Joliet is also the appellation given in his honor of a town near Chicago. Père Marquette proceeded to Green Bay by Lake Michigan in 1673, but he returned soon afterward and resumed his missionary labors among the Illinois Indians. Being then at war with the Miamis, they came to him asking for gunpowder. I have come among you, said the apostolic priest, not to aid you to destroy your enemies' bodies, but to help you to save your own souls. Gunpowder I cannot give you, but my prayers you can have for your conversion to that religion which gives glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to all men. Upon one occasion he preached before two thousand warriors of their nation, besides the women and children present. His bodily powers, however, were now well nigh exhausted. He decided to return to Mackinac, but while coasting the lower shores of Lake Michigan, feeling that his supreme hour was nigh, he caused the people in his canoe to set him ashore. Having obtained for him the shelter of a hut formed of branches, he there died the death of a righteous. His companions interred his remains near the river, which yet bears his name, and set up a crucifix to mark the spot. Thus ended, amid the solitudes of the western wilderness, the valuable existence of one whose name, too little known to his own age, will be remembered when hundreds of those which, however loudly sounded at the present, shall have passed into utter oblivion. The news of the discovery of the Mississippi made a great sensation in Canada and eclipsed for a time the interest attaching to other explorations of the age which were becoming more and more rife every year. Every speculative mind was set to work, as was usual in such occasions, to calculate the material advantages which might result, first to the colonists and next to their mother country, from access being obtained to a second gigantic waterway through the territories of New France, serving as it virtually might in times to come as a complement or completing moiety for the former, enabling the colonists to have the command of two seas. Still, as the Gulf of Mexico had not been reached by the adventurers upon the present occasion, some persons had their doubts about the real course of the lower flood. There was, therefore, still in store credit for those who should succeed in clearing up whatever uncertainty there might be about a matter so important. New France, says Raynal, had among its people a Norman named Robert Cavalier de La Salle, a man inspired with the double passion of amassing a large fortune and gaining an illustrious name. This person had acquired, under the training of the Jesuits, among whom his youth was passed, activity, enthusiasm, firmness of character, and high-heartedness, qualities which that celebrated confraternity knew so well to discern and cultivate in promising natures committed to their care. Their most audacious and enterprising pupil, La Salle, was especially impatient to seize every occasion that chance presented for distinguishing himself and ready to create such opportunities if none occurred. He had been resident some years in Canada when Joliet returned from his expedition to the Mississippi. The effect of so promising a discovery upon such a mind as La Salle's was of the most awakening kind. Joliet's report of what he experienced and his shrewd conjectures as to what he did not see, but which doubtless existed, well meditated upon by his fellow genius, inspired the latter to form a vast design of exploration and traffic conjoined, in realizing which he determined to hazard both his fortunes and reputation. Cavalier Sieur de La Salle was born in Rouen and the son of respectable parents. While yet a young man, he came to Canada full of a project he had conceived of seeking a road to Japan and China by a northern or western passage, but did not bring with him the pecuniary means needful even to make the attempt. He set about making friends for himself in the colony, 
and succeeded in finding favor with the Count de Frontenac, who discerned in him qualities somewhat akin to his own. With the aid of Mizy de Curzel and Talon, he opened a factory for the fur traffic at La Chine, near Montreal, a name which, China, he gave to the place in allusion to the Oriental goal toward which his hopes tended as an explorer. In the way of trade, he visited Lakes Ontario and Erie. While the Canadians were yet excited about the discovery of the Mississippi, he imparted his aspirations regarding it to the Governor-General. He said that, by ascending, instead of descending, that great stream, a means might be found for reaching the Pacific Ocean, but that the outlay attending the enterprise could only be defrayed by combining with it an extended traffic with the nations of the West, that he would gladly make the attempt himself if a trading post were erected for his use at the foot of Lake Ontario as a basis for his operations with an exclusive license to traffic in the Western countries. The governor gave him the command of Fort Frontenac to begin with. Obtaining also his recommendations to the court, La Salle sailed from France in 1675 and gained all he wanted from the Marquis de Sinelay, son and successor of the great Colbert as Minister of Marine. The king bestowed on La Salle the seigneury of Cadaraki, Kingston, and ennobled him. This seigneury included Fort Frontenac, of which he was made the proprietor, as well as of Lake Ontario, conditioned, however, that he was to reconstruct the fort in stone. His majesty also invested him with all needful credentials for beginning and continuing his discoveries. La Salle, on his return to Canada, actively set about aggrandizing his new possession. Several colonists and some of the natives repaired to the locality and settled under protection of his fort. He built in his vicinity three decked vessels, the first ever seen upon Lake Ontario. In 1677, he visited France again in quest of aid to carry out his plans. Colbert and Sinolay got him a royal commission as recognized explorer of Northwest America with permission to erect fortified posts therein at his discretion. He found a potent protector also in the Prince de Conti. La Salle, full of hope, sailed from La Rochelle in summer 1678 with 30 seamen and artisans, his vessel freighted with equipments for his lake craft and merchandise for barter with the Aborigines. A brave officer, Chevalier de Tonti, went with him, proposing to share his fortunes. Arrived at Cataraki, his energy put all his workpeople in activity. On November 18th, he set sail from Fort Frontenac in one of his barks, loaded with goods and materials for constructing a second fort and a brigantine at Niagara. When he reached the head of Lake Ontario, his vessel excited the admiration of the savages, while the falls of Niagara no less raised the wonder of the French. Neither had before seen the former so great a triumph of human art, nor the latter so overpowering a spectacle of nature. La Salle set about founding his proposed stronghold at Niagara, but the natives, as soon as the defensive works began to take shape, demurred to their being continued. Not caring to dispute the matter with them, he gave his erections the form of a palisaded storehouse merrily. During winter following, he laid the keel of a vessel on the stocks at a place some six miles above the falls. His activity redoubled as his operations progressed. He sent on his friend Tonti with the famous Ricolet, Bergenepin to seek out several men whom he had dispatched as forerunners in autumn proceeding to open up a traffic he intended to carry on with the aborigines of the west. In person he visited the Iroquois and several other nations with whom he wished to form trading relations. He has the honor of founding the town of Niagara. The vessel he there built he called the Griffin because, said he, the Griffin has right of mastery over the ravens an allusion, as was said, to his hope of overcoming all his ill-willers, who were numerous. Be this as it may, the griffin was launched in midsummer 1679 under the salute of cannon with a chanting of tedium and shouts from the colonists. The natives present, setting up gels of wonder, hailing the French as so many ocu, or men of a contriving mind. 
On August 7th, the Griffin, equipped with seven guns and loaded with small arms and goods, entered Lake Erie. When La Salle started for Detroit, which he reached in safety after a few days' sail, he gave to the expansion of the channel between Lakes Erie and Huron the name of Lake St. Clair, traversing which, on August 23rd, he entered Lake Huron. Five days later, he reached Michilimackinac after having encountered a violent storm such as are not infrequent in that locality. The aborigines of the country were not less moved than those of Niagara had been at the appearance of the griffin, an apparition rendered terrible as well as puzzling when the sound of her cannon boomed along the lake and reverberated from its shores. On attaining to the chapel of the Ottawa Drive at the mission station, he landed and attended mass. Continuing his voyage, Sometime in September, he reached the Bailly des Points on the western lake board of Michigan, where he cast anchor. So far, the first ship navigation of the great Canadian lakes had been a triumph. But the end was not yet, and it proved to be disastrous. For La Salle, hearing that his creditors had in his absence confiscated his possessions, dispatched the griffin, loaded with peltry, to Niagara, probably in view of redeeming them, but his vessel and goods were totally lost on the way. Meanwhile, he started with a trading party of 30 men of different callings, bearing arms and merchandise. Passing to St. Joseph's, at the lower end of Lake Michigan, whither he had ordered that the Griffin should proceed on her proposed second voyage from Niagara, he laid the foundations of a fort on the crest of a steep height, washed on two sides by the river of the Miamis, and defended on another side by a deep ravine. He set buoys at the entrance of the stream for the direction of the crew of the anxiously expected vessel, upon whose safety depended in part the continuation of his enterprises. Sending on some skillful hands to Michele Mackinac to pilot her on the lake, the vessel not appearing, and winter being near, he set out for the country of the Illinois Indians, leaving a few men in charge of the fort, and taking with him the missionaries Gabriel, Hennepin, and Zinob, also some private men. Tonti, who was likewise of the party, having rejoined his principal, but without the men he was sent to seek, as he could not find them. The expedition, thus constituted, arrived toward the close of December at a deserted native village situated near the source of the Illinois River, in the canton which still bears La Salle's name. Without stopping here, he descended that stream as far as Lake Peoria, called by Hennepin Pimitiwi, on the margin of which he found encamped a numerous body of the Illinois. These Indians, though naturally gentle, yet turned unfriendly regards at first on the party, but soon recovering from surprise at the appearance of the French, treated them with great hospitality. One of their attentions to the supposed wants of the visitors being to rub their wearied legs with bear's grease and buffalo fat. These friendly people were glad to learn that La Salle meant to form establishments in their country. Like the Huron savages of Champlain's time, the Illinois, harassed as they were by the Iroquois, trusted that the French would protect them in future. The visitors remarked that the Illinois formed the sides of their huts with mats of flat reeds, lined and sewed together. All those the party saw were tall, robust in body, and dexterous with the bow. But the nation had been stigmatized by some early reporters as cowardly, lazy, debauched, and without respect for their chiefs. La Salle's people, hearing no mention of his ship all this while, began first to murmur, and then to leave him. Six of them deserted in one night. In other respects, events occurred ominous of evil for the termination of the enterprise. To occupy the attention of his companions and prevent them from brooding on apprehended ills, as well as to guard them against a surprise by any hostile natives, he set them on erecting a fort upon an eminence at a place four days' journey distant from Lake Peoria which, when finished, he named Breakheart, Kripke, in allusion to the mental sufferings he then endured. To put an end to an intolerable state of suspense, in his own case he resolved to set out on foot for Frontenac, four hundred or five hundred leagues distant, hoping there to obtain good news about the griffin. 
also in order to obtain equipments for a new bark then in course of construction at crevincourt in which he meant to embark upon his return thither intending to descend the mississippi to its embouchure he charged pere hennepin to trace the downward course of the illinois to its junction with the mississippi then to ascend the former as high as possible and examine the territories through which its upper waters flow after making tonti captain of the fort in his absence he set out march two sixteen eighty armed with a musket and accompanied by three or four whites and one indian pere hennepin who left two days before descended the illinois to the mississippi made several excursions in the region around their confluence then ascended the latter to a point beyond the salt st anthony where he was detained for some months by Sioux indians who only let him go on his promise to return to them next year one of the chiefs traced on a scrap of paper the route he desired to follow and this rude but correct chart says hennepin served as truly as a compass by following the wisconsin which falls into the mississippi and fox river when running in the opposite direction he reached lake michigan mission station passing through intermediately vast and interesting countries such was the famous expedition of hennepin who on his return was not a little surprised to find a company of fur traders near the wisconsin river led by one Duluth, who had probably preceded him in visiting that remote region while hennepin was exploring the upper valley of the mississippi la salle's interests were getting from bad to worse at crevencoeur but for rightly understanding the events which at last obliged him to abandon that post it is necessary to explain the state of his affairs in canada and to advert to the jealousies which other traffickers cherished regarding his monopolizing projects in the western regions of the continent he came to the colony as we have seen a fortuneless adventurer highly recommended indeed while the special protection he obtained from the governor with the titular and more solid favors he obtained at court made him a competitor to all other commercialists whom it was impossible to contend with directly underhand means of opposition therefore and these not always the fairest were put in play to damage his interests and if possible effect his ruin for instance feuds were stirred up against him among the savage tribes and inducements held out to his own people to desert him they even induced the iroquois and the miamis to take up arms against the illinois his allies besides this hostility to him within new france he had to face the opposition of the anglo-american colonists who resisted the realization of his projects for nationally selfish reasons thus they encouraged the iroquois to attack la salle's indian allied connections of the mississippi valley a measure which greatly increased the difficulties of a position already almost untenable in a word the odds against him became too great and he was constrained to retire from the high game he wished to play out which indeed was certainly to the disadvantage of individuals if tending to enhance the importance of the colony as a possession of france la salle's ever trusted lieutenant the chevalier de tonti meanwhile did all he could at crevencourt to engage the illinois to stand firm to their engagements with his principal having learned that the miamis intended to join the iroquois in opposition to them he hastened to teach the use of firearms to those who remained faithful to put the latter on a footing of equality with these two nations who were now furnished with the like implements of war he also showed them how to fortify their hordes with palisades but while in the act of erecting fort louis near the sources of the river illinois most of the garrison at crevencourt mutinied and deserted after pillaging the stores of provision and ammunition there laid up at this crisis of la salle's affairs 1680 armed bands of the iroquois suddenly appeared in the illinois territory and produced a panic among its timid inhabitants tonti acting with spirit and decision as their ally now intervened and enforced upon the iroquois a truce for the illinois but the former on ascertaining the paucity of his means recommenced hostilities attacking the fort they murdered pere gabriel disinterred the dead and wasted the cultivated land of the french residents 
the illinois dispersed in all directions leaving the latter isolated among their enemies tonti who had at last but five men under his orders also fled the country while the chevalier in his passage from kerencourt was descending the north side of lake michigan la salle was moving along its southern side with a reinforcement of men and rigging for the bark he left in course of construction at the above-named post where having arrived he had the mortification to find it devastated and deserted he made no attempt to refound it but passed the rest of the year in excursions over the neighboring territories in which he visited a great number of tribes among them the autagamis and miamis whom he persuaded to renounce an alliance they had formed with the iroquois soon afterwards he returned to montreal taking frontenac on his way although his pecuniary losses had been great he was still able to compound with his creditors to whom he considered his own sole rights of trade in the western countries they in return advancing monies to enable him to prosecute his future explorations having got all things ready for the crowning expedition he had long meditated he set out with tonti perman bray also some french and native followers and directed his course toward the mississippi which river he reached february sixth sixteen eighty two the mildness of the climate in that latitude and the beauties of the country which increased as he proceeded seemed to give new life to his hopes of finally obtaining profit and glory in descending the majestic stream he recognized the arkansas and other riverine tribes visited by marquette he traversed the territories of many other native nations including the chickasaws the tainsas the choctaw and the natchez the last of these rendered so celebrated in times near our own by the genius of chateaubriand halting often in his descent to note the outlets of the many streams tributary to the all-absorbing mississippi among others the missouri and the ohio at the embouchure of the latter erecting a fort he did not reach the ocean mouths of the father of waters till april fifth that brightest day of his eventful life with elated heart he took formal possession of the country eminently in the name of the reigning sovereign of france as he gave to it at the same time the distinctive appellation of louisiana thus was completed the discovery and exploration of the mississippi from the salt st anthony to the sea a line more than six hundred leagues in length end of section eleven section twelve of the great events by famous historians volume twelve this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12, edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. King Philip's War, A.D. 1675, by Richard Hildreth. This was the most extensive and most important of the Indian wars of the early European settlers in North America. It led to the practical extermination of the red men in New England. Various policies towards the natives were pursued by different colonists in different parts of the country. In New England, the first white settlers found themselves in contact with several powerful tribes, chief among which were the Mohegans, the Narragansetts, and the Pequots some attempt was made to convert and civilize these savages but it was not long before the english colonists were at war with the pequots the most dreaded of the tribes in southern new england this contest sixteen thirty six to sixteen thirty eight was mainly carried on for the colonists by the settlers of connecticut it resulted in the almost complete extermination of the pequot tribe after the union of the new england colonies 1643 formed principally for common defense against the natives there was no considerable conflict between whites and indians until the outbreak of king philip's war here described by hildreth 
Except in the destruction of the Pequots, the native tribes of New England had as yet undergone no very material diminution. The Pocan Oquets, or Wampanoags, though somewhat curtailed in their limits, still occupied the eastern shore of Narragansett Bay. The Narragansetts still possessed the western shore. There were several scattered tribes in various parts of Connecticut, though, with the exception of some small reservations, they had already ceded all their lands. Uncas, the Mohegan chief, was now an old man. The Portucket or Penacook Confederacy continued to occupy the falls of the Merrimack and the heads of the Piscataqua. Their old sachem, Passaconaway, regarded the colonists with awe and veneration. In the interior of Massachusetts and along the Connecticut were several other less noted tribes. The Indians of Maine and the region eastward possessed their ancient haunts undisturbed but their intercourse was principally with the French, to whom, since the late peace with France, Acadia had been again yielded up. The New England Indians were occasionally annoyed by war parties of Mohawks, but by the intervention of Massachusetts, a peace had recently been concluded. Efforts for the conversion and civilization of the Indians were still continued by Eliot and his coadjutors supported by the funds of the English society. In Massachusetts there were fourteen feeble villages of these praying Indians, and a few more in Plymouth Colony. The whole number in New England was about 3,600, but of these near one-half inhabited the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. A strict hand was held by Massachusetts over the Narragansetts and other subject tribes, contracting their limits by repeated sessions, not always entirely voluntary. The Wampanoags, within the jurisdiction of Plymouth, experienced similar treatment. By successive sales of parts of their territory, they were now shut up, as it were, in the necks or peninsulas formed by the northern and eastern branches of Narragansett Bay, the same territory now constituting the continental eastern portion of Rhode Island. Though always at peace with the colonists, the Wampanoags had not always escaped suspicion. The increase of the settlements around them and the progressive curtailment of their limits aroused their jealousy. They were galled also by the feudal superiority, similar to that of Massachusetts, over her dependent tribes claimed by Plymouth on the strength of certain alleged former submissions. None felt this assumption more keenly than Pometacom, head chief of the Wampanoags, better known among the colonists as King Philip of Mount Hope, nephew and successor of that Massasoit who had welcomed the pilgrims to Plymouth. Suspected of hostile designs, he had been compelled to deliver up his firearms and to enter into certain stipulations. These stipulations he was accused of not fulfilling, and nothing but the interposition of the Massachusetts magistrates, to whom Philip appealed, prevented Plymouth from making war upon him. He was sentenced instead to pay a heavy fine and to acknowledge the unconditional supremacy of that colony. A praying Indian, who had been educated at Cambridge and employed as a teacher, upon some misdemeanor had fled to Philip, who took him into service as a sort of secretary. Being persuaded to return again to his former employment, this Indian accused Philip anew of being engaged in a secret hostile plot. In accordance with Indian ideas, the treacherous informer was waylaid and killed. Three of Philip's men, suspected of it having killed him, were arrested by the Plymouth authorities and, in accordance with English ideas, were tried for murder by a jury half English, half Indians, convicted upon very slender evidence, and hanged. Philip retaliated by plundering the houses nearest Mount Hope. Presently he attacked Swansea and killed several of the inhabitants. Plymouth took measures for raising a military force. The neighbouring colonies were sent to for assistance. 
thus by the impulse of suspicion on the one side and passion on the other new england became suddenly engaged in a war very disastrous to the colonies and utterly ruinous to the native tribes the lust of gain in spite of all laws to prevent it had partially furnished the indians with firearms and they were now far more formidable enemies than they had been in the days of the pequots of this the colonists hardly seemed to have thought now as then confident of their superiority and comparing themselves to the lord's chosen people driving the heathen out of the land they rushed eagerly into the contest without a single effort at the preservation of peace indeed their pretensions hardly admitted of it philip was denounced as a rebel in arms against his lawful superiors with whom it would be folly and weakness to treat on any terms short of absolute submission a body of volunteers horse and foot raised in massachusetts marched under major savage four days after the attack on swansea to join the plymouth forces after one or two slight skirmishes they penetrated to the wampanoag villages at mount hope but found them empty and deserted philip and his warriors conscious of their inferiority had abandoned their homes if the narragansetts on the opposite side of the bay did not openly join the wampanoags they would at least be likely to afford shelter to their women and children the troops were therefore ordered into the narragansett country accompanied by commissioners to demand assurances of peaceful intentions and a promise to deliver up all fugitive enemies of the colonists pledges which the narragansetts felt themselves constrained to give arrived at taunton on their return from the narragansett country news came that philip and his warriors had been discovered by church of plymouth colony collected in a great swamp at pocasset now tiverton the southern district of the wampanoag country whence small parties sallied forth to burn and plunder the neighbouring settlements after a march of eighteen miles having reached the designated spot the soldiers found there a hundred wigwams lately built but empty and deserted the indians having retired deep into the swamp the colonists followed but the ground was soft the thicket was difficult to penetrate the companies were soon thrown into disorder each man fired at every bush he saw shake thinking an indian might lay concealed behind it and several were thus wounded by their own friends when night came on the assailants retired with the loss of sixteen men the swamp continued to be watched and guarded but philip broke through not without some loss and escaped into the country of the mitmucks in the interior of massachusetts that tribe had already commenced hostilities by attacking menden they waylaid and killed captain hutchinson a son of the famous mrs hutchinson and sixteen out of a party of twenty sent from boston to brookfield to parley with them attacking brookfield itself they burned it except one fortified house the inhabitants were saved by major willard who on information of their danger came with a troop of horse from lancaster thirty miles through the woods to their rescue a body of troops presently arrived from the eastward and were stationed for some time at brookfield the colonists now found that by driving philip to extremity they had roused a host of unexpected enemies the river indians anticipating an intended attack upon them joined the assailants deerfield and northfield the northernmost towns on the connecticut river settled within a few years past were attacked and several of the inhabitants killed and wounded captain beers sent from hadley to their relief with a convoy of provisions was surprised near northfield and slain with twenty of his men northfield was abandoned and burned by the indians the english at first says gookin thought easily to chastise the insolent doings and murderous practice of the heathen but it was found another manner of thing than was expected for our men could see no enemy to shoot at 
but yet felt their bullets out of the thick bushes where they lay in ambush. The English wanted not courage or resolution, but could not discover nor find an enemy to fight with, yet were galled by the enemy. In the arts of ambush and surprise, with which the Indians were so familiar, the colonists were without practice. It is to the want of this experience, purchased at a very dear rate in the course of the war, that we must ascribe the numerous surprises and defeats from which the colonists suffered at its commencement. Driven to the necessity of defensive warfare, those in command on the river determined to establish a magazine and garrison at Hadley. Captain Lathrop, who had been dispatched from the eastward to the assistance of the river towns, was sent with eighty men, the flower of the youth of Essex County, to guard the wagons intended to convey to Hadley three thousand bushels of unthreshed wheat, the produce of the fertile Deerfield meadows. Just before arriving in Deerfield, near a small stream still known as Bloody Brook, under the shadow of the abrupt conical sugarloaf, the southern termination of the Deerfield mountain, Lathrop fell into an ambush, and, after a brave resistance, perished there with all his company. Captain Mosley, stationed at Deerfield, marched to his assistance, but arrived too late to help him. Deerfield was abandoned and burned by the Indians. Springfield, about the same time, was set on fire, but was partially saved by the arrival, with troops from Connecticut, of Major Treat, successor to the lately deceased Mason, in the chief command of the Connecticut forces. An attack on Hatfield was vigorously repelled by the garrison. Meanwhile, hostilities were spreading. The Indians on the Merrimack began to attack the towns in their vicinity, and the whole of Massachusetts was soon in the utmost alarm. Except in the immediate neighborhood of Boston, the country still remained an immense forest dotted by a few openings. The frontier settlements could not be defended against a foe familiar with localities, scattered in small parties, skillful in concealment, and watching with patience for some unguarded or favorable moment. Those settlements were mostly broken up, and the inhabitants, retiring toward Boston, spread everywhere dread and intense hatred of the bloody heathen. Even the praying Indians and the small dependent and tributary tribes became objects of suspicion and terror. They had been employed at first as scouts and auxiliaries, and to good advantage, but some few, less confirmed in the faith, having deserted to the enemy, the whole body of them were denounced as traitors. Elliot the Apostle and Gukin, superintendent of the subject Indians, exposed themselves to insults and even to danger by their efforts to stem this headlong fury, to which several of the magistrates opposed but a feeble resistance. Troops were sent to break up the praying villages at Menden, Grafton, and others in that quarter. The Natick Indians, those poor despised sheep of Christ, as Gukin affectionately calls them, were hurried off to Deer Island in Boston Harbor where they suffered excessively from a severe winter. A part of the praying Indians of Plymouth Colony were confined, in like manner, on the islands in Plymouth Harbour. Not content with realities sufficiently frightful, superstition, as usual, added bugbears of her own. Indian bows were seen in the sky and scalps in the moon. The northern lights became an object of terror. Phantom horsemen careered among the crowds or were heard to gallop invisible through the air. The howling of wolves was turned into a terrible omen. The war was regarded as a special judgment in punishment of prevailing sins. Among these sins, the General Court of Massachusetts, after consultation with the elders, enumerated neglect in the training of the children of church members, pride in men's wearing long and curled hair, excess in apparel, naked breasts and arms and superfluous ribbons, the toleration of Quakers, hurry to leave meeting before blessing asked, 
profane cursing and swearing, tippling houses, want of respect for parents, idleness, extortion in shopkeepers and mechanics, and the riding from town to town of unmarried men and women under pretense of attending lectures, a sinful custom tending to lewdness. Penalties were denounced against all these offences and the persecution of the Quakers was again renewed. A Quaker woman had recently frightened the Old South congregation in Boston by entering that meeting house clothed in sackcloth with ashes on her head, her feet bare and her face blackened, intending to personify the smallpox with which she threatened the colony in punishment for its sins. About the time of the first collision with Philip, the Tarantines, or Eastern Indians, had attacked the settlements in Maine and New Hampshire, plundering and burning the houses, and massacring such of the inhabitants as fell into their hands. This sudden diffusion of hostilities and vigour of attack from opposite quarters made the colonists believe that Philip had long been plotting and had gradually matured an extensive conspiracy into which most of the tribes had deliberately entered for the extermination of the whites. This belief infuriated the colonists and suggested some very questionable proceedings. It seems, however, to have originated, like the war itself, from mere suspicions. The same griefs pressed upon all the tribes, and the struggle once commenced, the awe which the colonists inspired thrown off, the greater part were ready to join in the contest. But there is no evidence of any deliberate concert, nor in fact were the Indians united. Had they been so, the war would have been far more serious. The Connecticut tribes proved faithful, and that colony remained untouched. Uncas and Ninigret continued friendly, even the Narragansetts, in spite of so many former provocations, had not yet taken up arms. But they were strongly suspected of intention to do so, and were accused by Uncas of giving, notwithstanding their recent assurances, aid and shelter to the hostile tribes. An attempt had lately been made to revive the union of the New England colonies. At a meeting of commissioners, those from Plymouth presented a narrative of the origin and progress of the present hostilities. Upon the strength of this narrative, the war was pronounced just and necessary, and a resolution was passed to carry it on at the joint expense, and to raise for that purpose a thousand men, one half to be mounted dragoons. If the Narragansetts were not crushed during the winter, it was feared they might break out openly hostile in the spring, and at a subsequent meeting a thousand men were ordered to be levied to cooperate in an expedition specially against them. The winter was unfavourable to the Indians. The leafless woods no longer concealed their lurking attacks. The frozen surface of the swamps made the Indian fastnesses accessible to the colonists. The forces destined against the Narragansetts, six companies from Massachusetts under Major Appleton, two from Plymouth under Major Bradford, and five from Connecticut under Major Treat, were placed under the command of Josiah Winslow, governor of Plymouth since Prince's death, son of that Edward Winslow so conspicuous in the earlier history of the colony. The Massachusetts and Plymouth forces marched to Petter-Squam Scott on the west shore of Narragansett Bay, where they made some 40 prisoners. Being joined by the troops from Connecticut and guided by an Indian deserter, after a march of 15 miles through a deep snow, they approached a swamp in what is now the town of South Kingston, one of the ancient strongholds of the Narragansetts. Driving the Indian scouts before them and penetrating the swamp, the colonial soldiers soon came in sight of the Indian fort, built on a rising ground in the morass, a sort of island of two or three acres, fortified by a palisade and surrounded by a close hedge or rod thick. There was but one entrance, quite narrow, defended by a tree thrown across it, with a blockhouse of logs in front and other on the flank. 
It was the Lord's day, but that did not hinder the attack. As the captains advanced at the heads of their companies, the Indians opened a galling fire under which many fell, but the assailants pressed on and forced the entrance. A desperate struggle ensued. The colonists were once driven back, but they rallied and returned to the charge, and after a two hours' fight, became masters of the fort. Fire was put to the wigwams, near 600 in number, and all the horrors of the Pequot massacre were renewed. The corn and other winter stores of the Indians were consumed, and not a few of the old men, women and children perished in the flames. In this bloody contest, long remembered as the swamp fight, the colonial loss was terribly severe. Six captains with 230 men were killed or wounded, and at night, in the midst of a snowstorm, with a 15 miles march before them, the colonial soldiers abandoned the fort, of which the Indians resumed possession. But their wigwams were burned, their provisions destroyed, they had no supplies for the winter, their loss was irreparable. Of those who survived the fight, many perished of hunger. Even as a question of policy, this attack on the Narragansetts was more than doubtful. The starving and infuriated warriors, scattered through the woods, revenged themselves by attacks on the frontier settlements. Lancaster was burned, and forty of its inhabitants killed or taken. Among the rest, Mrs. Rowlandson, wife of the minister, the narrative of whose captivity is still preserved. Groton, Chelmsford, and other towns in that vicinity were repeatedly attacked. Medfield, 20 miles from Boston, was furiously assaulted, and though defended by 300 men, half the houses were burned. Weymouth, within 18 miles of Boston, was attacked a few days after. These were the nearest approaches which the Indians made to that capital. For a time, the neighborhood of the Narragansett country was abandoned. The Rhode Island towns, though they had no part in undertaking the war, yet suffered the consequences of it. Warwick was burned and Providence was partially destroyed. Most of the inhabitants sought refuge in the islands, but the aged Roger Williams accepted a commission as captain for the defense of the town he had founded. Walter Clark was presently chosen governor in Coddington's place, the times not suiting a Quaker chief magistrate. The whole colony of Plymouth was overrun. Houses were burned in almost every town, but the inhabitants, for the most part, saved themselves in their garrisons, a shelter with which all the towns now found it necessary to be provided. Captain Pierce, with 50 men and some friendly Indians, while endeavouring to cover the Plymouth towns, fell into an ambush and was cut off. That same day, Marlborough was set on fire. Two days after, Rehoboth was burned. The Indians seemed to be everywhere. Captain Wadsworth, marching to the relief of Sudbury, fell into an ambush and perished with 50 men. The alarm and terror of the colonists reached again a great height. But affairs were about to take a turn. The resources of the Indians were exhausted. They were now making their last efforts. A body of Connecticut volunteers under Captain Dennison and of Mohegan and other friendly Indians, Pequots and Neantics, swept the entire country of the Narragansetts, who suffered as spring advanced the last extremities of famine. Canachet, the chief sachem, said to have been a son of Miantonoma, but probably his nephew, had ventured to his old haunts to procure seed corn with which to plant the rich intervals on the Connecticut abandoned by the colonists. Taken prisoner, he conducted himself with all that haughty firmness esteemed by the Indians as the height of magnanimity. Being offered his life on condition of bringing about a peace, he scorned the proposal. His tribe would perish to the last man rather than become servants to the English. When ordered to prepare for death, he replied, I like it well. I shall die before my heart is soft, or I shall have spoken anything unworthy of myself. Two Indians were appointed to shoot him, 
and his head was cut off and sent to Hartford. The colonists had suffered severely. Men, women and children had perished by the bullets of the Indians or fled naked through the wintry woods by the light of their blazing houses, leaving their goods and cattle a spoil to the assailants. Several settlements had been destroyed and many more had been abandoned, but the oldest and wealthiest remained untouched. The Indians, on the other hand, had neither provisions nor ammunition. While attempting to plant corn and catch fish at Montague Falls on the Connecticut River, they were attacked with great slaughter by the garrison of the lower towns, led by Captain Turner, a Boston Baptist, and at first refused a commission on that ground, but, as danger increased, pressed to accept it. Yet this enterprise was not without its drawbacks. As the troops returned, Captain Turner fell into an ambush and was slain with 38 men. Hadley was attacked on a lecture day while the people were at meeting, but the Indians were repulsed by the bravery of Goff, one of the fugitive regicides long concealed in that town. Seeing this venerable unknown man come to their rescue and then suddenly disappear, the inhabitants took him for an angel. Major Church, at the head of a body of 200 volunteers, English and Indians, energetically hunted down the hostile bands in Plymouth Colony. The interior tribes about Mount Wachusett were invaded and subdued by a force of 600 men raised for that purpose. Many fled to the north to find refuge in Canada. Guides and leaders in after years of those French and Indian war parties by which the frontiers of New England were so terribly harassed. Just a year after the fast of the commencement of the war, a thanksgiving was observed for success in it. No longer sheltered by the river Indians, who now began to make their peace, and even attacked by bands of the Mohawks, Philip returned to his own country about Mount Hope where he was still faithfully supported by his female confederate and relative, Whittemo, Squaw Sachem of Pocasset. Punham, also the Shawamet vassal of Massachusetts, still zealously carried on the war, but was presently killed. Philip was watched and followed by Church, who surprised his camp, killed upwards of a hundred of his people, and took prisoners his wife and boy. The disposal of this child was a subject of much deliberation. Several of the elders were urgent for putting him to death. It was finally resolved to send him to Bermuda to be sold into slavery, a fate to which many other of the Indian captives were subjected. Whittemo shared the disasters of Philip. Most of her people were killed or taken. She herself was drowned while crossing a river in her flight but her body was recovered and the head cut off was stuck upon a pole at Taunton amid the jeers and scoffs of the colonial soldiers and the tears and lamentations of the Indian prisoners. Philip still lurked in the swamps but was now reduced to extremity. Again attacked by church, he was killed by one of his own people, a deserter to the colonists. His dead body was beheaded and quartered, the sentence of the English law upon traitors. One of his hands was given to the Indian who had shot him, and on the day appointed for public thanksgiving, his head was carried in triumph to Plymouth. The popular rage against the Indians was excessive. Death or slavery was the penalty for all known or suspected to have been concerned in shedding English blood. Merely having been present at the swamp fight was adjudged by the authorities of Rhode Island sufficient foundation for sentence of death, and that too, notwithstanding they had intimated an opinion that the origin of the war would not bear examination. The other captives who fell into the hands of the colonists were distributed among them as ten-year servants. Roger Williams received a boy for his share. Many chiefs were executed at Boston and Plymouth on the charge of rebellion, among others Captain Tom, chief of the Christian Indians at Natick, and Tispiquin, a noted warrior, reputed to be invulnerable, 
who had surrendered to church on an implied promise of safety. A large body of Indians assembled at Dover to treat of peace were treacherously made prisoners by Major Waldron, who commanded there. Some 200 of these Indians, claimed as fugitives from Massachusetts, were sent by water to Boston, where some were hanged and the rest shipped off to be sold as slaves. Some fishermen of Marble Head, having been killed by the Indians at the eastward, the women of that town, as they came out of meeting on a Sunday, fell upon two Indian prisoners who had just been brought in and murdered them on the spot. The same ferocious spirit of revenge which governed the contemporaneous conduct of Barclay in Virginia toward those concerned in Bacon's rebellion swayed the authorities of New England in their treatment of the conquered Indians. By the end of the year the contest was over in the south, upward of 2,000 Indians having been killed or taken. But some time elapsed before a peace could be arranged with the eastern tribes, whose haunts it was not so easy to reach. In this short war of hardly a year's duration, the Wampanoags and Narragansetts had suffered the fate of the Pequots. The Neantics alone, under the guidance of their aged sachem Ninigret, had escaped destruction. Philip's country was annexed to Plymouth, though sixty years afterward, under a royal order in council, it was transferred to Rhode Island. The Narragansett territory remained as before, under the name of King's Province, a bone of contention between Connecticut, Rhode Island, the Marquis of Hamilton, and the Atherton claimants. The Neantics still retained their ancient seats along the southern shores of Narragansett Bay. Most of the surviving Narragansetts, the Nipmucks and the River Indians, abandoned their country and migrated to the north and west. Such as remained, along with the Mohegans and the other subject tribes, became more than ever abject and subservient. The work of conversion was now again renewed, and after such overwhelming proofs of Christian superiority, with somewhat greater success. A second edition of the Indian Old Testament, which seems to have been more in demand than the new, was presently published, revised by Eliot, with the assistance of John Cotton, son of the great cotton and minister of plymouth but not an individual exists in our day by whom it can be understood the fragments of the subject tribes broken in spirit lost the savage freedom and rude virtues of their fathers without acquiring the laborious industry of the whites lands were assigned them in various places which they were prohibited by law from alienating But this very provision, though humanely intended, operated to perpetuate their indolence and incapacity. Some sought a more congenial occupation in the whale fishery, which presently began to be carried on from the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. Many perished by enlisting in the military expeditions undertaken in future years against Acadia and the West Indies. The Indians intermarried with the blacks and thus confirmed their degradation by associating themselves with another oppressed and unfortunate race. Gradually they dwindled away. A few hundred sailors and petty farmers of mixed blood, as much African as Indian, are now the sole surviving representatives of the aboriginal possessors of southern New England. On the side of the colonists, the contest had also been very disastrous. Twelve or thirteen towns had been entirely ruined, and many others partially destroyed. Six hundred houses had been burned, near a tenth part of all in New England. Twelve captains and more than six hundred men in the prime of life had fallen in battle. There was hardly a family not in mourning. The pecuniary losses and expenses of the war were estimated at near a million of dollars. End of section 12section 13 of the Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Leanne Svetan. The Great Events by Famous Historians, Volume 12. Edited by Charles F. Horn, Rossiter Johnson, and John Rudd. Growth of Prussia under the Great Elector. His Victory at Fair Berlin. A.D. 1675 by Thomas Carlyle. It was the good fortune of Friedrich William, Elector of Brandenburg, who is known in history as the Great Elector, to lay a firm foundation for Prussian monarchy. Under his father, George William, the Tenth Elector, Brandenburg had lost much of its former importance. When Friedrich William came into his inheritance in 1640, he found a weak and disunited state, little more than a group of provinces, with foreign territories lying between them and governed by differing laws. The great problem before the elector was how to become actual ruler of his ill-joined possessions, and his first aim was to weld them together that he might make himself absolute monarch. By forming an army of mercenaries, he established his authority. His whole life was occupied with warlike affairs. He remained neutral during the last stages of the Thirty Years' War, but was always prepared for action. He freed Prussia from Polish control and drove the Swedes from Brandenburg. This last was his most famous success. It was won by his victory over the Swedes under Wrangel at Fair Berlin. Carlyle's characteristic narrative and commentary on this and other triumphs of the great elector place him before the reader as one of the chief personages of the Hohenzollern race and a leading actor in European history. Brandenburg had sunk very low under the tenth elector in the unutterable troubles of the time, but it was gloriously raised up again by his son, Friedrich Wilhelm, who succeeded in 1640. This is he whom they call the great elector, Große Kurfürst, of whom there is much writing and celebrating in Prussian books. As for the epithet, it is not uncommon among petty German populations, and many times does not mean too much. Thus, Max of Bavaria, with his Jesuit lambkins and hyacinths, is by Bavarians called Maximilian the Great. Friedrich Wilhelm, both by his intrinsic qualities and the success he met with, deserves it better than most. His success, if we look where he started and where he ended, was beyond that of any other man in his day. He found Brandenburg annihilated, and he left Brandenburg sound and flourishing, a great country, or already on the way toward greatness. Undoubtedly a most rapid, clear-eyed, active man. There was a stroke in him, swift as lightning, well-aimed mostly, and of a respectable weight withal, which shattered asunder a whole world of impediments for him by assiduous repetition of it for fifty years. There hardly ever came to sovereign power a young man of twenty under more distressing, hopeless-looking circumstances. Political significance Brandenburg had none, a mere Protestant appendage dragged about by a papist kaiser. His father's prime minister was in the interest of his enemies, not Brandenburg's servant, but Austria's. The very commandants of his fortresses, commandant of Spandau, more especially, refused to obey Friedrich Wilhelm on his ascension, were bound to obey the kaiser in the first place. He had to proceed softly as well as swiftly, with the most delicate hand, to get him of Spandau by the collar and put him under lock and key as a warning to others. For twenty years past, Brandenburg had been scoured by hostile armies, which, especially the Kaiser's part of which, committed outrages new in human history. In a year or two hence, Brandenburg became again the theater of business. Austrian galas, advancing thither again, 1644, with intent to shut up Tortensen and his Swedes in Jutland, where they had been chastising old Christian the Fourth now meddlesome again for the last time, and never a good neighbor to Sweden, Galas could by no means do what he intended. On the contrary, he had to run from Tortensen, what feet could do, was hunted. He and his Merode Bruder, beautiful inventors of the marauding art, till they pretty much all died. Repierten, says Kohler. No great loss to society, the death of these artists, but we can fancy what their life, and especially what the process of their dying, may have cost poor Brandenburg again. Friedrich Wilhelm's aim, in this as in other emergencies, was sun-clear to himself, but for the most part dim to everybody else. 
He had to walk warily, Sweden on one hand of him, suspicious Kaiser on the other. He had to wear semblances to be ready with evasive words and advance noiselessly by many circuits. More delicate operation could not be imagined, but advance he did, advance and arrive. With extraordinary talent, diligence and felicity, the young man wound himself out of his first fatal position, got those foreign armies pushed out of his country and kept them out. His first concern had been to find some vestige of revenue, to put that upon a clear footing, and by loans or otherwise, to scrape a little ready money together, on the strength of which a small body of soldiers could be collected about him, and drilled into real ability to fight and obey. This as a basis, on this followed all manner of things, freedom from Swedish-Austrian invasions as the first thing. He was himself, as appeared by and by, a fighter of the first quality when it came to that, but never was willing to fight if he could help it, preferred rather to shift, maneuver, and negotiate, which he did in a most vigilant, adroit, and masterly manner. But by degrees he had grown to have, and could maintain it, an army of twenty-four thousand men, among the best troops then in being. With or without his will, he was in all the great wars of his time, the time of Louis the Fourteenth, who kindled Europe four times over, thrice in our Kurfürst's day, the Kurfürst's dominions, a long, straggling country, reaching from Memel to Wesel, could hardly keep out of the way of any war that might arise. He made himself available, never against the good cause of Protestantism and German freedom, yet always in the place and way where his own best advantage was to be had. Louis the Fourteenth had often much need of him, Still oftener and more pressingly had Kaiser Leopold, the little gentleman in scarlet stockings and with a red feather in his hat, whom Mr. Savage used to see majestically walking about, with Austrian lip that said nothing at all. His twenty-four thousand excellent fighting men thrown in at the right time were often a thing that could turn the balance in great questions. They required to be allowed for at a high rate which he well knew how to adjust himself for exacting and securing always. When the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, concluded that thirty years' conflagration and swept the ashes of it into order again, Friedrich Wilhelm's right to Pommern was admitted by everybody and well insisted on by himself, but right had to yield to reason of state, and he could not get it. The Swedes insisted on their expenses. The Swedes held Pommern, had all along held it, in pawn, they say, for their expenses, nothing for it but to give the Swedes the better half of Pommern, for Pommern, as they called it, Swedish Pomerania thenceforth, which lies next to the sea. This, with some towns and cuttings over and above, was Sweden's share. Friedrich Wilhelm had to put up with Hinterpommern, docked furthermore of the town of Stettin, and of other valuable cuttings, in favor of Sweden, much to Friedrich Wilhelm's grief and just anger could he have helped it. They gave him three secularized bishoprics, Magdeburg, Halberstadt, Minden, and all other small remnants for compensation, and he had to be content with these for the present. But he never gave up the idea of Pommern. Much of the effort of his life was spent upon recovering for Pommern, thrice eager upon that whenever lawful opportunity offered. To no purpose, then, he never could recover Swedish Pommern, only his late descendants, and that by slowish degrees, could recover it all. Readers remember that Burgermeister of Stettin, with the helmet and sword flung into the grave and picked out again, and can judge whether Brandenburg got its good luck quite by lying in bed. Once and once only he had a voluntary purpose toward war, and it remained a purpose only. Soon after the Peace of Westphalia, Old Waltz Neuburg, the same who had got the slap on the face, went into tyrannous proceedings against the Protestant part of his subjects in Julich Kleve, who called to Friedrich Wilhelm for help. Friedrich Wilhelm, a zealous Protestant, made remonstrances, retaliations. Ere long the thought struck him. Suppose, backed by the Dutch, we threw out this fantastic old gentleman, his papistries, and pretended claims and self clear out of it. This was Friedrich Wilhelm's thought, and he suddenly marched troops into the territory with that view. But Europe was in alarm. The Dutch grew faint. Friedrich Wilhelm saw it would not do. He had a conference with old Waltz Neuburg. 
young gentleman. We remember how your grandfather made free with us and our august accountants. Nevertheless, we... In fine, the statistics of treaties was increased by one, and there the matter rested till calmer times. In 1666, an effective partition of these litigated territories was accomplished. Prussia to have the Duchy of Kleva proper, the counties of Mark and Ravensburg, with other patches and pertinents. Neuburg, what was the better share, to have Ulick Duchy and Berg Duchy. Furthermore, if either of the lines failed, in no sort was a collateral to be admitted. But Brandenburg was to inherit Neuburg, or Neuburg-Brandenburg, as the case might be. A clear bargain this at last, and in the times that had come it proved executable so far, but if the reader fancies the lawsuit was at last out in this way, he will be a simple reader. In the days of our little Fritz, the line of false Neuburg was evidently ending, but that Brandenburg, and not a collateral, should succeed it, there lay the quarrel open still, as if it had never been shut, and we shall hear enough about it. Friedrich Wilhelm's first actual appearance in war, Polish-Swedish War, 1655 to 1660, was involuntary in the highest degree, forced upon him for the sake of his Preussen, which bade fair to be lost or ruined without blame of his or its. Nevertheless, here too he made his benefit of the affair. The big king of Sweden had a standing quarrel with his big cousin of Poland, which broke out into hot war. Little Preussen lay between them, and was like to be crushed in the collision. Swedish king was Karl Gustav, Christina's cousin, Charles XII's grandfather, a great and mighty man, lion of the north in his time. Polish king was one John Casimir, chivalrous enough and with clouds of forward Polish chivalry about him, glittering with barbaric gold. Friedrich III, Danish king for the first time being, he was also much involved in the thing. Fain would Friedrich Wilhelm have kept out of it, but he could not. Karl Gustav as good as forced him to join. He joined, fought along with Karl Gustav in an illustrious battle, Battle of Warsaw, three days long, July 28th to the 30th, 1656, on the skirts of Warsaw, crowds looking from the upper windows there, Polish chivalry broken at last, going like chafe upon the winds and John Casimir nearly ruined. Shortly after which, Friedrich Wilhelm, who had shown much in the battle, changed sides. An inconsistent, treacherous man? Perhaps not, O oh reader. Perhaps a man advancing in circuits, the only way he has, spiraling, face now to the east, now to west, with his own reasonable private aim, sun clear to himself all the while. John Casimir agreed to give up the homage of Preussen for this service, a grand prize for Friedrich Wilhelm. What the Teutsch Richers strove for in vain, and lost their existence in striving for, the shifty Kurfürst has now got, Ducal Prussia, which is also called East Prussia, is now a free sovereignty, and will become as royal as the other Polish part, or perhaps even more so in the course of time. Karl Gustav, in a high frame of mind, informs the Kurfürst that he has him on his books and will pay the debt one day. A dangerous debtor in such manners, this Karl Gustav, in these same months, busy with the Danish part of the controversy, he was doing a great feat of war which set all Europe in astonishment. In January 1658, Karl Gustav marches his army, horse, foot, and artillery, to the extent of twenty thousand, across the Baltic ice, and takes an island without shipping, island of Funen, across the little belt, three miles of ice and a part of the sea open, which has to be crossed on planks, nay, forward from Funen, then once there he achieves ten whole miles more of ice and takes Zealand itself, to the wonder of all mankind, an imperious, stern-browed, swift-striking man who had dreamed of a new Goth empire, the mean hypocrites and fribbles of the South, to be coerced again by noble Norse valor and taught a new lesson, has been known to lay his hand on his sword while appraising an ambassador, Dutch high mightiness, what his royal intentions were. Not the sale or purchase of groceries, observe you, sir. My aims go higher. Charles the Twelfth's grandfather and somewhat the same type of man. 
but Carl died short while after, left his big, wide-ranging northern controversy to collapse in what way it could. Sweden and the fighting parties made their peace of Oliva, Abbey of Oliva near Danzig, May 1, 1660, and this of Preussen was ratified in all forms among other points. No homage more, nothing above ducal Prussia but the heavens, and great times coming for it. This was one of the successfulest strokes of business ever done by Friedrich Wilhelm, who had been forced by sheer compulsion to embark in that big game. Royal Prussia, the Western Polish Prussia, this too, as all newspapers know, has in our times gone the same road as the other, which probably, after all, it may have had in nature some tendency to do? Cut away for reasons by the Polish sword in that battle of Tannenberg, long since, and then, also for reasons, cut back again. That is the fact, not unexampled in human history. Old Johann Casimir, not long after that piece of Oliva, getting tired of his unruly Polish chivalry, and their ways, abdicated, retired to Paris, and lived much with Ninon de Lonclou and her circle for the rest of his life. He used to complain of his Polish chivalry that there was no solidity in them, nothing but outside glitter, with tumult and anarchic noise. Fatal want of one essential talent, the talent of obeying, and has been heard to prophecy that a glorious republic, persisting in such courses, would arrive at results which would surprise it. Onward from this time, Friedrich Wilhelm figures in the world, public men watching his procedure, kings anxious to secure him, Dutch prince-sellers sticking up his portrait for a hero-worshipping public. Fighting hero, had the public known it, was not his essential character, though he had to fight a great deal. He was essentially an industrial man, great in organizing, regulating, and constraining chaotic heaps to become cosmic for him. He drains bogs, settles colonies in the waste places of his dominions, cuts canals, unweariedly encourages trade and work. The Friedrich Wilhelm's canal, which still carries tonnage from the Oder to the Spree, is a monument of his zeal in this way, creditable with the means he had. To the poor French Protestants in the Edict of Nantes affair, he was like an empress benefit of heaven, one helper appointed, to whom the help itself was profitable. He munificently welcomed them to Brandenburg, showed really a noble piety and human self-pity, as well as judgment, nor did Brandenburg and he want their reward. Some twenty thousand nimble French souls, evidently of the best French quality, found a home there, made waste sands about Berlin into pot-herb gardens, and in the spiritual Brandenburg, too, did something of horticulture, which is still noticeable. Certainly this elector was one of the shiftiest of men, not an unjust man, either. A pious, God-fearing man, rather, stanch to his Protestantism and his Bible, not unjust by any means, nor, on the other hand, by any means thin-skinned in his interpretings of justice. Fair play to myself always, or occasionally even the height of fair play, on the whole, by constant energy, vigilance, adroit activity, by an ever-ready insight and audacity to seize the passing fact by its right handle, he fought his way well in the world, left Brandenburg a flourishing and greatly increased country, and his own name famous enough. A thick-set, stalwart figure, with brisk eyes and high, strong, irregularly Roman nose, good bronze statue of him by Schlutter, once a famed man, still rides on the Lange Brücke, Long Bridge, at Berlin, and his portrait, in huge, frizzled Louis Quator wig, is frequently met with in German galleries. Collectors of Dutch prints, too, know him. Here a gallant, eagle-figured little gentleman, brisk in the smiles of youth, with plumes, with truncheon, caprioling on his war-charger, view of tents in the distance, there a sedate, ponderous, wrinkly old man, eyes slightly puckered, eyes busier than mouth, a face well ploughed by time, and not found unfruitful, one of the largest, most laborious, potent faces, in an ocean of circumambient periwig, to be met with in that century. There are many histories about him, too, but they are not comfortable to read. He also has wanted a sacred poet, and found only a bewildering dry-as-dust. 
His two grand feats that dwell in the Prussian memory are perhaps none of his greatest, but were of a kind to strike the imagination. They both relate to what was the central problem of his life, the recovery of Pommern from the Swedes. Exploit first is the famed Battle of Fair Berlin, Ferry of Berlin. Fought on June the 18th, 1675, Fair Berlin is an inconsiderable town still standing in those peaty regions, some five and thirty miles northwest of Berlin, and had for ages plied its poor ferry over the oily-looking brown sluggish stream called Rhin, or Rhine in those parts, without the least notice from mankind, till this fell out. It is a place of pilgrimage to patriotic Prussians ever since Friedrich Wilhelm's exploit there. The matter went thus. Friedrich Wilhelm was fighting, far south in Alsace, on Kaiser Leopold's side, in the Louis the Fourteenth War, that second one, which ended in the Treaty of Nimwegen, doing his best there when the Swedes, egged on by Louis the Fourteenth, made war upon him, crossed the Pomeranian marshes, troop after troop, and invaded his Brandenburg territory with a force which at length amounted to sixteen thousand men. No help for the moment, Friedrich Wilhelm could not be spared from his post. The Swedes, who had at first professed well, gradually went into plunder, roving, harrying at their own will, and a melancholy time they made of it for Friedrich Wilhelm and his people, lucky if temporary harm were all the ill they were likely to do, lucky if... He stood steady, however, in his solid manner finishing the thing in hand first, since that was feasible. He then even retired into winter quarters to rest his men, and seemed to have left the Swedish sixteen thousand autocrats of the situation, who, accordingly, went storming about at a great rate. Not so, however, very far indeed from so. Having rested his men for certain months, Friedrich Wilhelm silently, in the first days of June, 1675, gets them under march again, marches his cavalry, and he, as first installment, with best speed from Schweinfurt, which is on the river Main, to Magdeburg, a distance of two hundred miles. At Magdeburg, where he rests three days, waiting for the first handful of foot and a field piece or two, he learns that the Swedes are in three parties wide asunder, the middle party of them within forty miles of him, probably stronger, even this middle one, than his small body of six thousand horse, twelve hundred foot, and three guns. Stronger, but capable, perhaps, of being surprised, of being cut in pieces before the others can come up? Rathenau is the nearest skirt of this middle party. Thither goes the Kurfürst, softly, swiftly, in the June night, June 16th to 17th, 1675, gets into Rathenau by brisk stratagem, tumbles out the Swedish horse regiment there, drives it back towards Fair Berlin. He himself follows hard, swift riding enough in the summer night through those damp havel lands in the old Hohenzollern fashion, and indeed, old Freisach Castle, as it chances, Freisach, scene of Dietrich von Quitzau, and Lazy Peg, long since, is close by, follows hard, we say, strikes in upon this midmost party, nearly twice his number, but infantry for most part, and, after fierce fight, done with good talent on both sides, cuts it into utter ruin as proposed. Thereby he has left the Swedish army as a mere head and tail without body, has entirely demolished the Swedish army, same feat intrinsically as that done by Cromwell on Hamilton and the Scots in 1648. It was, so to speak, the last visit Sweden paid to Brandenburg, or the last of any consequence, and ended the domination of the Swedes in those quarters, a thing justly to be forever remembered by Brandenburg, on a smallish, modern scale, the Bannockburn, Sempak, Marathon of Brandenburg. Exploit second was four years later, in some sort a corollary to this, and winding up to the Swedish business. The Swedes, in further prosecution of their Louis the Fourteenth speculation, had invaded Preussen this time, and were doing sad havoc there. It was in the dead of winter, Christmas, 1678, more than four hundred miles off, and the Swedes, to say nothing of their own havoc, were in a case to take Königsberg and ruin Prussia altogether, if not prevented. Friedrich Wilhelm starts from Berlin with the opening year, on his long march. 
the horse troops first, foot to follow at their swiftest, he himself, his wife, his ever true Louisa accompanying, as her wont was, travels toward the end at a rate of sixty miles a day. He gets in still in time, finds Königsberg unscathed. Nay, it is even said the Swedes are extensively falling sick, having, after a long famine, found infinite pigs near Insterberg in those remote regions and indulged in the fresh pork overmuch. I will not describe the subsequent maneuvers which would interest nobody, enough if I say that on January the 16th, 1679, it had become of the highest moment for Friedrich Wilhelm to get from Carver, village near Elbing, on the shore of the Frische Haf, where he was, through Königsberg, to Gilga on the Kurischer Haf, where the Swedes are, in a minimum of time. Distance, as the crow flies, is about a hundred miles. Road, which skirts the two halves, wide, shallow washes, as we should name them, is of rough quality and naturally circuitous. It is ringing frost today, and for days back, Friedrich Wilhelm hastily gathers all the sledges, all the horses of the district, mounts four thousand men in sledges, starts with speed of light in that fashion, scours along all day, and after the intervening bit of land, again along, awakening the ice-bound silences. Gloomy, frische half, wrapped in its winter cloud coverlets, with its wastes of tumbled sand, its poor frost-bound fishing hamlets, pine hillocks, desolate-looking, stern as Greenland, or more so, says Bushing, who travelled there in winter time, hears unexpected human voices and huge grinding and trampling, the four thousand in long fleet of sledges scouring across it in that manner. All day they rush along, out of the rimy hazes of morning, into the olive-coloured clouds of evening again, with huge, loud, grinding rumble, and do arrive in time at Gilga, a notable streak of things, shooting across the frozen solitudes in the new year, 1679, little short of Karl Gustav's feet, which we heard of in the other, or Danish end of the Baltic, twenty years ago when he took islands without ships. This second exploit, suggested or not, by that prior one of Karl Gustav on the ice, is still a thing to be remembered by Hohenzollerns and Prussians. The Swedes were beaten here on Friedrich Wilhelm's rapid arrival, were driven into disastrous rapid retreat northward, which they executed in hunger and cold, fighting continually like northern bears, under the grim sky, Friedrich Wilhelm sticking to their skirts, holding by their tail, like an angry bear word with steel whip in his hand, a thing which on the small scale reminds one of Napoleon's experiences. Not till Napoleon's huge fighting flight a hundred and thirty-four years after did I read of such transaction in those parts. The Swedish invasion of Preussen has gone utterly to ruin. And this, then, is the end of Sweden and its bad neighborhood on these shores, where it has tyranniously sat on our skirts so long? Swedish Pommern, the elector already had, Last year, coming toward it ever since the exploit of Fair Berlin, he had invaded Swedish Pommern, had besieged and taken Stettin, nay, Stralsund too, where Wallenstein had failed, cleared Pommern altogether of its Swedish guests, who had tried next in Preussen, with what luck we see. Of Swedish Pommern, the elector might now say, Surely it is mine. Again mine, as it long was, well won a second time since the first would not do. But no, Louis the Fourteenth proved a gentleman to his Swedes. Louis, now that the peace of Nimwegen had come, and only the elector of Brandenburg was still in harness, said steadily, though anxious enough to keep well with the elector, They are my allies, these Swedes. It was on my bidding they invaded you. Can I leave them in such a pass? It must not be. So Pomern had to be given back a miss which was infinitely grievous to Friedrich Wilhelm. The most victorious elector cannot hit always, were his right never so good. Another miss which he had to put up with, in spite of his rights and his good services, was that of the Silesian duchies. The heritage fraternity, with Liegnitz, had at length in 1675 come to fruit. The last duke of Liegnitz was dead. Duchies of Liegnitz, of Brieg, Bolau, are Brandenburg's, if there were right done. 
but Kaiser Leopold and the Scarlet Stockings will not hear of heritage fraternity. Nonsense, answers Kaiser Leopold. A thing suppressed at once, ages ago by imperial power, flat zero of a thing at this time, and you, I again bid you, return me your papers upon it. This latter act of duty Friedrich Wilhelm would not do, but continued insisting, Jagerndorf, at least, O Kaiser of the world, said he. Jagerndorf, there is no color for your keeping that. To which the Kaiser again answers, Nonsense, and even falls about astonishing schemes about it, as we shall see, but gives nothing. Ducal Preussen is sovereign. Kleve is at peace. Hinterpommern ours. This elector has conquered much, but Silesia and Vorpommern and some other things he will have to do without. Louis the Fourteenth, it is thought, once offered to get him made king, but that he declined for the present. His married and domestic life is very fine and human, especially with that Oranian Nassau princess, who was his first wife, 1646 to 1667, Princess Louisa of Nassau-Orange, aunt to our own Dutch William, King William the Third in time coming, an excellent wise princess, from whom came the Orange heritages, which afterward proved difficult to settle. Orange was at last exchanged for the small principality of Neuschaftel in Switzerland, which is Prussia's ever since. Oranienburg, Orangeburg, a royal country house still standing some twenty miles north from Berlin, was this Louise's place. She had trimmed it up into a little jewel of the Dutch type, pot herb gardens, training schools for girls and the like, a favorite abode of hers when she was at liberty for recreation. But her life was busy and earnest. She was helpmate, not in name only, to an ever-busy man. They were married young, a marriage of love with all. Young Friedrich Wilhelm's courtship, wedding in Holland, the honest, trustful walk and conversation of the two sovereign spouses, their journeyings together, their mutual hopes, fears, and manifold vicissitudes till death with stern beauty shut it in. All is human, true, and wholesome in it, interesting to look upon and rare among sovereign persons. Not but that he had troubles with his womankind, even with his first wife, whom he loved truly and who truly loved him, there were scenes, the lady having a judgment of her own about everything that passed, and the man being choleric withal. Sometimes I have heard he would dash his hat at her feet, saying symbolically, "'Govern you, then, madam, not the Kurfürst hat. A quaff is my wear, it seems. Yet her judgment was good, and he liked to have it on the weightiest things, though her powers of silence might halt now and then. He has been known on occasions to run from his privy council to her apartment while a complex matter was debating, to ask her opinion, hers, too, before it was decided. Excellent Louisa, princess full of beautiful piety, good sense and affection, a touch of the Nassau heroic in her. At the moment of her death, it is said, when speech had fled, he felt from her hand which lay in his three slight, slight pressures. Farewell thrice mutely spoken in that manner, not easy to forget in this world. His second wife, Dorothea, who planted the lindens in Berlin and did other husbandries, fell far short of Louisa in many things, but not in tendency to advise, to remonstrate, and plaintively reflect on the finished and unalterable. Dreadfully thrifty lady, moreover, did much in dairy produce, farming of town rates, provision taxes, not to speak of that tavern she was thought to have in Berlin, and to draw custom to it in an oblique manner. Ah, I have not my Louisa now. To whom shall I run, for advice or help, would the poor Kurfürst at times exclaim. He had some trouble, considerable trouble now and then, with mutinous spirits in Preussen, men standing on antique Prussian franchises and parchments, refusing to see that the same were now antiquated incompatible, nor to say impossible, as the new sovereign alleged, and carried themselves very stiffly at times. But the Hohenzollerns had been used to such things. A Hohenzollern like this one would evidently take his measures, soft but strong, 
and even stronger to the needful pitch with mutinous spirits. One burgermeister of Königsberg, after much stroking on the back, was at length seized in open hall by electoral writ, soldiers having first gently barricaded the principal streets and brought cannon to bear upon them. This burgermeister, seized in such brief way, lay prisoner for life, refusing to ask his liberty, though it was thought he might have had it on asking. Another gentleman, a baron from Kalkstein, of old Teutsch Ritterkin, of very high ways, in the provincial states, Stende, and elsewhere, got into lofty, almost solitary opposition, and at length into mutiny proper against the new, non-Polish sovereign, and flatly refused to do homage on his accession. Refused, Kalkstein did, for his share, fled to Warsaw, and very fiercely, in a loud manner, carried out his mutinies in the diets and the court conclaves there, his plea being, or plea for the time, Poland is our liege lord, which it was not always, and we cannot be transferred to you except by our consent, asked and given, which too had been a little neglected on the former occasion of transfer, so that the great elector knew not what to do with Kalkstein, and at length, as the case was pressing, had him kidnapped by his ambassador at Warsaw, had him rolled in a carpet there, and carried swiftly in the ambassador's coach in the form of luggage over the frontier to his native province, there to be judged and, in the end, since nothing else would serve him, to have the sentence executed and his head cut off, for the case was pressing. These things, especially this of Kalkstein, with a boisterous Polish diet and parliamentary eloquence in the rear of him, gave rise to criticisms, and required management on the part of the great elector. Of all his ancestors, our little Fritz, when he grew big, admired this one, a man made like himself in many points. He seems really to have loved and honored this one. In the year 1750 there had been a new cathedral got finished at Berlin, the ancestral bones had to be shifted over from the vaults of the old one, the burying place ever since Joachim II, that Joachim who drew his sword on Alba. King Friedrich, with some attendants, witnessed the operation, January 1750. When the great Kurfürst's coffin came, he bade them open it, gazed in silence on the features for some time, which were perfectly recognizable, laid his hand on the hand long dead, and said, Monsieur, c'est lui si a fait de grand chose. This one did a grand work. End of section 13